Elections will come to order. The clerk will call the roll. There he is. Chair Kane. Here. Vice Chair Gonzalez. Present. Beckley. Here. UC. Here. Clardy. Present. Fierro. Present. Jaton. Present. Schofield. Way over here. Swanson. A quorum is present. Pursuant to Rule 4, Section 16A, for the sole purpose of text of taking testimony. Why is that there? I'm just reading a script, guys. Ignore that. This is great. Good morning, members. I'm going to begin with some housekeeping items. Committee members can participate from this room or virtually. In order to make this a smooth process, we'll call on members who are present first, and then any members that are attending virtually. But there are none. We'll take up bills by non-committee members first, if the author is present, and then move to bills of committee members. As a reminder, if there's anyone that wishes to testify uh, on any of the bills we'll be hearing today, you must register on the electronic witness information kiosks that are outside of this room um, and indicate which bills you're planning to testify on. We'll be limiting public testimony to three minutes. If there are no questions, we'll start with our first bill. The chair lays out House Bill 1397 and recognizes Representative White to explain the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Madam Vice Chair and members of the committee. Uh, House Bill 1397, there is a committee substitute. Okay. Where's the sub? You have copies of the sub? Okay. Um, yeah, I do. Copy. <clears throat> so we don't um, look at more. Yeah. Yeah. I remember just going to back up. Maybe jump jump someone in front of you, Mister. Okay. So I, right. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Is there any objection that we leave this bill pending so that we can? Let Representative White come back. Okay. Well, hearing no objection, uh, House Bill 1397 is left pending. The chair lays out House Bill 574 and recognizes Representative Bonin to explain the bill. Representative Bonin, I see you have a committee substitute. Correct. Here we have it. All right. Well, the chair lays out the committee substitute. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairman Kane and members. I appreciate you uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, lay out House Bill 574 this morning. The election code uh, currently does not directly address a situation where an individual intentionally alters a report uh, to misrepresent a vote count. Uh, cases such as these are typically um, the uh, the result uh, or, or managed in terms of a charge of fraud or forgery. And uh, House Bill 574 adds counting invalid votes or failure to uh, count a vote in an effort to alter a report to the criminal election fraud statute. And it raises the penalty to a second degree felony. And this is the penalty for the existing current offense of illegal voting where an individual uh, were to intentionally cast a fraudulent vote. Okay. Members, are there any questions? The chair represents recognized Representative Schofield. So, Chairman, you're you're amending a current law which specifically says that the person has to knowingly or intentionally do it. So, if if somebody mistakenly doing the count does something wrong, that's not an issue with your bill. Correct. This is a, a, a criminal uh, section of the code, so there would have to be an actual intent to commit the act, and then there would have to be proof that the act was committed. Members, any other questions? 
If none, we will proceed to testimony. The chair calls Andrew Eller, representing himself, to testify for the bill. Yes. Mr. Scheller, you may know, I hope you'll. Good morning. Uh, my name is Andrew Eller. Uh, I'm from Bell County. I am representing myself, and I am speaking for House Bill 574. Uh, I want to thank uh, Chairman Kane and the members of the committee for the opportunity to, to, to provide some testimony on HB 574. Just a little bit of background about myself. I have over 25 years of experience as an election judge in Bell County, so I've been around for a long time. I can think back clear to when we were using the uh, lever voting machines. I know that dates me, uh, but uh, with those types of machines, um, you literally could not mess them up. And with the processes we had back then, you literally could not mess them up. You, you couldn't do something wrong. It was very tough. With today's systems, today's electronic systems, uh, electronic poll books, and the processes that we have, it's so much easier, especially if you know what you're doing, to, to mess up an election and, and to purposely uh, take an action that would be, in my opinion, a, a felony. And so that's why I'm, I'm speaking today is, is, you know, looking at what I've seen. House Bill 574 takes into account these counting of invalid votes uh, and or uh, ignoring valid votes that have come in and uh, not counting those. So as an election judge and seeing those types of things that could possibly happen, uh, adding that extra layer of protection uh, is, is paramount for us. The, uh, there's nothing more important than uh, our ensuring the election integrity that we have. And with today's systems and the way things are done, we need to actually add some teeth to uh, purposeful changing and purposeful uh, modifying our elections. So I do speak quite uh, strongly for House Bill 574 to add those pieces and to also uh, change the uh, penalty from a misdemeanor to a, a, a felony. So. Um, that's really all I have. So if you have any questions. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Eller. Members, any questions? This witness? All right. Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Eller, thank you for your testimony. Uh, in your experience all these years since Levers to right now, uh, have you personally witnessed these as an election judge or someone administering elections uh, in your your eyeballs watching the, the the activities? No, actually, I have not. And that, that's a good thing because, you know, I'm from Bell County and Bell County, I work very well. You know, I've, I've been through four or five different election administrators, believe it or not. I, I've outlasted them. And every one of them have been very good. Um, they've been opposite parties of me at times, but we've always worked well together. And, and what I've seen is they've always been above board. But I know this recent election, I've seen election administrators and I've heard reports, personal reports from those who have seen these types of things take place. I have not, but they have. And so I know that's uh, anecdotal evidence and that's hearsay, but I've heard those, yes. And, and, and uh, my experience is similar to yours in uh, my part of the world in House District 11 in East Texas, but likewise, I've heard things, didn't know if you, if you had that kind of uh, personal knowledge. But, uh, thank you for being here this morning. All right, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, the chair calls Susanna Carranza, the League of Women Voters. Okay. They'll get that passed out to us. Ms. Carranza, if you could please uh, state your name, who you're with, and your position on the bill. Thank you. Uh, I'm Susanna Carranza, testifying as a member and on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Texas in opposition to House Bill 574. Uh, really so, Ms. Carranza, you're testifying on behalf of the League, League of Women, of Women Voters, Voters of okay. Texas. Thank you. Go ahead. In opposition to the bill. Yes. We appreciate your attention this morning to the League's uh, position in this bill. And here I'm, I speak. Um, for the many league members and many other people in Texas who are unable to appear today because of the pandemic. Thank you very much for your service and we really wish you uh, that you and your staff continue in good health. The League of Women Voters of Texas opposes House Bill 574 
because imposing this criminal penalties could have a chilling effect on the willingness of individuals to assist a vote, a vote count. For example, in section 65.005 of the Texas Election Code requires evaluation of the voter intent when a ballot is irregularly marked in order to determine if the ballot should be counted. This evaluation is necessarily based on the review of the entire ballot that understandably might result in disagreement. Changes in the statute proposing House Bill 574 could turn discussions over simple disagreements into threats of imprisonment. Citizens might be unwilling to serve as counting officers if fulfilling their duties subjects them to possible criminal liability. Thank you. Okay. Members, any questions for this witness? Representative Schofield. Ms. Carranza, are you telling me that it is the official position of the League of Women Voters that if someone knowingly or intentionally counts invalid ballots or fails to count ballot, valid ballots, that that should not be a crime? Sir, I have to defer. Uh, the League will give you an official position uh, after reviewing the exact text. Uh, thank you very much. That's what this bill does, and you testified that the League of Women Voters, not just you, was against it. I testify the words that are here, and any clarification will be provided by the League officially. I, I cannot uh, deviate from my written testimony. But you're the one they sent to testify. Yes, but the League is an organization as a whole. The League must not have felt, felt very strongly about it if they sent someone to testify that they didn't fully brief on what the issue was. <clears throat> Sir, that's okay. the position of the League. I'll say if our, if our sole concern is that we might chill people who want to knowingly or intentionally count invalid votes from participating, I think you have a good bill, Mr. Bonin. Okay. Members, any other questions for this witness? Hearing none. Thank you, right, Ms. Carranza. Thank you very much. The chair now calls Jeremy Bravo, Representative Self, testify for the bill. Mr. Bravo, if you could Good morning. please again state your name, tell us who you're with. It could be yes, yourself my name is Jeremy position. Bravo. I'm here for myself, former U.S. congressional candidate, failed to run twice in one election cycle. I would never recommend doing that for any of you to ever try to do that. But I'm for uh, this bill. But when you think about the constitutional process and your right to vote as an American, um, we have to think about the context of election fraud in general. So when you talk about influencing people to vote, would the penalties be stiffer for anybody that took unconstitutional grant funds for their particular counties? I mean, there were nine out of 254 counties in the state of Texas that took CTCL grant funds. Yes, it was a nonprofit entity. However, that would almost be the equivalent of like the NRA funding the election. So when you talk about influencing somebody's right to vote, that is something that you have to take in uh, to grant, take, take into context with that. And you also have to think about somebody that may not be a Democrat or Republican, somebody that's trying to find their way. Maybe like George Washington when he was inaugurated April 30th, 1789, who was actually an independent. So when you think about Article 1, Section 2 of the United States Constitution, really the only qualification to run for the United States House of Representatives is to be 25 years old. So is it fraudulent not to count a vote from an independent candidate if they were obstructed ballot access at the same time? So that's really, I support this bill and I understand the, the criminal, it should be criminal in the event that somebody is knowingly doing something wrong with the ballot. But there are other things that you have to think about from a constitutional standpoint that are relative to all of these bills, which is the reason why I signed up for this today. Thank you very much. Any questions? For Members, any questions for Mr. Bravo? Hear none. Thank you, Thanks. Mr. Bravo. All right, members, the chair calls. All right, Kenneth Moore, representing himself, in Moore. Mr. Moore. 
That's all right. We move on. Chair calls Robert Green. The Travis County Republican Party Election Integrity Committee. And you're here to shows that you're here to testify for the bill. Mr. Green, if you could state your name, tell us who you're with. If you're just with yourself, that's great, or just with the organization. But please just pick one of them for me. And uh, Chairman Kane, my name is Bob Green, and I do represent the Travis County Republican Party Election Integrity Committee and myself. Here to you're Rob Gre Robert Green, right? Robert Green, right. yeah. It happened last week. I go by by Bob. Put Bob on the computer next time out there on the witness kiosk. It'd be helpful. All right. Very good. Okay, and yes, I'm here to testify in favor of this bill. Uh, it's very simple, so the testimony is going to be fairly simple. Every legal vote should count. Every legal vote should not count. Individuals who deliberately change, alter votes one way or the other, good ones count good ones or count bad ones, there should be a penalty. Without, without a penalty for violations, what good is any law? So okay. um, I'll, I'll leave you with that. I think it's a good bill. Uh, I'd like to thank Representative Bonin for filing it. All right, thank That's you. all I have. Thank you. Members, are there any questions for uh, Mr. Green? Yes, sir. Okay. Representative Clardy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and Mr. Green, in your experience in Travis County, uh, as I read Dr. Bonin's uh, uh, bill, the committee substitute, really, really the focus is, is in the counting of invalid votes or failing to count votes or alter reports. Uh, in your experience watching polls uh, here in Travis County, have you witnessed or are aware of any situations that would invoke this provision? I have been an election judge and, and, a, and a precinct chair for 10 years. I have actually been the Republican judge at Travis County Central Count before. I cannot say that I absolutely witnessed irregularities involving this, but I can say that I was sequestered away from being able to see irregularities. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, members? Well, Mr. Green, thank you. Go ahead. Sometimes, you know, by the way, for purposes out there, sometimes y'all may see me take a moment before I call another witness. My goal is to try and find, uh, to, to balance uh, different viewpoints. And uh, I can't see that. I try and balance people from different areas. Uh, the chair calls Amber Williams. Ms. Williams. Ms. Williams, I see here you're, you're a college student here to represent yes, yourself. Thank you, sir. Um, and your position is for the bill. If you could just please just tell me that same thing. Yes, sir. Yes, I am for the bill. I support H. Bill 574. And your name? And my name is Amber Williams. And yes, I'm getting ready to be a college student. Um, so I'm 19 and I voted for the first time this year. It was a pretty great experience. But my main message is pretty simple. We just need to do everything we can to ensure that the voting system is secure in Texas. And I really believe that this room is filled with honest representatives who worked really hard to get where they are. They went out and consulted their constituents. They ran on the platform and they were legitimately elected to their position. But the system that put these representatives in place, I believe, is now crumbling and falling apart. And over the past few months, you know, people all over the country really have witnessed or heard about stories of fraud on the federal and the state and the county level. And I've traveled all across the state talking to people in lots of cities, and they've all told me that they don't have the same amount of trust in the election that they did before. So this is a problem because next time we have an election, more people are not going to vote. Um, more people are going to think about cheating because what does it matter if, if you know, my vote doesn't count? Um, I believe more honest representatives are not going to run or they're going to lose their position because they can't win in a fair election. And to me, this bill is not only about preserving the vote for us individuals, but it's about preserving the ability for these uh, elected officials to continue doing their job. So anyways, this is really important to me. All consideration for this bill would be much appreciated. And I believe in order to uphold the you know, election integrity, we need to clarify the rules and have a stricter consequence for it. Thank you very much for your time. Oh, thank you, Ms. Williams. Members, any questions? You lucked out. Thank you. Ms. <laughs> Williams, thank you. Oops. It's time. The chair calls Julie Kellogg. Mr. 
Good morning. Um, my name is Julie Kellogg. I'm here from Nueces County, Corpus Christi specifically. And I'm just, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Who are you representing? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, myself. And your position on the bill? Uh, four. All right. Big time. <laughs> okay. um, I just want to say ditto to a lot of the folks. I think the key here and what really touched me on this bill, knowing and intentionally try to commit fraud. I mean, how can you say if you are purposely setting out to commit fraud, to negate somebody's vote, to add votes that shouldn't be there, that's knowing and intentionally. So everyone is motivated. We either have the carrot or the stick. And if we need a bigger stick, that's what we've got to have. The other part of this that I think is very important for the state of Texas, we have to have preventative measures rather than reactive measures. And I think that's what we're seeing in a lot of places, a lot of other states right now, is they're reacting to problems rather than preventing them. So I'm absolutely 100% for this. Um, if, if you... If somebody wants to commit fraud in Texas, they're going to get a very clear message that it's not going to be tolerated. And that's how we protect our most, most sacred right to vote. So that's basically all I've got. So, And hats off to the young lady. I've been voting since I was 18, and I just, I love that. That's that's great. I've been a poll watcher, too, but never experienced fraud. But So <laughs> anything yes. else? Thanks, Ms. Kellogg. Uh, did you come up from Corpus Christi today? Yes, sir. All right. hope you'll try and go see Representative Todd Hunter. Um, I'm actually under Abel Herrero's area. I'm in um, 34, and we'll go see. Oh, absolutely. We'll go see, go him. see him. There you go. Yeah, I could believe Representative Hunter's right now in, in a redistricting committee, so it'll be a little busy. Yeah, we'll Members, see. any we'll questions? Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, the chair calls Richard Bonert. Did I pronounce it right? Richard, B O H N E R T. Good morning, Richard. Richard, there's a little uh, script up there. Look down at it. You see it? Yes, sir. I was going to ask you those three questions. If you could tell them to us. Yes, sir. My name is Richard Bonert. I'm from Comfort, Texas, Kerr County, and I'm representing myself, and I am in favor of the bill. And just hearing what other people have said, I really don't have any more to say other than that. I think we need to enforce strict penalties when someone is uh, in violation and when they're caught. That's going to be the issue is to catch the people and go ahead and get the penalties enforced. So I'm very strongly in favor of the bill and urge you all to go ahead and get it passed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The chair calls Emilice Figueroa. Hi, Elise. If you could please uh, tell us your name. Hi, um, my name is Emilise Figueroa, and I am testifying in support of um, House Bill 574. And you represent yourself? I represent myself and the East Valley Republican Women's Club. Okay, so you're which one? It's actually in California. Can we just say you represent yourself? Yeah, I represent myself. Okay. Um, well, I just wanted to say, it's going to be a quick testimony, that um, election integrity really means everything to the American democratic process. And um, and without that, people become cynical and begin to distrust our institutions. I have seen and heard this amongst many of my young um, peers, colleagues, and um, I am also a student. And I know a lot of a lot of college students who, who don't vote because they are discouraged. Um, and this this is from both sides. So really, I don't think there's any reason why um, intentionally intentionally um, manipulating someone's vote shouldn't be a criminal offense. Um, and I think that that is um, a feeling that's shared amongst people on both sides of the political aisle and in every state across the nation. Um, and so I have actually personally witnessed. Um, duplicate ballots being turned in because in California um, ballot harvesting was legal and it's something that our organization practiced. Um, so 
luckily these people were, were kind and um, had enough integrity to tell us. And, um, but, but the point is that it's just too easy um, for people to commit fraud. And, and I feel like we just, we just need um, to, to re-examine what the consequences are for intentionally man manipulating votes as well. So, um, and that is why I believe that intentionally manipulating votes should be at least a second degree felony. Thank you. Hey, ma'am, members, any questions? You, you mentioned that you, you personally witnessed this. Can, yes. can, you, can you tell us about your experience personally witnessing this? Yeah, sure. Um, so while we were ballot harvesting at the East Valley Republican Women's Club in Palm Desert, California, um, there were a number of people who turned in like two, two ballots that were addressed to the same individual. And we, we of course, they didn't try to um, sneak them through, but they informed us and we kept them for our records. In, in California? In California. Thank you, ma'am. I forgot, is there a duplicate, Henry Bonner? Okay. Henry Bonner? Hey, I'm Henry Bonert, and I'm from, uh, I'm representing myself, and I'm from uh, Brazoria County, which is down in the, uh, along the Gulf Coast. Um, my position on the bill is for the bill. I think it's a very well written bill, and um, I, too, have been a, uh, an election judge and a clerk, and I could see, I can understand why some people may have reservations as a, as election officials where they might be uh, intimidated by this bill, but they need to understand, and I understand, that this is for people that are intentionally doing something uh, or knowingly doing something that is wrong or illegal in that. So most everybody has already uh, expressed those concerns, so I'm going to yield the rest of my time. Anybody have any questions? At the end? Members, any questions? Thank you. Mr. Bonner? The chair now calls Alan Vera. Mr. Vera, if you I think you know the drill, if you could please state your name, who, you, who you're who you with. Alan Vera, Chairman, Harris County Republican Party Ballot Security Committee, testifying in support of HB 574. During the election process and during the election period, I received nightly telephone briefings from our alternate judges serving on the Early Voting Ballot Board, Signature Verification Committee, and Central Count. In the, last in the last election this past November, there were multiple ballots rejected by the SVC, but overruled by the presiding judge and approved. There were ballots that were approved by the uh, SVC and overruled by the presiding judge and rejected. Uh, the worst thing was about 37 military ballots, which don't arrive in the same format as the format of the mail ballots to be fed into the machine, had been, had been duplicated incorrectly. They changed the service members' votes. Uh, the bill appropriately expands offensive categories uh, as, election call, as election fraud and appropriately increases the penalty. I recommend that the uh, committee pass the bill on to the full house. Thank you, Mr. Vera. Members, any questions for Mr. Vera? All right, thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify on, for, or against House Bill 574? If not, the chair recognizes Representative Bonin to close on the bill. Oh, but m Mr. Moore, one moment. I, hold on, did I already move to close on the bill? Okay. Oh, this is Mr. Ken Moore. We had already passed him up. Sorry, I had a hard time finding the place. One moment, sir. All right. 
So I can't back up and see her? Sort of. I don't want to put a point forward in the bill. All right. Mr. Moore, if you could please state your name, who, whom you represent, and your position on the bill. Okay. My name is Ken Moore. Uh, let me see. My name is Ken Moore. I'm a chairman of the Voluntary Committee for the Missouri County Republican Party. But to be sure, I'm here representing myself. I don't have authority from the, the uh, party to represent them. I would, ask, I would ask you to please pass this bill. I think it's very common sense. It uh, removes some ambiguity. And it also gives the, the law some real teeth to, to prosecute those who violate it. It makes it very clear that an election official cannot add votes that are illegal and cannot take away votes that are illegal. It raises this to a, a level of, of second degree felony, which number one, gives a, a lot of uh, uh, deterrence to someone committing the act to begin with, but also gives prosecutors uh, the time, the uh, tools they need to uh, uh, get people to, uh, to turn, well, suspects to turn on each other. Mm. I think it's a very common sense bill, and I ask you to please me. That's good. Mr. Moore, before you walk away, uh, yes. we may have questions though, just real quick. It shows you're Kenneth Moore in the system. You're Kenneth Moore? Kenneth. All right. Thank you. Members, any questions? Thank you, Mr. Moore. All right, is there anyone else who wishes to testify on, for, or against House Bill 574? If not, the chair recognizes Representative Bonin to close on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and members. So uh, currently, it is a second degree felony for an individual to intentionally fraudulently cast a vote. This brings consistency into our statute, and it, it's really pretty straightforward. Uh, with that, uh, there aren't any questions, I close. Absolutely. Not so, not so quickly. Re Representative Gonzalez. Um, and so is someone acting under the color of the law when they're, when they're counting votes? Are they acting under the color of the law, would you say? Under, uh, excuse me, which law? law? If, if someone is counting votes, are they acting under the color of the law? Would you say that they were? Under the color of the law. Could you define that term for me? Um, are they, act, I mean, under, I'm looking at another piece, another part of the code that re refers to acting under the color of the law. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure how to okay, well, interpret the question. Right, well, uh, it, it's pretty simple. We, we have a, a section of code, you know, currently, and, uh, and I can, I can read it to you. Sections 276.13, uh, a and B, and in A, it, it says a person commits an offense if the person knowingly or intentionally makes any effort to, one, influence independent exercise of the vote of another in the presence of, uh, of the ballot or during the voting process, two, cause a voter to become registered, a ballot to be obtained, or a vote to be cast under false pretenses, uh, and then currently, uh, number three would be cause any intentionally misleading statement, representation, or information to be provided to an election official or on an application for ballot by mail, carrier envelope, or any other official election-related form or document. And presently, those would be a Class A misdemeanor. What this bill does is it inserts uh, two other elements besides those three. Uh, so now you would have count invalid votes or alter a report to include invalid votes or fail to count valid votes or alter a report to exclude valid votes, and it would change the penalty to a second-degree felony, the current penalty for individual voter fraud. That's what this bill does. And would you consider um, election workers when they're counting votes being public servants? I would say that in order to be found guilty, they would have to demonstrate an intent to actually commit the act of either invalidly counting uh, votes or counting uh, or failing to count valid votes, and we'd have to prove that they did it. I'm just trying to, to understand the need the need for for your bill um, because it, it I mean from other parts of the code um, it appears that this would it would be this would be covered if somebody was intentionally um, you know doing the, you know doing these acts. There's there's and we've heard testimony already in committee of you know that. The, the unnecessary need to address an issue if it's already addressed in another part of the penal code. So, I mean, it appears that, I mean, there's two sections of the penal code that already address this, and so I, I don't see the need to, to have it in the elections code if it's already addressed in the penal code. 
Uh, it, I think it is possible to prosecute uh, a situation like this under a charge of fraud or forgery. This explicitly, however, defines miscounting votes intentionally with the intent to bring about a different result and proving that they, that, that was done. I, I think that's about as clear and straightforward as it could possibly be. The uh, penalty that is in this bill is what is already in statute for an individual. It seems to me a real misalignment in statute that it would uh, be a, a second degree felony for an individual to fraudulently cast a vote, but somebody could systematically try to change multiple votes and it wouldn't necessarily be a secondary or second degree felony. Uh, that to me is, is, is not appropriate and, and I think this bill addresses that inconsistency. And that's really important in terms of restoring the confidence of the people of the state and of this country in their elections. And, and that's what this is speaking to. I think it does it in a way that is fair, it's consistent, it's very transparent. Uh, it, and I can't think of, of a more uh, direct way to address what is a real one heartfelt concern of many, many hundreds of thousands, millions of people, and two, it addresses a true misalignment in current statute. Thank you. The chair recognizes Representative Beckley. Um, so is this bill in response to a specific event that you know of? Uh, well, the bill is in response to the, uh, to the reality that currently an individual could be charged with a second degree felony for fraudulent casting a vote, but someone else could intentionally miscount votes and would not necessarily be subject to the same uh, punishment. So do you know of a specific event where that happened in Texas? So uh, what I know of is that there is a, a deep concern about the integrity of our elections From and that this is an element of, okay. of statute where we have a clear inconsistency. And a, again, you could conceivably uh, prosecute such a case under a charge of forgery or, or fraud, but it is not delineated presently in the, in the code, and this puts it into the code. So can I get a yes or no answer? Do you know of a specific event that this happened that we need this law for? So I, I have, I've given you the reasons why I brought the bill so I'm, forward. So I'm and hearing I'm, no. Is that correct? Um, I don't pretend to have knowledge of all the behaviors of every person so in, you don't in have every a specific uh, event. election. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, members. All right. Representative Clardy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Bonna, thank you. Good to see you here this morning. Good to see you. Um, appreciate the bill. Thank you for bringing it to us. Uh, and you really do focus on the counting of ballots. I think we've heard the testimony. We've not seen an example in Texas. There's at least nothing documented where that's happened. But I appreciate uh, Mr. Green's uh, testimony a moment ago. Uh, and this is something we've all been hearing, particularly through the last election cycle and before. Um, my, my question to you is, in the research preparing this bill, um, do you feel like we have adequate um, processes in place for our elections administrators, election judges, uh, uh, poll watchers, et cetera, to make sure this doesn't happen? Because you know, I think it's right that with it, this is a serious offense. It's not a misdemeanor offense. This is a felony offense. Um, but an allegation is not worth anything if you don't have the proof. And so if we don't have people in the rooms during the counting who can actually document and be able to testify that and prove that case beyond a reasonable doubt, then the law is correct, but it doesn't have the teeth necessary to make it an appropriate deterrent, which I think is in large part what you're trying to accomplish. Is that right? Sure. You, you raise a great question, which is that this bill is, is limited to uh, speaking to uh, a mechanism of how you would actually prosecute such a case, but then the question becomes, if you don't have proof or evidence that it actually occurred, then you can't pursue it. Uh, the bill doesn't set out to create a new mechanism for uh, supervising elections that would ferret out uh, that information. Uh, I think there are other uh, pieces of legislation that are not before you at this time that do seek uh, to do that. So we're really just focused on, uh, on this one component of what is actually in the statute. Uh, but you raise a great question as to how would you obtain that evidence and I'll leave that to uh, some of our colleagues who have other pieces of legislation in front of the body. Conversation with some of our colleagues is something we've looked at because we have to have the ability to have the discovery, the information to provide to the prosecutors to actually make this stick. Because 
you know, the good news I've heard today is nobody's given me an example of this happening in Texas, but that's the standard we must keep. And to keep that standard, we need to have law and the teeth to enforce it to make sure this never happens in Texas. So thank you for bringing the bill. Well, we're at 100 percent alignment on that. This is very uh, narrowly focused, uh, straightforward bill, and, and you raised some really great questions that I think we'll be debating as we consider other legislation. Thank you. Members, any other questions? There's no objection. Thank you, Representative Bonnie, by the way. Thank you. I close. If there's no objection, the chair withdraws the committee sub substitute and the bill will be left pending. Is there objection? Chair hearing none, the bill is left pending. The chair lays out House Bill 752 and recognizes Representative Israel to explain the bill. Now you can recognize me. Hey. Here I am. I'll have some handouts. Good morning. Good morning. How are y'all doing? We need to lighten this hearing up, man. This Come is on. Jesus. Glad you're here. Um, thank you, Chair Kane and Vice Chair Gonzalez and, and members of the committee. Um, a common concern I've heard from party activists on the left and the right is the problem of lengthy ballots or ballot fatigue and long wait times to vote. House Bill 752 simplifies the voting process by declaring all races with unopposed candidates as elected and move them to the bottom of the ballot. No marking of the ballot will need to occur, eliminating confusion and saving voters time. In preparation for last session, I met with the Pflugerville Republican Party at their very kind invitation. And when I mentioned this bill, they literally cheered. We found common ground because ballot fatigue hurts everybody. Some counties currently do this realignment because the law is permissive. And when I meant the, the, the current law allows it for county and state races. We simply want to take a best practice and make it a statewide standard for local, county, and state races. Um, I've given you a sample ballot as a handout so you could see an example of, of how it makes things clear. Of the five largest Texas counties, Harris, Dallas, Tarrant, Bear, and Travis County, only Dallas County currently uses this process. So by requiring all counties to follow this process, the local, county, and state levels, we have the ability to reduce time spent in the voting booth and simplify the voting process. Um, I believe there's a representative here from the Elections Administrators Association who can answer more detailed questions about how this would be implemented practically. Um, I will um, leave it there. If there's any questions, I'm happy to address those. And um, we tried to limit the testimony so you can move through with it. Members, are there any questions for Representative Israel? Okay. Thank you, Representative Israel. We'll move on to uh, testimony. Thank you. The chair calls Heather Hawthorne. Hi, Ms. Hawthorne. Good morning. Ms. Hawthorne, please state your name. Tell us who you're with and your position on the bill. Absolutely. My name is Heather Hawthorne. I am the county clerk in Chambers County. I represent the County and District Clerks Association of Texas. Um, I am for the bill. Um, when we uh, talk about uh, savings to the taxpayer, this is an outstanding bill that will help the, tax, the local taxpayer by cutting down the size of the ballot. I really called this bill as I was calling colleagues over this, all over the state yesterday from county judges all the way down. I call this the ego bill because there was a lot of pros on cutting down, less programming, cutting costs, et cetera. And really the only con that we could come up with is that it's your ego that wants to see how many votes you get, not anything else. So we are for this bill and I will entertain any questions. Uh, members, are there any questions for the witness? 
chair sees none, so uh, we call the next witness. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the chair calls um, Alan Vera. Uh, the chair calls Christina Atkins. Uh, good morning, my name is Christina Adkins. I'm with the Texas Secretary of State's office testifying on the bill. Available to ask, answer any questions if you have any. Members, are there any questions for the witness? Uh, Representative Busey. Well, hi, Christina, how are you? Um, any complications implementing this? This be something that we can do across the, the state? Uh, that's correct. The, the, no complications. Smooth, aware of. smooth process. Correct. Awesome, thank you. Any other questions for the witness? Uh, chair sees none. Um, call the next witness. Uh, chair calls Julie Kellogg. Hello, I'm Julie Kellogg, and I'm from Nueces County, representing myself, Corpus Christi again. Um, I'm actually against this bill for a couple of reasons. Um, I, when I vote, I like to make sure that I get to cast a vote exactly for who what I want to vote for. I also think it's important in some in some instances, and we have it in Nueces County. There are candidates that are running up unopposed based on some of their stances. I don't vote for them, even if they're not opposed. And I think it's it's good for people to see that. And I think it's good for folks. I know she mentioned the, the ego factor, but I think it's also good for people to see, hey, maybe they're not as solid as they think they are. Um, I think it's good to keep people um, understanding that people are paying attention to what their, their stances are. And so I, I think we should always have a choice. And I think at the, the local level, we need to be able to put our vote out there and not just have basically the automation is what's concerning to me. I don't like that our vote gets automated to the point where yeah, it's just a slam dunk, there it is. I get it that it's a cost savings, but I don't necessarily think that we want to go down that route um, just to save some money. I think we really need to be able to say, yes, I want this person or no, because when you see the totals in the county or whatever the election might be, it's good to be able to see the level of support that that person might have. Um, so that's, that's really all I have is just the concern for the automation and taking away the actual level of support. Members, are there any questions for the witness? Representative Hart. Thank you, Madam Vice Chairman. Ms. Kellogg, thank you for your testimony. I, I tend to see this uh, kind of what you just testified to um, because, uh, I mean, I, with respect to the previous testimony about, about ego, I've been around elected officials. I've never really seen ego. No. Be a <laughs> um, <laughs> but but uh, that that being said, I do think there's an importance, n without respect to the candidate, but I think it's important. For part of voting and going through the ballot exactly. is an educational process for the voter and to remind them that I get to vote on everything from the president down to the dog catcher. That's right. Uh, and then sometimes we do get caught up, I think, in our thought process on. R versus D races, general elections, but there are a lot of elections that are held that have to do with other political subdivisions, which are nonpartisan elections. Uh, and I think it's a good reminder for people that you get to, you get to vote for your school board, for your right. BSD, for your MUD, for your city council, for your whatever. Um, and and again, like you said, sometimes the message is how many how many undervotes, the votes that you didn't receive, the people That's looked right. at your name and said, I'm not putting the bubble next to his or her name. Uh, can send an important message. Exactly. Uh, maybe not the message that they wanted to receive. Exactly. And so <laughs> that, I think that's a that's an important thing. Now I will say, to the extent that there is a election where there is that is the only item on the ballot, it is a waste of time and resources to have an election when the outcome is predetermined. Um, but more often than not, I, I don't. I don't see where there's an expense associated with having 10 names on a, a you know, what otherwise would have been 11 names on a ballot. There's still going to be the same printing costs. There's still going to be the same distribution costs. Uh, so, but, but I think it's just important to, to have people's names on there that people can consider that's who's my representative in that office. Is that, is that the way you see it as well? I think so. And I think it also sends a very clear message that sometimes people think, 
well, it's always going to be this way. I can't make any changes. But when they look at the total number of voters and the ones that actually voted for that person versus maybe not voted, it might inspire some people to say, hey, you know what? There's a lot of folks out there that don't necessarily agree with this person. It gives us an opportunity to say, you know, let's let's run somebody else. It doesn't have to always be just a slam dunk. So. Again, it's just our right right to vote is really what it comes Somebody down to. Somebody might have that revelation that maybe next time I want to stand up because that person shouldn't be unopposed. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Any, any other questions for the witness? Thank you. Is there anyone else here who wishes to testify on or against um, HB 752? Not, let me see, the chair sees none. If not, uh, the chair recognizes Representative Israel to close on her bill. Thank you, Vice Chair Gonzalez. Thank you, members. Do you have any questions for me? Um, so I live in Carrollton, and which is a city that's split between Denton and, Col and Dallas County. So um, those ballots, Denton County ballot will be two pages. So yes, I could see leaving the people on there. It's not a big deal because two pages front and back, not a big deal. But when you go to Dallas County, it's 14 pages and the level of voter fatigue and, and people having to do, so the people who live in, in the Dallas County part of Carrollton, it would very much help them because it's just so long. It takes so much longer to vote in the Dallas County part of the city than the Denton County. And yeah. just cutting down the time, you don't have to have as many polling locations. So I clearly see it where, where I live. Just. Yeah, thank you, Rip. Um, this is, um this bill passed unanimously out of this committee last time, and um, we didn't get the specific testimony, but the um, paper weighs a lot. Paper costs money, and when you're sending mail ballots, um, saving three or four sheets of paper saves postage. Um, to the extent that people want to take advantage of mail-in ballots, this is this is a, a practical uh, a practical bill. I'm, um, you know, I've been on this committee for three tours of duty. <laughs> and um, I always say that, that our, our friends at the county level who uh, administer elections are the most process-driven people I've ever met. They love process, they love procedure, they love efficiency. And this, this bill helps them be more process-oriented um, and more procedurally oriented and more efficient with the taxpayer dollars. So um, I see value. I hope you'll help me uh, get this thing off to a running start. Chairman uh, Kane, thank you for letting me um, give it some early life if we can. Yeah, well, I think it's a good bill. Uh, members, any questions for Ms. Israel? Uh, the chair <laughs> recognizes uh, Mr. Schofield. Uh, yes, sir. Ms. Israel, I remember back in, it was 2003 or 2005 when the legislature tried to do this. The only objection anybody heard was from candidates who wanted their name out. If any of you candidates are going to try to kill the bill because you want your name on, I promise you, when your four-year or two-year term is over, no one is going to remember having seen your name unopposed on the ballot. That is not name recognition. I, I swear to you, that was the only objection we heard. Yeah, you're, you're right. Good memory, Mr. Schofield, when we served on this committee together. The chair recognizes Representative Clardy. Uh, thank you, Chairman Cain, and thank you, Representative Israel, for bringing the bill. And I certainly understand your point of view on this. Uh, this is my first opportunity to serve on elections, uh, but and not knowing exactly who was here last time, I do remain the uh, lone lone voice in the wilderness from uh, the hinterlands of Texas that represent a different part of the state. And our concerns are very different. I, I appreciate that, you know, you do a ballot in Houston or, or uh, Dallas or the big cities, it looks like a phone book. And ours do not. Uh, and, and it's not an inconvenience, it's not a problem. And with all due respect to Mr. Schofield, it's not being driven by ego of the candidates, but it is important because the difference between our part of the world and your part of the world and why it works, I think, so much better is that in our districts, people actually know who their state representative is or who their district judge is or who their commissioners are because there's a, we're just closer together. There's just more. And so it, it reaffirms, I think, some confidence in the democracy that we have that we have this uh, personal relationship. They see that name and they say, yes, I, I want to return that person to office. Or as uh, our, our witness from Nueces County said, uh, not so much. And, and 
there's a message to be sent there too. So there is a, a there is a, there are some valid reasons to include it. And what I don't know, uh, and I'll have to talk to Mr. Schofield. Uh, he he uh, knows the legal issues I think much greater than I, having studied on these for low these many times. And and I don't think he ever gets to run on a post, so that's not an issue for him at all. Uh, but uh, you know. Is there a way to bracket these bills? Because I think the, the size of the ballot in the major uh, urban areas is overwhelming. It is, uh, I don't say intimidating, but it can it can be frustrating to the voters. And so I, I'm not unsympathetic at all, but I think it is important to, uh, to have people to say whether there was a choice or not, to be able to say yes or no. It's more like a referendum vote for an unopposed candidate. And that's, that's uh, I think, I, I do not want to see that go away. So my question is, do you know if there's ability to do this in a way where it affects certain areas of the state, the big areas, and not the smaller areas? Um, I would defer to the Secretary of State and the, 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 the practitioners, our EAs. Our EAs support it, and they're the most, they're, they're my, they've always been my experts in serving on this committee. So I would defer to them on what it means. But you had... You had a representative from a uh, not so large county also uh, give it her full throated endorsement. So um, we can talk about it more offline. I, I, missed, I missed who had the full throat. <laughs> Thank you, Representative Israel. Um, who, who, I'm sorry, who was the, the witness from the smaller county that gave it the full throat? With the uh, EA's association. Oh, yes. I'll have a conversation with that witness later. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> um, Mr. Israel, I have got a question. So this. This only applies to candidates for county and local races? Correct. Okay. Has anyone ever tried to do this for, for state and statewide elections? Um, I don't know. There would probably be a lot of pushback, huh? Probably. Why, why would that be? The, the E word, the ego word. Yeah, I okay. Suspect. All right. Thank you. And those are less likely to be unopposed. I mean, if you've got a libertarian or a, a, yeah. a, any, any kind of opposition, you, mm -hmm. you're a Green Party candidate, they're going to show up, of course, as they should be on the ballot. But you think the only reason people don't, don't like these things is because of what again? Ego. Oh, okay. Thank you. Ego. So I... I, I <laughs> We would never say that about our member and the colleague. Um, no, we would not. We, never, never. We all love each not other. Not in East Texas. All right. Um, but thank you for letting me. Um, thank you for letting me uh, make my case. Uh, I hope we can get your 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 unanimous support once again. And um, with that, I will close. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Israel. If there is no objection, the bill will be left pending. Is there objection? The chair, hearing none. The bill is left pending. The chair lays out House Bill 1622 and recognizes Representative Ryan Guillen to explain the bill. Representative Guillen, I see you've got a committee substitute, is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. Yes, sir. The chair lays out the committee substitute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to lay out House Bill 1622 and, and substitute. Uh, members, over 35 years ago, back in 1985, this body created Section 87 of the Election Code, requiring early voting rosters be kept, and then in 2001, required that they be made available for public inspection within 24 hours. And then last session, this body moved the deadline for public inspection up to 11 a.m. the next day. But, but still in the elections of 2020, many folks struggle to continue to struggle to get early voting rosters in time and even at all during some of these elections, particularly from local political subdivisions. Uh, so many early voting clerks fail to, still fail to post their voting turnout on time despite state, this state requirement. And this significantly uh, inhibits the ability for our system to track accurate votes and see where problems may arise. Such failures often are not significant enough to result in criminal charges, but still undermine the integrity of our elections. And no ramifications exist for clerks who, who fail to comply. So this bill creates a registry that the Secretary of State's office compiles to include submitted voter complaints, along with a list of those who didn't comply with this section of the code in an effort to further incentivize compliance. 
It ensures uh, early voting clerks are following their guidelines and posting early voting totals on time. Uh, clerks must be held to the requirements of their positions. It's too difficult for the Secretary of State to monitor and police all clerks to the level needed during early voting. Um, and so this bill allows for registered voters of that county to make a complaint to the Secretary of State uh, and for a registry of violations to be created. Uh, the committee sub simply fixes a, a drafting error. The original bill was in the wrong section, and this corrects that. And uh, again, I thank you for the opportunity to lay out this bill, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Members, any questions for Representative Gann, Representative Schofield? This is technical, so if the Secretary of State needs to get it, that's fine. The, I, I clearly understood the question. filed version to be about the results. If you don't post the results on time, a person can complain. This talks about a roster, and I'll be honest, I don't know what an early voting roster is. Is that the same thing as the votes, or is that the, is that the number of people that replied for a ballot? Um, for early, well, they'd be the best to respond, but let me just see if I, if I can answer it. Uh, early voting roster is everybody who voted. Um, there's two kinds. One is uh, everybody who voted in person, and then there's everybody who voted by mail. And, and by mail, there's two things that you can ask for. One is uh, everybody who requested a ballot by mail, and then everybody who actually uh, submitted or, or sent back the uh, vote by mail or the uh, ballot by mail. So um, those are the three things. I think this captures it all. And, and if you know, and I can ask them if you don't, the, the only thing that concerns, I like the bill, the only thing that concerns me is the time frame for getting the people who requested. I mean, one of the things we've done ever since you remember Wolins' bill back in 2003, we try to avoid harassing people that have requested a bill but haven't cast it yet, and so we don't allow sure. a lot of that information out. Is that covered in here, or are we simply talking about you're not giving us the, the results in time and of the people who voted? Uh, or the roster of people who voted, not necessarily the results. Yeah, and, and again, if that's something that I need to ask them, I'm... I'm, I'm pretty sure that this only deals with, um, you know, whoever voted. So let's say first day of early voting, uh, under current law, uh, the next day at 11 a.m., uh, it's due to be available for public inspection. So uh, this is... Who's voting. It, it, right. And uh, this is what it's requiring. That's already in law. All this does is says whoever doesn't comply, compile this list of them, uh, allow for complaints, and so that we can monitor that. And that, that's how I read the filed version of it. I just wanted to make sure that's still what happens Certainly. here. Certainly, yeah, that's, that's what's going on here. Thank you. Members, any other questions for Representative Gann? Hearing none, I think we'll move on to testimony. All right, thank you. The chair calls up Laura Presley. Dr. Presley, if you could please tell us who you're with and your position on the bill and then just state your name again. I think there's a, oh, there's a little a script up there on the podium that'll help remind you. Sure, just a second. Um I have to hand these out. Did my time not start yet? Please. Yeah, Dr. Laura Presley, represent True Texas Elections, who I'm a founder of, and myself, and my position on the bills, I support the bill. I'm a little confused what the bill is about now. So um, the filed bill had to do with election results. Correct, and I think maybe it's changed now to roster, but I'm not sure. So I'm going to speak on it as if it's filed, if it's intended the way it's filed. So I'm for the bill. My issue is that I'd like to add a component of it. The bill talks about election results after they're tabulated. What I want to let the committee know, uh, Chair Kane and, and Vice Chair Gonzalez and members, that counties right now are reporting early vote results, but
before election day, before the polls close on election day. And Representative Beckley, I love your questions about where are your examples, here they are. So what I wanna do is walk through these real quick. Brazos County, I have audit log uh, information in this packet that I've given you, and it documents early vote absentee and in-person results being printed and reviewed by county tabulation supervisors before the polls close on election day and sometimes days before election day. Brazos County, printed report day before election day, two days before the election day. That's page four. Williamson County, if you go to page seven, results printed, running the reports, two days, three days before election day. Page eight, Williamson County, printing results the morning, 9 a.m., before polls close on election day. Williamson County, printing results 10 a.m., 11 a.m., the morning before the polls close on election day. Collin County, page 11, printing results multiple times the day before election day. Travis County, page 15, printing results the day before election day for early vote and absentee. Bear County, printing results, page 17, early vote results absentee and in person the day before election day. Dallas County, page 19, printing results the day before election day. Harris County, printing results at 2 p.m. before the polls close on election day. What I'd like you to do is consider adding to this bill for counties to be tracked and reported for printing and revealing results prior to election day. In the election code right now, you do have a criminal penalty for revealing election results at the polls. You do not have a criminal penalty for revealing the whole county's election results before the polls close. So I'd like you to consider that potentially adding to this bill. Hmm. Any questions? Yes. Members, any questions? Yes, Representative, Representative Beckley. Beckley. So what this is saying is there's people who know what early voting results are prior, like hours or sometimes even days before. Yes, Representative Beckley, and you have, I love your questions when you ask people for proof and where's your example. Yeah. And there's more than this. These are just, These are just I picked a range. I picked the largest to mid to small. It's overwhelming. We have election watchers that have seen this, and um, it's amazing. So who are the people that are seeing these results? The election watchers, and also the, um, the election watchers get the audit logs before they leave the building, and it's documented in the logs, the early voting logs. Thank you. You're welcome. Any Members, other questions? Any further questions? Hearing none. Thank you. Thank you. The chair calls Robert Green. Mr. Green, if you could please uh, state your name. My name is Robert Green. I am representing Travis County Republican Party Elections Integrity Committee and myself, uh, and I'm in favor of the bill. Uh, you know, this, this, this appears to be a good bill to create a system for reporting voter complaints to the Secretary of State, plus receiving, documenting, and maintaining records for all complaints of involving county clerk noncompliance and reporting these complaints to the Secretary of State. I feel this is, this is an, important, an important aspect of the bill because we need to have records of problems. We've all seen people who say, Dr. Presley mentioned a number of cases. I've witnessed a number of cases that, uh, you know, we had problems with, with organization at the Travis County uh, Central Count. 
but I think this is an important bill, and I'll just I'll leave you with that. To cut testimony short and say it's a good bill, and uh, I agree with Dr. Presley saying that uh, we do need to add that additional information. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You, Green. Any questions? Members, any questions? No. Thank you. Thank you. The chair calls Kimberly Young. Good morning, ma'am. If you could please state your name, uh, who you're <coughs> representing, and your position on the bill. My name is Kimberly Young, also known as Kimberly Bridges Young, and I represent the Election Integrity Project of Nueces County. I'm the legislative bill chairman. Studying this bill, I come in at it from a different point of view, just like Bob Green. I'm really looking at it from the complaints point of view. Having been in the private sector most of my life, if we get a complaint against us, let's just say we get three complaints from a customer, we're gone. We're gone. So logging these complaints and actually keeping a record of them, I think is a good thing because that keeps public officials honest and it keeps them held to the same high or higher standards as private officials. So I am definitely for this bill. Those are good points, Ms. Young. I do have a question. Yes. Um, when you were out on the kiosk and typing in information, it, you told us you're representing yourself. I am you representing myself, but I am a member of the EIP. Okay. It's really important. It Thank can actually, you. It could, it could injure Mr. Guillen's bill that you're here to talk, we don't want to talk do in that. favor of. All right. So you're just here for yourself. That's right. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Members, any questions? None. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Members, we do have a resource witness here. Anybody would like to call up Ms. Ringham? Okay. The chair calls Keith Ingram, director of the Elections Division, the Texas Secretary of State, here to testify on the bill. Howdy. Uh, Keith Ingram here from the Elections Division, Texas Secretary of State's office, here on House Bill 1622. Happy to answer any questions. Representative Busey, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Ingram, we just heard about printing re results. Can you talk a little more about why they'd be printing results and what's in that and what that's about? Yes, uh, current Texas law allows counties over 100K to count early votes beginning after early voting ends and before Election Day. Uh, this allows them to be uh, timely in the reporting of the results on Election Night. So this is it's still confidential, right? This is not interested in looking it up. I'm, I'm sorry. 870241, if you're interested in looking. I appreciate it. So, I, I mean, I know you don't have this testimony in front of you, but so this this is part of the process to make sure we get our results and everyone can know what's going on in the election. That's so. right. And the, the penalty is with regard to revealing those results before 7 p.m. on election night. If those are being revealed to poll watchers, that's a crime. Have you had issues with that that you're aware of? We have not. All right. Thank you, sir. Chairman? Yes. Um, my question is, who has access to these reports, it, along with the representatives? It should be the county election officials only. Only. That's right. So the county clerk or election administrator and whoever ran the tabulation. Is there any way to track that? Very closely held. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Representative Schofield. Uh, well, one question on that before I get back to Mr. Gein's bill. Uh, so that would be, assuming that it got out to somebody who shouldn't have it. That's valuable information for somebody to have. They know how many votes they need to make up now. So this committee may need to take a look at fixing that uh, to make sure it doesn't happen because the party in power controls it, the It's a crime. Election. And on Election Day in Harris County this last election, poll watchers were insisting on their right to view this material, and I told them they did not have the right to view this material. And as a matter of fact, the more people that viewed it, if it came out, the more uh, possible suspects for the crime there were. My, my concern isn't the poll watch. My concern is the party in power that already has access to it. But let's get back to the bill we're actually here on. Have you had a chance to see the committee substitute for Mr. Gein? I have not. I assume that it moves it to 87121 instead of 123 where it was. It, yes, so that's good. So, I, so that much I know. It seems to me the filed version, well, the filed version is pretty clear. It says that, uh, um, and, and it, it just, all it does is add the ability for somebody to make a complaint if, if the information hasn't been given on time. And my understanding of 87.1231 as it exists now is that it deals with 
the votes that have been cast. Right, total number of, of early voting votes for each candidate. And if, they, if you don't get that information on time, you have a right to complain under Mr. Guillen's bill. Right. Uh, I'm, and again, you haven't seen this, so it's kind of hard to... But if you would look at it and tell us before we vote, it seems to me that this now, because of where we put it, doesn't deal just with the number of votes cast for each candidate, but who is voted, so that which may also be a valuable thing. You know, we, we can take them off our list and stop bothering them if they voted on the third day of early voting, but that's not what was the original bill. I agree with that. Uh, and, and I will say this, my concern that I uh, asked Mr. Guillen about is actually addressed in the, um, in the current statute, subsection F, which says information on the roster for a person to whom an early voting mail ballot has been sent is not available for public inspection except to the voter. So the idea of harassing people who required mail ballots, you couldn't do that under his bill either way. I agree. But if you could take a look at the committee sub and report to us the difference between what it is that you can complain about in the first and then the committee sub, that would be very helpful. Sure thing, absolutely. Um, sure. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ingram, you've been asked a question if you had seen this as a problem in the past. That was correct, and you had said no. Um, I, with regard to reporting early votes uh, the next day by 11 a.m., yes, we have seen that as a okay. problem. Uh, specifically with regard to Rio Grande ISD, they absolutely refused to follow the law in that regard. Okay. And when was this? Um, last year, or maybe 18, but maybe and both. Is it possible to have happened before that? Yes. Okay. Because current law requires them to report the rosters every day mm -hmm. after, after somebody votes, and they just would refuse to allow the inspection. Okay. And I talked to their lawyer, and they said no penalty. Yeah. We're not going to do it. Is the Secretary of State and... Do you, you believe that your office is informed of every violation of the election code? No, we are not. All right. Thank you. Members, any other questions? Representative Beckley. So I'm confused of whether this bill is the roster or the results. If it's in 87121, it's the roster. It's the early voting roster. Okay. Who voted that the day before? So basically, they're just trying. So every day, we get our roster, and then we pull them out so we don't harass them. We don't know how they voted. We just know they voted, so we quit harassing them. That's right. So it's not the results. It's not the results. Okay. So then this is this, this, this completely different then? It is. Okay. Thank you. Members, any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Ingram. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify on for or against House Bill 1622? Uh, if, if you've, you would need to register outside. Okay, we'll, we will we will check. Okay, last name Green, right? What's last name? Carter. It's Mr. Carter, Mike Carter. Okay. We're not seeing the system yet, sir. Is it possible you register on more than one bill? You could. Are you planning to testify on more bills today? Okay. Uh, I bet. you. Yes, of course. You can't testify, though, sir. I'm sorry. Um, you would have to go register. Ma'am, and your name? I understand. That's fine, Mr. Strickler. I, mm -hmm. Okay, we're looking. Did you talk to him, Justin?
I'm sorry, we have to move on. Um, there's nothing we can do right now. Please excuse us. You, 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 of course, can submit testimony in writing or, or sworn statement to the committee. Please excuse us. All right. The chair recognizes Representative, Representative Guillen to close. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, members, uh, Mr. Schofield and Ms. Beckley, the, um, what you all determined the sub to be is exactly our intent, and, and, and that was what our original intent of the bill was, and so that's why we had to fix it. And mm. um, therefore, that's why we have the sub. And so, again, if there's no further questions, I'd just ask for your favorable consideration. Thank you. Members, any further questions of Representative Ginn? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Ginn. There's no objection. The chair withdraws the committee substitute, and the bill will be left pending. Is there objection? Chair hears none. The bill is left pending. The chair lays out House Bill 1724 and recognizes Representative Paul to explain the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, glad to be here with you all today, and thanks for taking consideration of our bill. Um, House Bill 1724, um, whether acting on behalf of a candidate, party, or proposition, the duty of a poll watcher is to observe and safeguard the conduct of elections so that they are legal, fair, and honest. While some election judges welcome poll watchers as an exact set of eyes to ensure everything is done correctly, more often, a poll watcher is seen as a hostile adversary sent to challenge the election of the officials. So House Bill 1724 addresses these two areas of election watcher service, which is needed clarification. First, we address the autonomy of an election watcher. Election Code 3305-056A already entitles a poll watcher to sit or stand conveniently near the election officials conducting the observed election activity. Regardless of that clarity of the existing law, some election officials have put election <coughs> watchers in a separate room behind a glass window or have taped off areas for poll watchers in a gallery that do not allow the election watcher to actually inspect election activity. House Bill 724 adds to existing language <coughs> to include enough to see and hear so that the new sentence would read, a watcher is entitled to sit or stand near enough to see and hear the election officials conducting their observed activity, except as otherwise prohibited by this chapter. It is our belief that adding this simple phrase will further define and clarify the autonomy of election uh, poll watchers or election watchers to conduct their business fairly and freely. The second thing that we've done in this bill was to clarify uh, we're not really changing things, but we want to clarify uh, election watcher may speak, who they may speak. Uh, the code reads, a watcher may call to the attention of an election official uh, officer to any occurrence that the watcher believes to be an irregularity or violation of law and may discuss the matter with the officer. An officer may refer to the watcher to the presiding officer at any point in the discussion. In that case, the watcher may not discuss the occurrence further with the subordinate of officer unless the presiding officer invites the discussion. Election workers across the state have been taught for years that an election watcher may not speak to anyone but the presiding judge. This is a misinterpretation of the existing law. So we want to clarify that to make sure it's clear that the uh, poll watcher can include a procedural um, so they can talk to the clerks while they're watching it. We also want to include the language that they include a procedural mistake that cannot be reversed. And what this is, is if they see a, a worker and the guy comes in and I'm Joe Smith Sr. and they see that they've checked off Joe Smith Jr. in the book, that they would be able to point that out and they could correct that mistake before it would be a problem that would cause an issue with that person's voting. Uh, so the poll watcher can halt the process before the damage is done. If the poll watcher and clerk work out the issue, it's all great. If the clerk dis disagrees with the poll watcher, the new wording specifies that the clerk will stop the process until given instruction from the presiding judge. Uh, so if there was a problem, uh, like, 
Yeah, the alternate judge would give the instruction of the clerk if they're not there. Section three, the last thing we're added is uh, seeing or hearing language. Since we added that in there, we want to make sure that if you prevent somebody from seeing and hearing and presenting that, or if you had a taped off area where they couldn't uh, watch what's going on, that that would be a class A misdemeanor uh, to prevent those poll watchers from performing their duty so that we can make sure the election integrity is taken care of. And that, Mr. Chairman, I'd be glad to answer any questions anybody has. Thank, thank you, Representative Paul. Members, any questions? All right. Representative Paul, um, is there a process if I go in there and I'm, I'm, I'm a watcher, poll watcher, and I'm just in a bad mood, and I become disruptive? Is there a process to address my, me being disruptive, asking questions on every little minor things that aren't relevant? Yeah, it, as, as the, the election judge has got the ability to say, you're disruptive in our poll, you're disruptive in our office, and that you can be removed. And so they- That's they current law. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Representative Gonzalez. Uh, to to uh, Representative Fierro's question, what if there, the person was, was pointing out errors attempting to delay the counting of votes? What would happen then? Well, like I said, if, if the guy gets to be disruptive, hopefully there'd be more than one poll watcher there watching this, then y'all you got the ability to throw the person out. I mean, the, the, the goal of this is not to delay the counting process or cause problems or delay uh, the situation during the voting. We want to make sure and correct the situation so that it doesn't become a problem and have to go through central count and determine who that, who that vote might be or the, uh, the ballot review board. We want to fix it right there so that voter's account is taken care of. And we want to make sure that, that this deal of gallery behind the glass wall and all that during central count we can't do. What That's kind of training is required that. to be a poll watcher? Say again? Is there, is there any training required to be a poll watcher? No, I think um, I think there's there is law set up of what they have to do, but you don't have to have to do much training. Let me double check. No. Should. Thank you. Thank you, members. I will remind you we we have a resource witness here that we can also call up for asking technical questions. Representative Clardy. Thank you, Chairman Kane, and I'll avoid technical questions. Uh, but uh, to follow up on uh, Vice Chair Gonzalez, on the, the, so there's no training for watchers that you know of. Okay. There's no, there's no government faction training. Now, campaigns that send them over there or tell them what to do, or if you're working there for the county party, they'll, they'll be given direction on what they want to make sure. And I, you know, from experience, a lot of these people, that especially work in the central county, is, is uh, because I think I think the uh, there's a, a, a provision in your bill that says converse with presiding judge. The alternate may, a watcher may not converse with the presiding judge, the alternate judge, or the election clerk. And I think each of those individuals does receive significant training to, to perform. Absolutely, the is that right? That's absolutely. And you know I'm I'm concerned about voter intimidation and coercion. And your bill on the front end says, okay, you got to get near enough to be, to, to see and hear. But not so close. You're in somebody's business or private space. No, you know what it says. And, but and don't forget the, the, the presiding judge has the ability to police that. I don't know about you, Eliza. But when uh, Judy and I go vote, and you know, she typically stands next to me. Uh, you know, I don't want her looking over at my ballot. Uh, you know, I I don't like people in my not in my business, especially and, when and, I'm voting. And obviously, so this has got people, there's something about somebody lurking around. I don't care what they're called, poll watcher or otherwise, that I find somewhat distasteful. To me, there's nothing more private than the right to vote, and but that there are people that are already trained to do these things, the presiding judge and others, uh, who do know what the laws are, know what the rules are. Uh, I, I don't know. Yeah, I, and, I don't and, know if this gun kicks harder than it shoots. Yeah, Travis, and, and there's this would nothing to do with the booth. So the guy voting in a booth, nobody can get near you, right? So there's it's, it's got, we're talking about the process when you qualify a voter to make sure that the guy's getting qualified properly. Well, but, but it says near enough to see and hear, near enough to see and hear what? The process well, of qualifying that voter, not like not voting. the voting. And the and in the central count, so they could see this. This taping off in areas usually happen in, happen in the central count. Okay. All right, well, I'll, I'll look forward to the testimony. We'll, we'll come back. 
talk about. All right. That. Thank you. We'll be glad to discuss it further with you. Thank you. Members, any other questions for Representative Paul? Representative Beckley? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm just trying to see where the analysis of the racial impact of this piece of legislation. Analysis of what? The racial impact. Racial impact of voting? Of this piece of legislation. It, it, it. Did y'all run an analysis on that? Mm -hmm. I don't believe so, right? I don't think so. Okay. No, we don't I'm have kind of piggybacking on what Representative Clardy said about people lurking around. Just going to see if that's going to, I mean, it could be kind of. Yeah, but I mean, I understand what he's saying. You can't get around anybody voting. Right? Again, but the more people you have in there, the more it's disconcerting. Well, the, Re representatives, there will be decorum this committee. Let's, let's really try to avoid any possibility of uh, impugning the motives of a member, okay. please. Yeah, yeah. So and, uh, you didn't do the analysis. That's a yes. So I didn't do analysis on that. But remember, poll, this is not creating poll watchers. Poll watchers are already there. Poll watchers already have the ability to see. We just want to make sure that people don't violate the poll watcher law that's there by putting them in some place that it's impossible for them to do their job. Thank you. At that stage, if there are no other questions for Representative Paul, we can go to testimony. All right. Is there the right to close? Thank you, Chairman. Now, those of you out there, by the way, we are probably going to come up at some point. We have to go to the floor. And I want to remind you, right now, there's eight registered for this bill to testify, one against, and, and two neutral. So at this time, the chair calls up James. Slattery. I hope I said it right, man. Yes. James Slattery, senior staff attorney, Texas Civil Rights Project, registered testifying against. Mr. Slattery, if you could just repeat those things for us again and talk to us. Let's have copies here. All right. Hmm. Thank you. James Slattery, representing the Texas Civil Rights Project, against the bill. I'm here to testify in opposition to HB 1724, which would empower partisan poll watchers to halt the process of voting if they believe that there is an irregularity or violation of law. This would represent a dangerous expansion of the power of partisan poll watchers over Texas elections. Partisan poll watchers are agents of candidates and measures appearing on the very ballot being voted on. To be a partisan poll watcher, you are not required under Texas law to complete any kind of training or examination in election law or procedures. To the extent that political parties voluntarily train poll watchers, the content and accuracy of such training is entirely at their discretion and may vary highly in quality from one county to the next. They don't take an oath to observe Texas's election laws swearing only that they either do not have a recording device or have disabled one. Section 2 would give these agents of political campaigns a veto over whether people can vote based on their mere belief that there may be an irregularity, even one that falls short of violating any actual law. Only the presiding or alternate presiding judge can unlock this veto over voting. Judges may find themselves constantly being taken away from their duties in order to arbitrate disputes with poll watchers, while voters must stand there waiting helplessly in the meantime. Beyond the disruption to voting, such a power invites abuse. Poll watchers from one party may selectively deploy such vetoes against voters they believe align with the opposing party. This expanded power comes with no additional safeguards, such as a criminal penalty against the false use of such a veto by a partisan poll watcher. This bill threatens to turn partisan poll watchers from mere watchers of the polling place to micromanagers. We therefore urge the committee not to report this bill favorably. Thank you, members. Any questions for Mr. Schlatter? Representative Jutan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Slattery, I just have a, have a question for you. Um, what, what do you believe the purpose is of the poll watcher? I don't know. We don't run a partisan poll watcher organization. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, if, if there is a poll watcher there and they have concerns or they see something, you know, what, what would you believe is a reasonable action they should take to try to remedy that situation? So the statute already says, if I can pull it up here, 
that a watcher may not converse with an election officer except to call attention to an irregulation or a violation of law. And then it says in subsection B already, a watcher may call the attention of an election officer to any occurrence that the watcher believes to be an irregularity or a violation of law and may discuss the matter with the officer. So right. they already have. So, so arguably, they already have the ability to do this, and we're just allowing them to be able to maybe witness more so that they can potentially draw more attention to something that they see as an issue. Well, witness and then freeze voting because subsection, the new subsection C would say the clerk may not proceed. So it basically gives right, them until, Right, until proper instructions given back to them, which may be, we're going to continue on. This is, there's nothing, there's no issue here. We're going to continue on, right? right. Sim, similar to the current situation then. Well, no, uh, right now, poll watchers can't stop voting. Members, any other questions? Hearing none. Thank you. This time, the chair calls Christina Atkins, legal director, Texas Secretary of State Office, testifying on the bill. Good morning. My name is Christina Atkins with the Texas Secretary of State's Office, testifying on HB 1724. Thank you. Members, any questions? Go ahead, Mr. BC. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you talk about the current process and how this would change it? <clears throat> um, yes. Uh, I actually don't think that this bill has many substantive changes to the current process itself. Um, if an election or if a poll watcher has a concern about something that happens, they already have the authority to draw that attention to the election officer. This bill further defines you know, election officers being presiding judge, alternate judge, or clerk, which is what election officer meant already. It just provides some clarity there. Um, and in addition to that, the subsection C that I think we were a little bit concerned about or some of the testimony was expressing some concerns about, what this provision does is it provides a dispute resolution mechanism. That's how we read it um, in the sense that the presiding judge is the one that ultimately makes the call in a polling place. That's already what we would say the law supports when there's a conflict between a watcher and a clerk, that it would be up to the presiding judge to make that final call. I think this codifies that concept. I'm, I'm concerned about what we just heard in testimony about s slowing down the process, stalling it out. And um, you're, you're, you're not interpreting it that it gives them that a power to stop the election? I don't think so. I don't think that it provides any more of an ability to stop the process than is already there. Watchers already have the ability to draw attention or to an election officer any irregularity that's occurring or perceived irregularity within the polling place. And I don't see any language that goes, that would add something beyond what's already there. Or it the, adds some additional clarity, but. Would the election judge then still be able to help other people while this is going on and keep the elections moving? I believe so. Okay. All right, thank you. Ms. Fierro. Thank you very much. In section 33.058, the bill uses the language, including a procedural mistake that cannot be reversed. Can you give me a description of, of what that is? Um, so the phrase, uh, or you're talking about a potentially irreversible procedural right. mistake. Um, I actually think that would be maybe an irregularity under the law. You know, something that is not a criminal act, but something that is not consistent with the election code. So it could be a procedural issue. For example, maybe somebody is um, uh, in incorrectly having people fill out a reasonable impediment declaration. That would be a procedural issue, would also constitute an irregularity. Representative Schofield. Uh, with respect to Mr. Fierro's question, wouldn't what Mr. Paul said upon his layout be uh, fall into that category? If the poll watcher sees that you let John Johnson Jr. Uh, you checked him off, and it was actually John Johnson Sr. who showed up. That's irreversible, right? Once that vote goes in, we can't pull it back out and let the other guy vote. That's that's correct. If if, if there's an error in the check-in process that a poll watcher observes, I think that's a, an appropriate time for a poll watcher to draw attention to that issue. Thank you. Representative Jatan. Uh, thank you. just want to further clarify again. If someone is trying to be disruptive, or if there's a poll watcher that 
you know, is, is consistently asking questions and being disruptive. Is there currently procedures for that person for that? Is there a remedy for that? As yes. It currently is? yes. Under 32075 of the election code, the presiding judge has the authority to maintain order and prevent breaches of the peace. So they always have the authority to, to step in if necessary. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, members. Any other questions? Thank you, ma'am. Quick question for the audience. Is, can everybody hear the audio from these speakers okay? I've seen some people leaning forward, so there are some issues. Thank you for the feedback. All right. Um, members, we need to go to the floor. If there is no objection, the bill will be left pending. Is there objection? Chair hears none. The bill is left pending. Without objection, the committee will recess. Excellent. We have to go to the floor. We will be back, though. Final adjournment or recess of the House today or during the period authorized for reading and referral of bills if permission is granted by the House. The clerk will call the roll. Chair Kane. Here. Vice Chair Gonzalez. Representative Beckley. Vice Chair Gonzalez. Representative Beckley. Representative Busey. Representative Clardy. Representative Fierro. Representative Jaton. Schofield. Swanson. Pursuant to Rule 4, Section 16A, a quorum is present for the sole purpose of taking testimony. The chair lays out as pending business House Bill 1724. President Paul, I think I'm going to go back to another witness, though. Sounds There's good. There's more here. My apologies. I should have I told you that sooner. Okay. Ruth York. The chair calls Ruth York. The chair calls Marsha Strickler. Okay. Now, Ms. Strickler, this may not surprise you. We've got you as a witness twice now. I don't, I don't know what could have happened. You know. Uh-huh. Now, what, Hello, one moment, sir. One moment. There's two, so how do we resolve it? Ms. Strickler, can you tell us, and pick one, please. If you're here testifying on behalf of an organization, which one is that? Well, co we the people. All right. And yourself? And myself. Okay. As the founder of Wilco, we the people also. All righty. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, sir. Please go ahead and state your name, who you're with, and uh, your position on the bill. Thank you, sir. My name is Marcia Strickler. I represent myself. I represent the Williamson County GOP delegate. I represent Wilco, we the people. Okay, not, I don't do the delegates Just today. Tell me the one organization, ma'am. Wilco, we the people. Thank you. My position on the bill is four. House Bill 1724, that's what we're talking about here? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I serve as an election watcher, and, and I've been also a poll watcher during central count and during a manual recount of Proposition A in Williamson County, Texas, which is just the right next door to Travis County here where we are. During the manual sorting of ballots, no poll watchers were allowed. And during the rescanning process, we were asked to sit at tables approximately 10 feet away from the ESNS employees conducting the rescan. The ESNS employees conducting the rescan. And when it was time to pull the rescan data and save on thumb drives, once a complete precinct was scanned, 
we were told that the poll watchers would have to rotate in and out of a closet where the county election servers were operating along with a computer and a small desk. It's probably a closet of about uh, six by six or a six by eight maybe. And we were told originally we would have to rotate in and out because all of the poll watchers that were present were not allowed or would not fit. Uh, after the judge was conferred that was present, we were then allowed to anyone that wanted to sit inside and, and view that. I am for it because we need to be able to watch what we are poll watching. Any questions, sir? If members, are there any questions for this witness? Representative Beckley? Re oh, before you go, though. Okay, sorry. Let the record reflect that Representative Beckley and Fierro are present. Thank you. Might be important. Representative Beckley, go ahead. It might be important. Um, so was was there social distancing because of the pandemic going on in the room that you guys, and was that eliminate help hindering why so not as many people could be in there? We were requested to wear masks while we were poll watching. The majority of Central County is in a very large training room. And so we were able to, to do that on our own and not been told th that we needed to do that. Uh, however, in this particular closet, there would not have been any way that we could have been six feet apart. So I don't know if that answers your question. We, I don't know the reason why our, our election administrator originally said we needed to rotate in and out, but after the judge was conferred with, uh, we were told that we could all be in there and we were, it was just kind of a tight fit. Does that make sense? Yeah. And when y'all were all in the room, it was a tight fit, a tight fit. In this little closet, when they were actually taking the thumb drives and uploading it to the uh, computer uh, database, it was a super tight fit. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So do you think that, in your opinion, was some of the reason they were limiting the amount of people because of the It's pandemic? quite possible. Okay, thank you. It's quite possible. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I have no idea. Members, any other questions for this witness? Thank you, Marsha. You're welcome. I, can I say one thing? So I was that poll watcher in 1622 that I wasn't able to talk about, so I'm going to submit that in comments for y'all to review because I think you would have asked me questions in that one too. Oh, okay. Thank you, ma'am. The chair calls Glenn Maxey. Mr. Maxey, you know the three things we need to hear. Um, Glenn Maxey, representing the Texas Democratic Party, uh, we were registered on this bill. Great. Um, the Democratic Party, of course, uh, employs or uses poll watchers, candidates on the Democratic ticket use poll watchers, and therefore clarifying statutes about their rights and responsibilities is important. Um, the heartburn that we have on this has already been expressed today. It's in Section 2C about um, the term may not proceed until the uh, presiding judge provides clarifying instruction. Um, as Christina Atkins from SOS has testified, uh, they would interpret this as sort of current law already, uh, trying to clarify this even more. Uh, I'm aware that we have many poll watchers on both sides of the aisle and just random people who poll watch who are not trained. Uh, they are not experts on the code. Uh, and so the issue of being able to stop an election uh, while they ameliorate a supposed violation or problem is problematic. Uh, I would suggest that at, at a minimum this section have some clarifying words at it uh, that say at least that the clerk may not proceed with that particular voter um, until the presiding judge so that it's clear that we're talking about that one case and hopefully that case can be taken to the side and allow the election to continue. Um, and uh, I, I want to make sure that we're on the record to know that there are many pieces of legislation this session about the issue of removal of judges and many bills have been filed to uh, tamp down the ability of an election judge to move a um, election poll watcher who is uh, being problematic and in this case weaponizing 
slowing down an election by raising issues. Um, if those bills passed and we can't remove these kinds of problematic watchers, this could become really problem, a, a real problem. So I'm, I'm trying to think ahead about how these things go together. So clarifying that language. Mr. Maxey, sure, what was your recommended language again? Uh, that they might not proceed uh, with that particular voter uh, at a minimum. Uh, quite frankly, since current law already deals with this, I'd like to see the whole section go away. Understood. Members, any questions? Thank you, Mr. Maxey. The chair calls Alan Vera. All right, Mr. Vera, if you could tell us your name, of course, and who you're with and your position on the bill. Alan Vera, Chairman, Harris County Republican Party Ballot Security Committee, speaking in support of HB 1724. A properly vetted, thoroughly trained poll watcher can be a real asset to an election judge in preventing mistakes that reflect on the judge's record. But only if the poll watcher can be close enough to see what's going on, and only if the poll watcher's advice is at least listened to, if not followed. Uh, in, the, in the last election, despite the best intentions of the Secretary of State, too many election judges used the COVID situation to keep poll watchers far, far away from seeing or hearing what was actually going on. That was unfortunate, or some errors could have been caught and prevented. Um, and the issue of clerks not listening to the poll watcher is just a practical one. If the poll watcher is seeing stuff that the clerk didn't see, like the voter's name, junior, senior, or the provisional ballot versus regular ballot, the poll watcher could prevent errors, which then come back to bite the judge in the butt. This bill simply clarifies existing code and makes sure that the proper conditions are present for the poll watcher to do his job or her job legally and properly. We recommend this bill be passed on to the full house. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vera. Members, any questions for this witness? Thank you. All right. When is that? I just want you to know right now we've only got eight remaining witnesses all here to testify for this bill. So if you, if you have, uh, if you hear somebody already saying maybe what you were saying, if you'd consider maybe passing that up. All right. The chair calls Angela Smith. Ms. Smith, if you could state your name, tell us who you're here representing if that's or in your position on the bill. Certainly. My name is Angela Smith. I'm with the Fredericksburg Tea Party and I'm here representing that organization as well as myself. I am uh, for this bill. Um, committee, I have volunteered my time three different um, election cycles and they've all been uh, very um, interesting. I've been able to learn more every time. I have also been trained um, to do the job. Um, let me just say that poll watchers like myself at Central Count usually arrive around 7 in the morning and I have left as late as 3 in the morning. Okay, this is not an easy job and I take offense when I am demonized as someone who is trying to slow the process or get in the way of any of the election officials. I do not believe that this is a partisan issue. I think it is a very much a bipartisan. I think my friends on both sides of the aisle would agree with that. And I've done a lot of research in that as, as a matter of fact. So um, I wanted to address the three points that um, came up earlier um, and that what this bill is trying to um, trying to do, um, trying to establish the autonomy of elections watchers. Listen, COVID did nothing to change the way I've been treated at the uh, central count. Every single time, it's the same thing. And this is in Gillespie County. This is a small county. I can only imagine 
what happens in Harris County, to be honest with you. Um, taping off of areas on the floor as if I was a gallery watcher um, started long before COVID. Um, and I could not see or hear exactly what was going on. Um, so to, to even think that COVID changed that is a fallacy. Um, clarifying the election watcher who they may speak to. Um, election judges definitely in our area do believe that I am adversarial. I am not adversarial. I am only doing a volunteer job, taking away from my own work and family to do something for the community. Um, this is a very important job. I take it very seriously. I take uh, state code very seriously. I have no desire to uh, commit any kind of offense. Have I met my time already? Okay. All right. Thank you. So um, I am there, and it is a very it, it turns into an adversarial situation, and I'd love to see that clarified. Also, seeing and hearing the language. Um, it says that this makes it a class A misdemeanor. I have been told that I can sue them if I don't agree with them. As they've actually been told, sue me. So I think that it needs to be a felony. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Smith. But yes. Members, any questions for this witness? Thank you. Thank you. Witness for clarity, if you, uh, we're, we're, let me testimony three minutes. So if you hear a beep, that means uh, 30 minutes left, that, that one beep or the yellow light there. 30 seconds. Yeah, that would be correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was uh, a, a metric time or something. I'm just kidding. I think everybody just said. Literally, Twitter's now going to say, I actually think 30 minutes is some metric for sections, seconds, but whatever. All right. <laughs> Next witness. Uh, the. Yes. No. All right. Representative, I mean, let's back up. The chair now calls Jeremy Bravo. Got my members getting me confused up here. Mr. Bravo, if you could please state your name. Tell us with whom you're representing. Good afternoon. Your on the bill. Representing myself, and I'm for this specific provision within this bill. So I'm not going to repeat what a lot of other folks have already stated. I think what we have right now is a constitutional issue at the same time. We've talked a lot about Texas election code, but we have clearly missed the gap on federal election code. So when you think about the 2020 election, there is federal laws that are associated with the United States House of Representatives, the Senate, and of course the executive branch of the United States government. When I referenced the grant earlier, there is clearly a quid pro quo written in the grant. It violates Article 1, Section 4 of the United States Constitution. When you think about federal election law. Today, you have Speaker Pelosi that is trying to disenfranchise 400,000 Iowa voters for a U.S. congressional race using Article 1, Section 5 to kind of bypass that using the Federal Contested Election Act of 1969. So ultimately, each and every one of you take an oath of office to protect, uphold, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Every single election worker, election judge, they should clearly have a distinct understanding of constitutional law because you're literally deciding on somebody's civil rights and their right to vote, which is incredibly important. Or there would be no reason why anybody would go to the voting booth ever is by that fact. So look, nobody's perfect, okay? So you, when you find election judges, when you find volunteers, these people have to have a distinct understanding of civics in some capacity. I don't know if it's Civics 101 prior to um, the ballot boardroom, but some of the things that I've seen when I was a poll watcher were absolutely, uh, it was unconstitutional. I mean, you had people that were voting within an hour of each other. Is that something that our elections administrator could fix? Probably not, because that person chose to do that. But then you have people that are trying to decide, they're not attorneys, on whether or not some, this vote should count. So when you think about the mail-in voting, there were so many different things that were wrong that uh, you see from a chain of custody standpoint that um, 
really would make any human being that was aware. So if you were to make that uh, the ballot boardroom open to the general public, yeah, it would probably be uh, it wouldn't wouldn't be a very fun experience because people would ask a lot of questions. But look, the federal election code is completely different than the Texas election code, so it's just having that finite understanding that you're not violating any type of federal laws along with state laws while um, operating an election. So. Thank you. I don't know if you have any questions. Members, any questions for this witness? Thank you, Mr. Bravo. Thank you. The chair calls Robert Green. Mr. Green, if you could please state your name, roughly as Robert Green, and uh, who you're with and your position on the bill. Mr. Chairman, my name is Robert L. Green, Jr., as a matter of fact. Robert Green. <laughs> my name is Robert Green. I am the chair of the Travis County Republican Party Elections Integrity Committee. And I'm, I'm here. Uh, I can't even remember whether I put down on or for. Which was it? Mr. Green, I have you shown as being for the bill. I will stay So you're for the bill. That's correct? Yes. Yes. Couple of things. You're for the bill, please. I am David. for the bill. All right, excellent. Um, I have a couple of questions with regard to the latter part of the bill, one of which where we talk about the watcher from seeing or hearing an activity the watcher is entitled, actually entitled under the law to observe. But I also see here that there is there is no penalty for violations of this. And I have the question, would I ask the question of the author? How could an election official unknowingly prevent a watcher from seeing or hearing an activity that the watcher is authorized to observe under the law? Can, can that question be answered? How could someone unknowingly do it? Okay. <laughs> Does anyone know how that could be possible? Hopefully we'll answer that question shortly. Well, you see, see, most of this stuff, I, I don't see this as a problem in the most of the polls. This is stuff that occurs in Central Count and, and ballot board and stuff. So um, that's, that's why I wanted to, to bring that point up. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd, like, I'd like to say that that section of the bill needs, needs to include a penalty for violations because, once again, without a penalty for violations, what good is the law? Uh, unless anybody else has any questions. Mr. Green, yes, I have a sir. question for you. Yes. How could someone unknowingly do this? You'd ask me. I was just curious what you think. I don't think it's possible to unknowingly prevent someone from watching or hearing what's going on. Okay. Members, any questions for this witness? Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Green. Thank you. The chair now calls Jeanette Hormuth. Hi, right, Ms. Vermouth, if you please state your name, tell us whom, we, whom you're with. Right it, here it shows me you're, you're testifying on behalf of yourself and your position on the bill. Yes, uh, my position is yes on the bill. And my name is Jeanette Hormuth. I'm from uh, Gillespie, Fredericksburg, Texas. And you're here for yourself? Or, or? I'm here for myself. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. So um, I appreciate this bill. I've never spoke here before, by the way. This is the first time I've ever spoke up on anything. Um, but I appreciate the bill in especially this language to see and hear. Um, in 2019, um, November the election, um, I was a watcher at Central Count. A number of us got trained really well to go down there to practice to get ready for 2020. And um, we're in a small town and when we went down there, I was shocked at what we went through uh, we were there till like two, three in the morning, but the um, we were not allowed to see anything. <laughs> we were allowed to observe. Actually, I call it um, spectate. We had to sit in a uh, boxed out. You know, they put tape on the floor. I had to sit over there. And when we showed them the law, you know, that we're supposed to be able to observe. Um, the activities showed him the law. He said, well, I'm in charge here. I have discretion. And we knew that the election judge does, he is in charge in the room. But 
anyway, when we brought attention that it's a Class A misdemeanor, he said, well, this is how it's going to be. So we didn't do anything. The next time we go to election, um, now we started calling the Secretary of State. The Secretary of State would send emails specifying that he is not following the law and that you need to let us see and get close enough to the activity. And this has gone on four times now, and it hasn't gotten better. It's gotten worse. And I would say that they're knowingly breaking the law because we shot. We, I even said, you realize it's a Class A misdemeanor? He said, sue me. So more than anything, this language is really good, but we're finding that there has to be some sort of mechanism of consequences because otherwise there's no reason to keep going. And um, so I just ask that uh, I know that there was a bill somewhere about making it a felony. Mm -hmm. That would be better. But anyway, right now, as it is, um, again, I appreciate the C in here. That's more specific. Um, and then also the thing about bringing attention to things. We know that we're not in charge. We're just there to draw attention to something or to document when things are not right, okay? Um, so I think it's important to leave this here as well. Um, the watchers help catch things. We've caught a lot of things, but like I said, it's the enforcement and the, the um, harassment really that we have to, and we're just volunteering. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. One, one moment, though. Questions? Members, any questions for this witness? All right. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Congrats on uh, testifying your first bill. Get out of the way. The chair now calls Laura Presley. Now, Dr. Presley, I've got you also registered twice. So. We're just covering our bases because of the, the little okay. computer out there. So you're here testifying on behalf of whom? The Joshua Council and True Texas Elections. Okay. And I'm presenting for the bill. Uh, and your name? And my name is Dr. Laura Presley. <clears throat> okay. It also shows here that you represent yourself. And myself. All righty. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, this is a really good bill, and... You know, just in general, watchers are just the key volunteers to keep transparency going on uh, at the vote in the voting location and at the central counting location. I have trained, personally trained, about 300 election watchers for the last over the last five years for the central counting stations, and we have seen a lot of issues that this bill corrects. We have had interpretations from the election administrators around the state that the term conveniently means what's convenient for the election administrator. And we have uh, escalated that to the Secretary of State's office. Christina Atkins has been a huge help along, along this area in the Secretary of State's office. But this language that we, the watchers get close enough to see and hear is what clarifying language we need. And I think the SOS needs that language also when they're coaching these counties into not obstructing these watchers. And along the lines, um, Representative Beckley, we have cases right now, there are criminal complaints in the AG's office currently under, um, I think it's election code 276.001, two complaints in Dallas County, two complaints in Bear County, one, two complaints in Travis County criminal complaints on obstructing watchers because it's a class A misdemeanor. My understanding is the AG's office, if this were a felony to obstruct the watchers, they would have a lot more priority to go address those issues. Not only are there criminal complaints in the Attorney General's office, there is a current civil complaint right now in the Texas Supreme Court on watchers being obstructed in Dallas County. That case is in the Texas Supreme Court, and it says that watchers don't have the standing to bring a complaint. We have watchers who can't go to the bathroom, and if they go to the bathroom, they will not be allowed back into Central Count to watch. That is shocking, and it's the truth. It's in that Texas Supreme Court case right now where Dallas County Appeals Court was in a split decision. Two said the watchers don't have legal standing. One uh, appeals justice in Dallas said they do have standing. This is going to really clarify a lot of things, this, this, these changes. The other thing I'd like to add, there's a recount 
watcher language in chapter uh, in 2.13.013. It's recount watchers. I would like to see this bill have the same language for recounts. Um, that's basically it. And I think that, you know, I highly recommend the passing and turning this into a felony when you obstruct watchers. Hey, any President, questions? Members, any questions? Mr. Mr. Chairman, this is a comment. Um, you, you brought up some accusations um, that the AG was investigating or yes, sir. file complaints. Can we asked for that, in, that data. Um, Mr. Chairman, have we received any of that data yet? Yep, we just received it. We can get it out later today. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Six complaints that I know of for watchers. Members, any other questions for this witness? Thank you, Dr. Preston. Thank you. The chair now calls Kimberly Young. Thank you, ma'am. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify on, for, or against this bill? Your name? I, I do the the other one was one. We, I, I see Ruth York as well, and she was on one, but we had we had called for you and you weren't present. We might be able to back it up. Mm -hmm. Please, ma'am, if you'd like to go check, you may not have pressed submit. So it's a it's a lot like writing an email and then clicking send. Yes, ma'am. The chair now calls Ruth York. Yes, ma'am. I can't have you approach or, or testify unless you're registered. Yes, ma'am. Or you could submit written testimony. Howdy, Ms. York. If you could please tell us uh, your name and, and who you're representing and your position on the bill. I'm Ruth York, uh, speaking for myself in support of HB 1724. Um, I like that the, the language here clarifies a vague area. I think that's a very good thing to have. Um, and I might just point out that um, efficiency in processing voters is critical, but so is accuracy. So inaccuracy could disenfranchise someone who, who is eligible to vote. Um, unlike some of you here, we don't get to change our vote if we if our machine malfunctions or whatever, so, so, <laughs> so we would no like to get it, right, about, get it right the first time. So uh, that's it. I, I am in support of this bill and hope you will. Thank you, Ms. Ms. York. Members, any questions? Thank you. Have to have you here. Ms. Courtesy, we'll wait a few more moments. In the meantime, for those of you testifying today, you may, if you're, maybe it's your first time to come up to Austin and testify on things, you might hear me trying to be a stickler and asking for you to state your name a certain way or asking for you to tell us certain things. Those are, those are really important. The rules require us to, to ask those things. And, and if there's conflict, sometimes you could actually be here thinking you're here helping a bill, you're for it, and something get written down wrong, and you could kill the bill. So it may sound like I might... You're wondering why is he pestering us and wanting us to do it. We're just wanting to make sure everything's done properly and according to the rules that, that our, our body has adopted. Just in case, other than that one young lady, anybody else here planning to testify on for or against House Bill 
Representative Paul, do you know how to juggle or anything? Or? Chair calls. Susan Dininger. Dininger. Howdy, ma'am. If you could please state your name. Tell us with whom you are here representing and your position on the bill, please. Susan Dininger. I'm with the uh, um, Patriots Club and the Republican Party of San of uh, Kerrville, Texas, okay. Kerr County, Texas. I've got written down here. You're here for. Uh, we have to clarify that. So, we got it for self and Patriots Republican Party Kerr County. Correct. So that's a Patriots Republican Party Kerr County is one. It's place. Patriots Club is a separate group, an activist portion of the Republican Party there. Okay. Are we able to make <laughs> that correction? Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Proceed. And you're for the bill, correct? I am for 1724, okay. yes. Go ahead, ma'am. All right. Trying to be organized here, okay? Um, I have organized a uh, group for poll watching for the Republican Party and Patriots Club for the last three cycles of voting in Kerr County. So I have uh, watched, observed myself at Central Counting twice and been reported to and done training with Dr. Presley for the poll watchers at the polls. Two incidents. This last November 3rd election, one of my poll watchers was in, um, standing there, a person came in, got a, a ballot, went to the machine, realized something was wrong. She hadn't voted for the regular local candidates. Said, and, and I heard her say, what can I do? And I said, ask the clerk. And the clerk said, Oh my gosh, I didn't know. We had two ballots. One had local candidates as well as state, and the other one did not. There was nothing she could do because it was a voting machine. She just lost her ability to vote for the local candidates. Um, and that was that clerk, the judge intervened and said this was a new clerk, didn't know, and she'd been handing these out kind of randomly. Uh, it's a real problem, okay? All right. Um, and then I, when I was at Central County, we could not watch closely as absentee ballot signatures did not always match. Uh, even different from a distance, and I asked the judge about this, they were gracious. And the judge was given the ballot, and she, uh, I asked how she could tell uh, the, the differences in the names on the same absentee ballot. Well, the M's and the H's are similar. I was not close enough to see. And at the table with two people looking at the ballot, one Republican, one Democrat, presumably, in case there was any problem, uh, at three or four of these tables, there were only one party represented. And um, I would have been relieved to have been able to look at the M's and H's myself. Uh, the other part of it is a watcher caught the fact that when they were putting together the vo votes to bring over to central counting, the chain of custody was not done. She called it to attention of the sheriff, and the sheriff put it together, and they went and got the chain of custody, of what, the materials involved in it, the locks and all, and, the, and they did the chain of custody. But there really are important um, purposes and uses of, of the watchers, and thank you very much. I do believe in their being trained but um, it helps to have them. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Members, any questions? Um, Ms. Ms. Dyinger, yes. I do have a question. Um, you know, you're talking about training. Um, could you see a, a, you know, a circumstance where if we're requiring training that it, that would actually create less poll watchers? 
maybe people yes, want to do it? Yes, I don't think it, yeah, I, I, I really think it would, yes. But I know I was, my first poll watching, I wasn't trained, and I saw someone come up, and there was a real question. They were told they couldn't, they had done a, a write-in ballot, a mail-in ballot, and they said, no, I didn't, no, mm -hmm. I didn't, no, I didn't. They weren't allowed to vote. But you've and received I, training through private organizations and friends and things like that, is that correct? Um, actually, I ranged through it for it through the uh, election integrity and Dr. Presley's groups, and tried to get as many of our people as. Is we could. that did you did you receive training from a government organization? Organization. A government group. It was a private organization, correct? Private okay, organization. So it was private entities. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else here? Wishing to testify on, for, or against House Bill 1724. Hearing none, the chair now calls up, recognizes Representative Hall to close on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Uh, as you can see from all the testimony, uh, this is an issue that a lot of people care about. We want to make sure and get done so that we can make sure and ensure that every vote counts. And the goals of what we're trying to do with this, especially in Section 2 or whatever, is to make sure that those votes count. Because if somebody messes up and it, that vote doesn't count, somebody's just lost their right to vote. So the key is to making sure that, that we do it. Uh, the uh, Secretary of State does have poll watchers guide on their website, so there's a way to get access of how that would work through the Secretary of State's office. and. Um, and at the time, there's no other, you know, government required training. Uh, I was going through some of the questions. Uh, as, but as mentioned uh, before we took the break, the election judges and clerks and the county elected officials are required to have training concerning what poll watchers are, do and what can do. Uh, I also appreciate the testimony from the Secretary of State confirming that this bill provides merely clarification of existing law, but this bill does not create any new law. And uh, Section 1 clarifies the autonomy of the poll watchers. Under current law, a poll watcher cannot observe a voter while they are voting unless a voter has be requested assistance from one of the election officials working on the polling place. And the uh, first part of Section 2 simply pulls the definition of election officer from another part of the election code uh, to prevent tr traditional misrepresentation who the poll watcher may talk to. So um, I think this is really a good clarification bill to make sure where we are and take care of uh, the things that we need to do. It addresses situations in Central Count. Those were a lot of the abuses were taking place, as well as clarifying what they could do in uh, election voter qualification. So I'd love to have y'all's consideration and uh, appreciation. Oh, and then uh, the other gentleman mentioned something about knowingly. Uh, that is current law. Our bill does not change that at all. So that's currently what's in the law. Let me spawn. I believe there's a few questions, though. Representative Busey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Paul, just real quick. We, when I was asking questions earlier to the Secretary of State, my, my questions were a concern that while a poll watcher is interacting with the election clerk, that this could bring the voting to a halt. And, and so we heard Representative Maxey bring up the idea of changing the line to be more specific to say for that specific person as opposed to everyone else in line yeah. everybody else. Well, you know, Would you the, be open to that? Yeah, I'd be glad to look at that and, and, and talk to the to y'all and them about that. Uh, but you know, what the Secretary of State said when she was up here, she didn't interpret it that way at all. So, but No, I appreciate that. I just out of my concern as this bill is trying to clarify, I think if we could add that it might help ease some of the clarification across the board as we're moving yeah, forward. Yeah, and that would be fine. I appreciate it, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, are there any other questions? Members, are there any other questions? Thank you, Representative Paul. Thank you. Appreciate y'all's concern, uh, consideration of this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If there is no objection, the bill will be left pending. Is there objection? The chair hears none, and the bill is left pending. Chair lays out uh, House Bill 1725 and recognizes Representative Paul to, uh, to explain his bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Madam uh, Vice Chair. Appreciate you. Um, today, I want to address uh, unmanned and manned 
in-person drop-off location for voters who are voting by mail. Some counties operate on the premise that if the election code doesn't say that we can't do it, then we're going to do it. And that's never been the position uh, in elections in the state. The better approach to the election code is if it doesn't say we can't do it, then we're not going to do it. For the benefit of the counties in the first example, I believe we should be pro 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 proactive in voting issues not previously addressed in the Texas election code but are becoming prevalent across the nation. First, let's talk about the unmanned ballot by mail in-person drop-off. No law exists prohibiting drop-off to unmanned locations specifically and uniquely for a ballot by mail. No law exists permitting drop-off to unmanned locations specifically but uniquely for a ballot by mail. The unmanned ballot by mail drop-off places are already have are hundreds or thousands in your counties. Uh, they're called the U.S. Post Office in any mailbox on your corner or on your door. We need to be certain different political subdivisions across the state are not creating local election law or creating ballots only unmanned drop-off locations. Unmanned ballots by mail drop-off locations are subject to vandalism or damage, providing no more security than the U.S. Postal Service, will never be accessible abundant as U.S. Postal Service mailboxes, and we require additional costs to provide, deliver, store, and pay workers to collect these ballot envelopes. And I might also point out that if you damage or steal one of these, there would be no penalty since these devices don't exist in Texas law, where in mailbox, there's tons of federal law that protect anybody tampering or touching with the U.S. mail. Next, let's consider manned ballot by mail drop-in person drop-off. Current law only permits in-person drop-off of a completed ballot by mail only by the voter, only at the early voting clerk's office, only on election day. Governor Abbott's proclamation in July 27, 2020 extended that in-person drop-off from that day until election day, uh, still only by one voter and still only at the early voting uh, clerk's office. The only difference was that you would have kind of done it by more than one day. It was a temporary, uh, temporary issue. House Bill 1725 provides clear and clean separation between voting by mail or voting in person. Early voting in person and election day voting are in, both in person. Early voting by mail must either be returned by mail or common carrier. No unmanned in-person drop-offs for ballot by mail. No manned in-person drop-offs for ballot no unmanned or manned drop-off person for ballot by mail. Uh, this bill simply eliminates all in-person delivery uh, of a ballot by mail. This bill does not preclude a voter who receives a ballot by mail from surrendering his or her physical ballot by mail during early voting or on election day in exchange for her right to vote for a regular ballot in person as provided by Texas Election Code. For the ballot by mail voter who is physically unable to stand in line to vote, that person would be much more convenient for those voters uh, to park in a curbside parking location and do the process in that way. They could also turn in their ballot by mail if they have not done it so. The Secretary of State Forms 5 through 11A require the voter to, to print and sign their name and present an ID in order to deliver a ballot in person. If they do not have one of these seven acceptable forms of voter ID with them, they may either have to go back to the car or go back to get it or execute in a reasonable impediment declaration, it's not as convenient as voting curbside already. Uh, so the general idea is to make sure we make this a lot more convenient, to make it easy, and to be clear uh, that ballot by mail can be dropped off at the thousands of voting locations or drop-off locations called the U.S. Mail, and to make sure that it's clear that people can do this when they come in and vote. So glad to answer any questions about that. Thank you, Representative Paul. Members. Are there any questions for Representative Paul? No? Chair recognizes uh, Representative Beckley. So this year it was kind of extenuating circumstances on different things. Um, so the U.S. Post Office recommended voters mail in their ballots by the Tuesday before election, but elections officials were not legally required to mail a ballot until the Thursday before election. Um, Many voters received their ballots after the USPS's suggested return deadline, leaving these voters with a few good choices but to return their voted ballots in person. If this bill passes, what would the solution be for those voters? Well, you could always vote, so even up to 
the end of the day, as long as it was postmarked on election day, you could put it in the mail. So if they physically had it in their possession to walk down and go to the voting location and put it in, they could physically walk down and stick it in the mail. It's, it's the same because the mail was going to take it that day and it's postmarked that day and that would count for their vote. So there was no some restriction on their voting by putting this in person at the voting location or putting it in the mail at that same day. I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of uh, voters are more likely to drop their ballot off instead of mailing it? I, I don't know why somebody would want to drop off their ballot there instead of stick it in the mail, you know. If, if their ballot, if they hadn't used it yet and they want to make sure and get it counted, they can go, go ahead and vote in person. They just bring the ballot by mail, turn it in to the uh, elections people there. They take it. There's forms they have to fill out, and then they vote just like any other regular voter. So they could do that. And as I said, if somebody felt that they're, they're um, unable to stand or do in line, they could, they could do it curbside, and they bring the machine out to you and you vote in your car. You can turn in your ballot by mail there as well also. So I, I don't know why anybody wouldn't just stick it in the post office. But. Well, maybe they're just, they have a fear that their ballot's not going to get there on time. So, like, let's say somebody is on their way out of town, right, and they don't they have to make it to the airport, can't go sit in line to go vote, um, and they prefer just to go hand it to someone, right, because um, they have to run. So, well, okay, to turn it into someone, you would have to go get in line. So you're talking election day. Lines are long. You would have to go get in line, stand in line, go through that process, turn in your form there instead of driving by the mailbox, sticking it in and driving. All mail is picked up every day, so there's no way that their mail wouldn't get picked up that day and then be postmarked that day. Okay. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions for Representative Paul? Let's see. Um, uh, Representative Busey? Yeah, Madam Chair, do we have the Secretary of State testify? Now? I just have some technical questions, but I can wait for them if that's better. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you. There are no further questions. We will proceed to testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'll reserve the right to close. Thank you. Uh, the Chair calls David Carter, uh, representing himself. David Carter, representing myself, uh, just on the bill. I had a question, and I had to step out my dentist call, call and I missed, I missed the opening. So my only question was, is, is this going to prevent a person from hand-delivering the ballot? And I think he was just addressing that when I came back in, so that's all I have to say. Uh, thank you. Uh, the chair calls Andrew Eller, representing himself, who is registered neutral for the bill. Please state your name, who you represent, and your position on the bill. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, committee. Uh, my name is Andrew Eller. I'm representing myself and my position on the bill is neutral at this time. Um, there were some things that came up and I heard Representative Paul uh, actually address a few of those things, but I'm going to speak a little bit about, uh, you know, I've had 25 years of experience as an election judge, so I'm familiar with a lot of uh, what's been talked about here. But uh, just a couple of things that have come up, uh, and this is from being in the trenches on the day of election with what happens with uh, a lot of these early voting mail-in ballots that wind up coming in to the polling location. On occasion, I will have, and it happens just about every election, somebody will come in, or a handful of people, two, three, four, or five that day, and they'll try to deliver their early mail-in ballot to me. I can't accept that, of course, that's against the law. So I will offer them several choices. One is, okay, well, I can cancel that ballot out for you, have you vote a full ballot today. And some of them will choose that, about 50% will choose that. The other choice is I usually tell them, you can go down to the early voting uh, clerk's office, which is in Bell County, that's in Belton. I say, you can go down to Belton, I'll give them the address, I'll give them directions, and you can drop it off in person with your photo ID. And some people will choose that option. And of course, then the other option is, I said, or you can put it in the mailbox. Like Representative Paul said, you can go to the corner mailbox, drop it in, you can hope that it gets postmarked today, you can hope that it gets delivered in time for the statute. But, you know, so that's up to you, and I leave it up to the voter. So that's my only concerns with it, you know, with not being able to drop it off. But 
they do have those options, and, and Representative Paul actually brought that up, and I, I appreciate that. Um, I hadn't thought about the uh, curbside voting. If they're having an issue and they can't come in, they could actually curbside vote. Now, those things, it, so if the bill does go through and we disallow uh, in-person drop-offs of these mail-in ballots, um, that's okay with me as an election judge. It's just a little bit more work to cancel ballots if they bring them in. It's a little bit more work to do curbside voting, but I'm okay with that because I'd like to make sure all of my voters absolutely get the chance to vote, you know, one way or the other, however they do it. Um, but I would like to make one suggestion, Representative Paul. Uh, in uh, section, subsection J, you say uh, may and may not be counted. To me, as I read that, that is, uh, you know, that could be interpreted as, well, I could count it. I don't want to count it, any of those. So I suggest we change that to a, actually 100% prohibitive and say shall not be counted. Uh, that adds a little bit of strength to the language. So uh, with that, uh, I'm just registering my neutral on the bill. So what questions do you have for me? Members, are there any questions for the witness? Chair sees none, thank you. Uh, next, the chair calls um, Alan Vera, uh, representing Harris County Republican Party, uh, who is registered for the bill. Please state your name, who you represent, your position on the bill, please. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Alan Vera, Chairman Harris County Republican Party Ballot Security Committee, testifying in support of HB 1725. Ballot by mail. You know, sometimes, even with the best intentions, we overthink things to the point of placing ourselves in self contradictory positions, and personal delivery of mail ballots may be one of those places. In the beginning, the entire reason for mail ballots was to protect the voting rights of qualified voters who, for reasons of either limited mobility or personal absence from the county, would not be able to vote, would not be able to cast a ballot. It was very simple. Voters over the age of 65 are more likely to have mobility issues, and so they should be able to send a ballot in by mail. Voters with disabilities also much more likely to have mobility issues, and they can send a ballot in by mail. Voters who know they're going to be absent from the county during all the voting time have no reason dropping off a mail ballot on election day because they've just made themselves liars. They are in the county to vote on election day. They just chose to drop off a mail ballot. The election code allows a voter to hand deliver a mail ballot to the early, early voting clerk's office, singular, during voting hours on election day. So a voter who asked for a mail ballot because he was not going to be inside the county uh, has just kind of caught himself in a lie. For TEC, only the voter may hand deliver his own or her own mail ballot. So why are we having the elderly and the disabled drive all the way to a single location to hand deliver their own ballot showing ID when they could have just dropped it in the mail? This bill, I think, is a help to help us untangle this kind of illogical mess we've created. We've kind of converted mail ballots to drive-by balloting and it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense long term. We recommend this bill be favorably reported to the full house. Thank you. Thank you, are there any questions for the witness? Uh, chair recognizes Representative Fierro. Yes sir, it, it's my understanding that people over 65, regardless of reason, can mail in ballot. People over 65, regardless of any other reason, can request a mail ballot, will be sent it and can vote it. Okay, I, no, I, I misunderstood. I thought you said it, you had to be unavailable to mail in a ballot. Three, three primary reasons for mail ballot qualification. One is disabled, right. two is over 65, and three is you won't be in the county while voting is taking okay. place in person. I just heard that when you said it, when you made your statement earlier, I just heard the third one. I'm just old, I mumbled, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. any, more, any other questions for the witness? The chair sees none. Uh, thank you. Thank you. The chair calls uh, Glenn Maxey, uh, representative, representing Texas Democratic Party, who is registered against the bill. Please state your name, who you're representing, your position on the bill. Glenn Maxey, uh, representing the Texas Democratic Party, here in opposition to this bill, um, <clears> to <throat> House Bill 1725. Um, I, I have spent a lot of time um, working phone hotlines with senior voters. There is a considerable number of people who don't trust the U.S. Post Office uh, for good reason. Uh, they give examples of lost mail. There are lots of people uh, who have, uh, especially rural voters, who have uh, 
uh, difficulty receiving mail at rural mailboxes uh, on a street corner. Um, and so they, they would wish to have the option to drop off a ballot. Uh, as Representative Beckley pointed out, uh, the processing of ballots at the end of this, this um, uh, period of time uh, overlaps uh, and getting a ballot returned in time um, is a problem. Um, I like to say that I've talked to a lot of post office officials over the years. Um, we do not now do postmarks the day of. and uh, you, can, you cannot, in almost any situation, mail a ballot on election day and get a postmark on it because all postmark things happened at the end of the day or worked overnight uh, electronically. Uh, they don't do it during the day unless you walk in and get the post office to stamp it in your presence. Dropping in the mailbox is not going to get a post office. Uh, and secondly, uh, the distribution centers of post offices, uh, Representative Busey, if you mail a letter from Taylor, Texas, uh, to the election clerk office in Williamson County, which is just a few miles down the road, that ballot actually comes uh, to Austin. Uh, stays here overnight and then goes back. So there is all, uh, in, in rural Texas, there are places where uh, uh, a ballot would be going perhaps several hundred miles to the Dallas uh, distribution center and back to the same city. Uh, so uh, this is not a, a same day thing. So because of all those reasons, uh, the most secure way to get a, a mail ballot in is to hand deliver it with an ID. If we're concerned about people voting by mail, having them bring a ballot in. In 2020 was the great example of times when there were people who, would, who had fear of getting COVID by going into a crowded polling place to vote. They had no option because of the time frame other than to drop it off at, on election day uh, or under the, the court order or the governor's order. Uh, drop it off um, at, a, at a drop off sense. Uh, so we vehemently oppose this bill. Thank you. Any questions for the witness? Chair recognizes Representative Fierro. Mr. Maxey, do you happen to know what the percentage of first class mail that is delivered by the U.S. Post Office arrives, the data from the first quarter? Um, I, I'm not, I don't know the, the exact percentage. Um, but I do know that first class mail uh, years ago um, we we saw the the postman getting a letter uh, taking it back and immediately a ballot taking it back and because they have ballots in their hands they went and put it in the clerk's mailbox on election day or the day before now it, None of that happens that way. Mail all gets processed electronically overnight uh, and, also, and often at a different post office. In Travis County, everything here does not go from post, local post office directly to the clerk. It all goes to a service center and then back to the clerk uh, at, at a local post office. So I, I just Googled it and um, it's 54.6% uh, of mail was, was delivered on time in the first quarter of last session. 54% of the mail in general on the same time. That's, time. that's the fact. So dropping off a ballot, especially in the last week when you get the ballot within a week of the election, um, this was, was a godsend when we changed this. Any other questions for the witness? Yeah. Madam Chair, uh, can you elaborate a little more? I know you deal with these cases. So not only does it have to be postmarked, it also has to be received by the next day, right? So wouldn't this be a big part of the concern about well, why a voter may change their mind to drive in and want to use their ID? And exactly. Um, you know, just accepting the, the mail ballots. Uh, two sessions ago, or in 2016, uh, the, in Harris County, uh, just on showing the problems with the post office, in Harris County, uh, the, the law has always been that the clerk has to go to their post office box and get all ballots at 7 p.m. that are placed in the mailbox. Uh, so uh, the story that I was told was that the clerk's office went there, got all their ballots. The next morning at 8 a.m. when they regular picked up their mail, 
uh, from the elections division at that Houston post office, there were over 2,000 ballots uh, that were there. Those ballots had all arrived in the U.S. post office because the, of the processing electronically, they just weren't put in to the clerk's office until the next day. That's why last session, or session before last, we changed the law to allow a mail ballot that's postmarked before the election to actually be picked up on Monday just because of the delay of the post office processing. Uh, and so it's the same example here. People who know that they're about to get to that situation, that their ballot might get to the post office on time, but that doesn't mean it's going to be given to the clerk on election day. And so um, having those people be able to take it someplace at the end of this period uh, and uh, not depend on the U.S. Post Office, uh, I wish we could say that we could depend on the U.S. Post Office, but we can't. Well, we, we heard Representative Fierro tell us why. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any other questions for the witness? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, the chair calls uh, Bill Sargent, representing himself, who is registered for the bill. Please state your name, who you represent, and your position. I am Bill Sargent, former Chief Deputy Clerk of, uh, for, of Elections for Galveston County. I am here in support of this legislation. Um, Dennis Paul and Kathy and his office are a class act. They do a good job, and this is a perfect example of one of, one of the reasons I, I say that. This bill does not specifically say that it eliminates the use of drop boxes, but by the language in it, it means that you cannot drop off uh, ballots to a, to a drop box that is not manned. Um, but coming from a countywide vote center, county, I can tell you that there's absolutely no reason why a person would want to go to the, to, the, to the county clerk's office, go up to the third floor of our building, have to get out of the car, go up and do that, show their ID, and surrender their ballot at that point to get it counted as a ballot by mail, which then has to go to the early voting ballot board, has to be accepted, and for county has to go to the central county to be counted. It's much easier in a, in a countywide vote center county, of which there are 40, 50, I don't know exactly how many we have nowadays, but go to the local polling place next to you. Or if that one's busy, go to the one down the street and turn your ballot in and have it be, be, be it canceled and vote in person. Real simple. No need to be able to, to, to take it and, and, and go to the county clerk's office, especially if you live in League City, 30 miles away from Galveston, you gotta drive down to Galveston to, to, to surrender that ballot. Doesn't make any sense. This, this, this legislation, uh, somebody says, you know, take it to your local, doesn't say this, but take it to your local polling place and get it done. I, I strongly support this bill and encourage you to go ahead and get it uh, enacted and send it to the floor. And for the record, sir, uh, are you here representing yourself? I'm representing myself, and that's all. Okay, thank you. Any I'm questions sorry. for the witness? Chair recognizes Michelle, uh, Representative Beck. <laughs> Thank you, Chairwoman. Um, so, like, not all counties can be vote centers right now. So, you know, it is a little bit difficult. Like, Den I'm in Denton County, and we can't have vote centers right now. So we're trying to work on that. But so it's, you know, 50, that's only a third of the counties. So other counties would probably like to have drop boxes. Well, my response would be, there's nothing that would preclude you from having a vote center county, but... Um, yeah, even, there is. But, Actually, but, there is a lot. But even so, you, if you're in a precinct-specific kind of a, of a situation, your precinct is closer than driving 30 miles down the road to, to, to deliver your ballot. That, that's simple. Any other questions for the witness? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, the chair calls uh, Kimberly Young. Uh, representing herself, who is registered. You're going you're to pass. Okay. Uh, next, the chair recognizes uh, Christina Atkins, uh, representing uh, the Secretary of State, who is registered neutral on the bill. Good afternoon or morning, I think still. Uh, my name is Christina Adkins. I'm with the Secretary of State's office testifying on HB 1725. Uh, Representative Busey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it is afternoon, 12.04, so you, you've okay. made it. 
can you talk about the process? We're hearing a lot about drop boxes. Can you talk about drop boxes in Texas and what that is? Um, sure. So the only drop boxes that are authorized per se are those that are that are run by the U.S. Postal Service. Um, you know, I think what, when we mailbox. hear the term yes, when we hear the term post or drop boxes, we're talking about mailboxes mm -hmm. where people can drop them in a box and then those boxes are picked up by the post office and then you know mail delivered to its. Because we don't have drop boxes like we see in some other states where you can go just drop your ballot. Correct. That's correct. We do not have a drop box um, option in Texas like that. Can you talk about? Um, the current system and how it works as far as if I have a ballot by mail, I want to come turn it in in person if, because I, for whatever reason, I've decided not to put it in the post office, but I want to bring it. Can you talk about that process? Yes, sir. So if somebody wants to hand deliver their mail ballot, um, right now at the laws written says that they must do so at the early voting clerk's office. It has to be the voter themselves that's hand delivering that that ballot, and the voter also has to show ID. Um, so they have to show one of the acceptable forms of ID, or if they do not have an acceptable form of ID, they can do the reasonable impediment declaration process. Um, our office has also prescribed some forms to assist in this process. We have a hand delivery roster that the voter is asked to complete um, so that they're signing, showing that they've dropped off the, the ballot themselves. Um, in, in addition to that, the election worker also um, notates the date and time of delivery, note dates who receives that ballot, and um, we, we actually redesigned the, the, the roster prior to the last election because we anticipated an increase in hand delivery. And so we provided some instructions for the worker as to what they need to do with that ballot about notating information on the ballot itself with respect to date and time of delivery and, and how to handle and process those. It sounds really secure, lots of checkpoints along the way to do it that way. We tried to provide a lot of process um, you know, on our end and I think that the law itself also provides you know, a good level of, of security with requiring that the voter provide some ID. Sure. Can you talk about um, postmark by election day, when it has to be received, what the current rules and guidelines are? Sure. Um, generally, for our ballot by mail voters, and, I, and I'm not talking about military and overseas, sure. because they, they fall into a different category, but all of our other mil, um, ballot by mail voters, um, their ballots have to be postmarked by election day, and they must be received no later than 5 p.m. the next business day. Okay. So if the election day is on a Tuesday, then the next Wednesday by 5? Yes, sir. Or Saturday elections, Monday, Monday by 5? Correct. Yes, sir. And so some of the testimony talked about the concern about a ballot. If you drop it off on election day, there's a risk that it will not be received by the next business day, correct? Yes, sir. That's correct. So that's why we have this provision where you can come and bring it in person. Um, I, I believe that was the intent when the, when the bill or when the legislation was initially passed um, several sessions ago. Sure. Um, and we've worked with the post office, you know, quite a bit over the last year in anticipation of, um, you know, higher mail ballot volume during the 2020 election cycle. And, um, you know, they have communicated with us, you know, about their delivery standards. And I know that for typical first class delivery within, you know, the same post office region, it's, it's one to three business days and it's not guaranteed. I think it could be more than that, you know, outside of the region. Let me ask one more question. So I, if I'm over 65 or whatever reason eligible to vote by mail, and I decide I'm gonna drop it in the mailbox on election day, and it gets postmarked on election day, and let's say it's the Tuesday presidential election, but it doesn't get there until Thursday. What happens to my ballot? Uh, that ballot would not be counted. It would not be authorized to be counted because it was not timely delivered. So I drop it off on time, it's postmarked on election day, clearly I did it before you know election day was over, my vote would be thrown out, is what you're saying, if okay. it re received after 5 p.m. the next business. If it was received late, it would be treated as untimely and it would not be counted. I would hope we wouldn't want to do anything to throw people's votes out. Thank you. Any other questions for the witness? Representative Beckley. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman. Um, do we know the uh, racial breakdown of who the people are who are dropping off and hand delivering? No, ma'am, I don't, I don't have that information. Those aren't things that we track in our office. So you would have to check been, on a county by county basis. So there's not been any studies done on this? To my knowledge, no. Okay, no, ma'am. Any other questions for the witness? Thank you, Ms. Atkins. Thank you. Uh, next, the chair calls uh, Robert Green, uh, representing the Travis County Republican Party. Uh, who is, you're gonna pass it? Uh, next, the chair recognizes Emily Ebby. Uh, registered, who is registered uh, against the bill. Please state your name, who you represent, and your position. Hi, I'm 
Emily Eby. Uh, I am representing the Texas Civil Rights Project, and I am uh, here to testify against this bill because it harms Texas voters. Uh, I have seen in-person drop-off work for voters. I have heard plenty of reasons to use it from the voters themselves. Uh, I, I, TCRP participates in the Nonpartisan Election Protection Coalition, and we operate a hotline for Texas voters. Last fall, the coalition received 382 calls from voters who had sent in a timely ballot application, uh, but had still not received their absentee ballot after a significant amount of time. It was the number one issue we saw with absentee ballots. One in four people who called about absentee ballots were saying, where's my ballot? I requested it and I haven't received it. Um, ballots are often slow in getting to voters because of backlogs in county election offices or because of delays in the post office, as we've talked about. Uh, In-person drop-off of mail ballots is a crucial backstop for those those voters who receive their ballots a day or two before the election and can't rely on the post office to deliver their marked ballot back to the county in time. It is not the same as dropping it in a mailbox. Uh, the only way they can ensure that it gets there on time is to deliver it themselves. This bill would all but ensure that absentee voters can do everything right and still not get counted, punishing the voters for failures of governmental agencies. Uh, the in-person drop-off process is secure, as we've talked about. It requires signatures uh, and ID to be shown, so fraud is extremely unlikely to arise. And this bill does not distribute harm to all Texas voters evenly. The two groups who are most likely to drop off mail ballots are the elderly and people with disabilities, and HB 1725 targets those two groups specifically. Uh, for those reasons, we encourage the committee not to approve the bill as currently drafted. Thank you. Can you please uh, clarify, just for the record, uh, yeah. who you're representing? Texas Civil Rights Project. And yourself as well? And myself, yeah. Thank you. Any? Are there any questions for the witness? Okay. Representative Fierro? Yes. Would you mind identifying any security issues that you all came across on people dropping off uh, mail ballots? Uh, I could get that information for you. I don't recall seeing any security, and I've gone through all of our mail-in ballot, all 1,400 of our mail-in ballot calls. I don't recall seeing any uh, security. If you come across some, would you share with the clerk so she can disseminate to us? Absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions for the witness? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next, the chair calls Joshua Houston, uh, who is registered against the bill, representing... Texas Impact. Please say your name, who you represent, and your position on the bill. Good afternoon. My name is Joshua Houston. I am the advocacy director for Texas Impact. Uh, we are opposed to House Bill 1725. Uh, the current law this bill proposes to eliminate provides an important failsafe. Uh, Texas Impact is a membership organization for the mainline Protestant, Jewish, and Muslim denominations in this state. And as you might expect with a church, we have many members that are 65 or older that are eligible to vote by mail. So being in a vulnerable age group, many of them exercised that option for the first time this last election cycle. During the primary and general elections, we fielded countless questions from our membership troubleshooting their mail-in ballots. Uh, the most common were, uh, my mail-in ballot hasn't arrived yet, what are my options? And how do I make sure that it counts? Uh, after the primary, uh, during the summer, but before the general election, we made an open records request of the 30 largest counties requesting data necessary to calculate the rejection rates for the last three election cycles dating back to the primaries of 2016. The overall rejection rate of mail-in ballots uh, for those 30 largest counties is 1.6%. Uh, the overwhelming majority of those rejected ballots were rejected because they arrived after the ballot receipt deadline, so the mail got it there late. So for example, in Bear County, 86% of all rejected ballots arrived late in the mail. Harris County was 85% of all rejected ballots, and Fort Bend County was 68% uh, of all rejected ballots uh, just arrived late in the mail. That was before the general election in November. House Bill 1725 would increase those rejection rates. In a normal election, snafus happen. So before the pandemic, the U.S. Postal Service recommended at least a week to ensure receipt, uh, to ensure delivery of the mail-in ballot by the ballot receipt deadline. And in July of 2020, they wrote a letter to Texas informing Texas that our legal deadlines were not congruent with their delivery schedule. These are all issues that happen with the mail in a normal election. At the county level, snafus happen too. Sometimes counties get behind on processing forms. Sometimes ballot corrections are necessary. And of course, voters mess up. Uh, the bottom line is if your ballot arrives late, late being less than a week, according to the Postal Service, dropping it in the mail risk it not counting. Uh, 
if you want clear categories, then one of the things we could do is just change the ballot receipt deadline if we're going to have to drop it in the mailbox. House Bill 1725 would take away a longstanding option voters have had to protect their franchise if something goes wrong. We understand there are other options. We certainly informed our membership of their options. Uh, you can surrender a ballot. Uh, obviously, you have to walk in to do so. Curbside is an option that not all voters are aware of. And of course, both of these options increase the work for election judges at the polling locations on election day. And of course, often polling locations have very long lines. Long lines disfranchise the working pe people who have jobs and children and childcare. Therefore, hand delivery was what we were advising our membership to do to have an efficient administration of the election. House Bill 1725 would make it harder on voters and polling locations by removing an otherwise valid and secure option. You have to have your photo ID. It is not necessary and a solution in search of a problem. Thank you for your time this afternoon. Thank you. Any, are there any questions for the witness? Representative Beckley? Just one thing, can you clarify? I think you said um, the post office had sent notification to the, was it the Secretary of State? that the, the, our dates aren't in line with their dates? Yes, it was a July letter, um, and I'm trying to find it. I have a copy of it. I missed, maybe I should have made the whole copy for the committee. The July 30th letter uh, was sent to the Secretary of State's office. Is uh, that 2020? That is in 2020, thank yes. You, thank you. So, Any other questions for the witness? Thank you, Mr. Houston. Uh, next chair calls uh, Susana Carranza, um, representing the League of Women Voters and herself who is registered against the bill. If you could please just uh, state your name, who you represent, and your position on the bill, please. I, my, I am Susanna Carenza, testifying as a member and on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Texas in opposition to House Bill 1725. We appreciate your attention this morning to the League's position in this bill. And I would like to say that I speak for the many League members and others across Texas who are unable to appear before you today because of the pandemic. Thank you for your service, and we wish you and your staff continued good health. The League of Women Voters of Texas opposes House Bill 1725. During the 2020 election, we heard from many anxious voters who wanted to make sure their ballots would be counted. Some had received ballots by mail and feared their voted ballot would not reach the county offices in time to be counted. They mostly feared the postal service would be unable to return them. The additional option for hand delivering their ballots to their election officials was a great relief for the voters. Whatever the future circumstances are, be it a similar or continued health pandemic, a postal strike or slowdown or extreme weather, weather, the voters desire and want to have the option to convenient and deliver their, their ballot, uh, their vote by mail ballot. House Bill 1725 would deny voters that option without basis. Thank you for your consideration. And, as, and for the record, you're here representing the League of Women Voters and yourself? Yes. Thank you. Any questions for the witness? Thank you. Uh, next, the chair calls uh, Lon Herman, uh, rep who is registered against the bill, representing public citizen and himself. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. My name is Lon and members. I'm my, my main. <laughs> My name is Lon Burnham, and I'm representing both Public Citizen and myself. We are against this bill. Um, in answer to your very important question, Madam Chair, who would drop off rather than mail? I have dozens, not decades, but years of experience dealing with bulk mail. I mean, uh, bulk by mail. The people that would drop it off are the people that find the postage expensive, and it's easier for them. And you've asked a lot of good questions, Representative Beckley, about who does this disproportionately impact. I represented a district for 18 years that was majority minority, and I will tell you that this bill, like so many others you're going to see this session, disproportionately negatively impacts people of color, low-income people. 
Uh, I think you asked a really good question. I want to tell you the curbside voting is problematic. Uh, you've addressed some of these concerns, but I have been assisting people trying to do curbside voting that have waited for over 30 minutes. It is totally unreasonable to ask somebody to have to wait in the car for 10 or 15 minutes. And it's also totally unreasonable to impose this on the election workers when they're understaffed. It is a problem that this helps address. Frankly, snafus do happen and nothing is perfect. And I think it's a little ironic that people don't like the idea of you having to show your uh, ID if you're gonna vote by mail. Uh, one of the best innovations I saw in Tarrant County this year is I have started voting by mail ever since I was eligible. I, we all know how crazy 2020 was. I developed a deep distrust of the post office. So I decided I wanted to take my by mail ballot to the one place I could in Tarrant County. It was extraordinarily convenient. I drove up, I showed my driver's license, I handed my envelope that I'd already voted at home so I didn't have any pressure of time constraints or whatever. And the line to drive through to vote at the Tarrant County Elections Office was never no, any more than 12 people or cars deep because it's so efficient. I think the efficient, smart, if we're really about encouraging people voting, which sometimes I think some of these bills are not, if we're really about encouraging people and making it easy as possible for people to vote, we should have drive-by voting. If you want to mandate that they're staffed, that's fine with me. But there should be more than just one. The one in Tarrant County was real convenient for me. But Ms. Beckley is very familiar with traffic issues in her county. There should be four or five in your county so you can do the drive-by voting, so you can avoid a lot of the snafus that happen. I want to make it clear that while I'm testifying for myself and giving my own example, my wife has an example. There are snafus in the election process. She took her ballot to early voting, and it took her almost 30 minutes to get it across to the election workers that she was trying to turn this ballot in and vote in person. In July, she was afraid to go out in public. She requested vote by mail for the first time. By the time we get to November, she thinks she can run in and run out and vote. But none of the election workers are adequately trained. They're all overworked, and they don't have enough time. So let's make it as easy as possible for everybody and not preclude drive-by, drop-in your ballot to vote by mail. Thank you for your time, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair. Mr. Burnham, real quick, uh, Public Citizen is an organization? Uh, yes, Public Citizen has been in Texas for over 30 years, and our office is on 11th, uh, just a half block. It's in the 300 block of, of East 11th. Thank you, Mr. Burnham. Members, any other questions? Thank you. Thank you for your time. The chair now calls Renee Perez. Ms. Perez, I see that you're here on behalf of the Tarrant County Libertarian Party and yourself to testify against House Bill 1725. Could you just please go ahead, though, restate your name, uh, who you represent, your position on the bill. My name is Otilio Rene Perez, Jr., and I am the coalition director for uh, the Tarrant County Libertarian Party. I was privileged, I have been privileged, the past three cycles to participate on the ballot county ballot board. I think if you check the records, that's a very uncommon scenario mm -hmm. since most ballot boards are occupied entirely by libertarian, by uh, Democrat and Republican. Ms. Perez, okay. real quick, you're here. What is your position on the bill? I am against. Okay, thank you. And, well, so, uh, I, could I have a moment? I'd like a moment to speak as to why I'm against it. Oh no, the, yeah, I just need to need that for certain procedural oh. rules reasons. Oh. You, oh. this is why you're here, though, and go for it. Tell us all about it. Yes. So the, I, I wanted to make sure that it was known how the process actually works because I actually have worked in the ballot board. I've been there when the mail in ballots have come in. We touch them. We look them over. There is a database, which with which. The mail-in ballots are sent out and compared to when they come back, such that to prevent the possibility of someone perhaps maybe trying to, to turn in two by accident or 
potentially on purpose. But we have had that situation. I've been there in the room while the county judge, the, the election judge, has looked up the data, uh, looked up on the database to to see if a mail-in ballot perhaps was double booked. For, mm. for example, is that and, is that a concern with this bill? Well, that's that's exactly why I'm bringing that up because the because of that process, this bill is not necessary uh, because it appears that the the bill appears to attempt to prevent potential fraud by dropping off multiple mail-in ballots uh, because that possibility does exist that uh, multiple ones can be sent out um, but on the receiving end they were they are checked against uh, a database so I wanted to make sure that that specific fact was known by the members of the committee okay members any other questions thank you mr. Perez thank you very much members of the committee is there anyone else who wishes to testify on for or against House Bill 1725? Hearing none, the chair recognizes Representative Paul to close on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate y'all's consideration on this. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of uh, felt issues one way or the other on this bill, but I want to make sure that we are making sure that all the counties are following the, what we have at state law. We're not creating new state law, we're just wanting to make sure that what we've always had is going to be processed and make sure it works and uh, make sure that we have a clear way of vision of you vote by mail, you do it by mail. If you do it by person, you do it by in-person. Anybody that has a reason to, to drop off their mail uh, uh, to do it, they can vote. They can receive their, uh, turn in their ballot and do it by mail. Uh, as was stated also, uh, these can be received the day after election day, so hopelessly most of those are coming into play. So that would love to have y'all support. Mr. Hall, members, any questions for Representative Paul? Vice Chair Gonzalez? So, what, what's your particular concern in why in here? I mean, what's, the, what's your concern regarding um, not being able to just hand deliver it to someone, an, an elections official? Because what happened uh, in Harris County before they had created all of these drop-off boxes we could do where there was no law that says you could do it. So I wanted to be clear that that's not going to be taking place, that we are following the law that was already currently been set up. So to clearly, because like I said in the opening statement, people are starting to say, hey, uh, they never said I couldn't do this, let me do it. The way it's always been before is, unless the law allowed me to do it, I wouldn't do it. And so that changes there. So I'm going to make sure and keep this the way it's always been to make sure that those are secured. Because I do think that people could just be taken uh, ballots, creating them, throwing them in a box, and nobody's ever checking it. Nobody's even seen if this is a real person or what to do it. So I think it's just rampant for fraud. But I mean, if somebody's showing an ID and they're taking their ballot, I mean, how's that? How's there room for fraud there, uh, or somebody? Or it's it's online. I'm trying to make sure that we don't have a situation where it could be rampant for fraud. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think it. Um, the problem gotcha. was that the mail ballots aren't getting there in time. Even if they're postmarked, they don't necessarily, they have to be there the next day. I, I, I don't get mail the next day. You know, so, I mean, I think that's an, would you consider amending to extend that deadline? Because I think that would, I mean, the mail's not getting there. If you have a postmark day, if you're not, or extend it or, or make it postmarked that day. Well, I think it would be day. good that they, they said that you had to have your mail and drop your mail in ballots before election day. That would solve that problem. So you're going to increase, so the postmark needs to be sooner than election day for mail in ballot? That would be a solution. I'm, d I'm just trying to get know. a different solution. Because I think the problem is that if it if you mail it where you, you put the date where it's mailed, that they, it doesn't receive the next day where a lot of people think that if it's postmarked that day that, that it's good but if it if it's not there by five o'clock the next day and I can tell you in where I live you're not getting your mail the next day I can mail a bit from my house to my store which is a mile away and it doesn't get there the next day okay so I mean it just the mail has slowed slowed way down so is there a way would you consider amending to accommodate that no, we, we can discuss it. Okay. I haven't thought about it. 
Any members, any other questions for Representative Paul? All right, with that, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, appreciate your careful consideration. Thank you, Representative Paul. If there is no objection, the bill will be left pending. Is there objection? The chair hears none. The bill is left pending. The chair lays out as pending business House Bill 1397 and recognizes Representative White to explain the bill. Hey, thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and, and Vice Chair. Good to see you again. Um, House Bill 1397, uh, I would consider this a uh, election integrity or and, and transparency bill. Um, and it's, I guess this is one of the biggest issues of this session, um, at least uh, identified by uh, Governor Greg Abbott. 1397 promotes transparency in regards to the voting systems that are approved to be used in Texas by the Secretary of State. The legislation will do this by requiring that there be a disclosure of any person or company that has more than 5% ownership interest in, in the voting systems, vendor, vendor's parent company, or any subsidiaries or affiliates of the vendor. Uh, these companies who provide us with voting systems are not only accountable to the stakeholders, but also to the citizens of Texas. So uh, that's just it, plain and simple. Um, I reserve the right to close if I need to close. Well, if all these people are testimony, testifying behind me. Yes. <laughs> Members, any questions for Representative White? Yes. Uh, Representative Beckley? Um, really like your jacket. Oh, okay. How about the legislation? Yeah, I know. I think your jacket goes really well with your legislation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. All right. Need a one on the legislation. Okay. Excellent. The chair calls Marsha Strickler. Ms. Strickler, if you could please uh, state your name, uh, who you represent, and your position on the bill. I am Marcia Strickler. I represent myself. I also represent Wilco, We the People. Okay. Again, by the way, I've got you uh, registered twice, but we'll, we'll, we'll fix that. Yes, sir. I hope I didn't vote twice. I and don't think I did. Yeah, I understand. Your, uh, and your position on the bill? I am for this bill, sir. ESNS is the hardware software uh, company vendor in my county. Dominion was in the mainstream news quite a bit during this country's and this state's attempts to prove out the various election anomalies and international interference in our elections this year. There was much speculation that ESNS from Nebraska was tied to uh, or interest owned by some of the people in the Dominion uh, in umbrella. It was very difficult to determine the connections and the international connections to the equipment, software and hardware. I do believe that this bill will make that ownership interest transparent and I hope that this bill also includes the e-poll books that are introduced now in our county and also uh, in Travis County, Bear County, a lot of counties. Yes, sir, that's it. Any questions? Okay. Awesome. Members, any questions for this witness? And by the way, on 1622, I did submit. Whoa, 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 please. Okay. Well, it, you, were, you take that back, right? We weren't talking about 1622. Okay, we're here to only talk about House Bill 1397. All right. Thank you, ma'am. All right. The chair now calls Kimberly Young. Shown you to testify. Oh, thank you, ma'am. The clerk let the record reflect that Representative Jaton is present. The chair now calls Robert Green. Mr. Green, I show you as being. Travis County Republican Party Election Integrity Committee and yourself testifying for the bill. If you could just go ahead and restate those things as you know there's notes up there. You're correct. My name is Robert Green. 
I am here representing Travis County Republican Party Election Integrity Committee and myself. Uh, strongly in favor of this bill. I have but one recommendation with regard to it, though. I think that this bill should apply to all voting system equipment currently owned at the time of the, this section takes effect and also to any voting system equipment that may be acquired in the future. They have a date on here that says it only applies to equipment after a certain date, and I believe that uh, we, the people, are entitled to know who may have a vested financial interest in the equipment that we are uh, using to, to vote our, to record our votes. If anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thanks, sir. Members, any questions for this witness? Thank you, Mr. Green. Thank you. The chair now calls Bill Sargent. Mr. Sergeant, if you please. Uh, Bill Sargent, chief, former chief deputy clerk of election for Galveston County, in favor of this legislation. And who are you here representing on yourself? Myself. All right, got it. You, you already know, buddy. For old pro. <laughs> um, I, uh, I commend you, James, for, for this legislation. Um, I would go a little bit further than what he's done in his legislation, and this is what I would do. I would add to it a new section B, which reads as follows. All election software, programming, voting, and tabulation equipment purchased and used in the state of Texas shall be, uh, shall have been developed and manufactured in the United States of America. We, we, we do not want to have foreign parties um, involved with making our election equipment if we want to make sure we have a voter integrity. Mm -hmm. That's all I have. Thank you, sir. Members, any questions for Mr. Sargent? Thanks, sir. The chair now calls David Carter. All right, Colonel Carter. I you myself, and I'm, uh, I'm against the bill. And state your name for us. David C. Carter. And I'm against the bill because it uh, only pertains to equipment bought after the date stated in the bill. If the bill, if that was uh, made retroactive, uh, I would be for the bill. I'm for the concept, but I definitely think we need to know uh, who owns the, the machines that we already have bought. Okay. Did I get it all? Thank you, sir. Yes, sir, I believe we've got your name. You're, you're uh, against the bill and representing yourself. Yeah. Thank you, I'm Colonel. For the Paul. concept, but I'm against the right bill. Here, so thank you. Thank you for your service, Colonel. Yes, sir. The chair now calls Dr. Laura Presley. Dr. Laura Presley, please uh, tell us your name, who you're representing, and your position on the bill. Yes, Chair Kane. Uh, Dr. Laura Presley, I represent True Texas Elections. And my position on bills, I support the bill with some modifications. So you support the bill? I do. All right. Okay. Similar to what other people have said, uh, I think the, the language is a bit ambiguous. It says to uh, acquire equipment necessary for operating a voting system. That is very broad. It should either be defined as what uh, voting system is actually defined in the code. And... The poll books are not defined at this point a voting system. So the voting system, needs, this, this language, just I love this bill. It just needs to have a little bit more clarifying language regard to software, um, the poll books, the voting machines, the voting equipment. Also, I think the uh, instead of having it apply to equipment acquired, that's ambiguous also because there's always software upgrades, there's always recertification that would be required, and so I think this could be bolstered just a little bit. Members, any questions for Dr. Presley? Thank okay, you, thank you. The chair now calls Brad Hodges. Mr. Hodges, are you present? Okay. We're going to move on. Uh, members, we do have a resource witness here. Would anybody like to hear from her, especially based on some of these concerns we've had or questions? Anybody? Okay. Is there anyone else here 
Who wishes to testify on, for, or against House Bill 1397? Hearing none. The chair now recognizes Representative White to close on the bill. Thank you very much, members, uh, for burdening your time on this, and um, I close. Hey, members, any questions for Representative White? Hearing none. Thank you, Representative White. If there is no objection, the bill will be left pending. Is there objection? Chair, here's none. The bill is left pending. Record reflect that Representative Schofield is present. The chair lays out House Bill 1264 and recognizes Representative Bell to explain the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Kane, oh, committee oh, members. Real quick. Representative Bell, I see you have a committee substitute. That is correct. The chair lays out the committee substitute. The uh, committee substitute actually uh, changes line, page one, line 14 through 23 uh, to read but no later than the seventh day after the date the abstract is prepared. That's the revision. Uh, House Bill 1264 expedites the process of the removal of deceased Texans from our voter registration rolls, fostering the integrity of our elections. House Bill 1264 would require the local registrar of deaths and the clerk of each court having probate jurisdiction to file an each uh, abstract with the county voter registrar and his secretary of state as soon as possible, but in no later than seven days after the abstract is prepared. Currently, there is a potential to delay the reporting of deaths to voter registrars in the Texas Secretary of State, as the state of Texas election code requires the local registrar of deaths to file each abstract with the voter registrar at, of the decedent's county of residency and the Secretary of State no later than the 10th day of the month following the month in which the abstract is prepared. Therefore, this can take up to 40 days after an individual has passed before it is re actually reported to the voter registrar and the Secretary of State for removal of the deceased from our voter rolls. It is our responsibility to make our elections and see that they are held to the highest standard. House Bill 1264 will see that the the deceased are expeditiously removed from our voter rolls, increasing Texas confidence in our election processes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members, for your consideration of this bill, and I'd be glad to answer any questions at this time. Members, are there any questions for Representative Bell? Representative Beckley? Thank you, Chairman. Um, did you have any statistics or analysis as to why to change what's on? Yes, ma'am. Well, they're doing it now. Sorry. You know, um, well, first of all, 43% of Texans believe our election results are inaccurate, and that's according to the University of Texas and a Texas Tribune poll published in February of this year. Um, you know, also, uh, since 2004, there have been 531 successful prosecuted election fraud offenses by the Texas Office of Attorney General 
And in 2018 alone, there were 97 prosecutor election violations and 363 counts are currently pending prosecution. Um, I asked my own uh, county clerk in my office, and uh, you know, uh, when they do their abstracts, they accumulate these, and then sometime in the following month, they upload those to the Secretary of State mm -hmm. in a batch. And so that's where the timeline of 41 days comes from. It can be up to 41 days and meet the law as it currently exists. So what I'm asking is as they create those abstracts on a daily basis, I would hope in a bigger county that they would then upload those within that, they would have to upload them within that seven day window. Mr. Bell, um, your, the purpose of your bill here is to restore confidence in the people and make sure our roles are, are clean, is that? Yeah, the purpose of the bill, Mr. Chairman, is to make sure if somebody passes away that there's a reasonable amount of time before they're removed uh, from that role. They'll be notified to the Secretary of State. It goes up on a portal, and then the voter registrar is responsible to look at that list that's uploaded on the Secretary of State's portal and then to remove that person from the voters roll. Thank you. I think it's a great bill. Members, any other questions? Yeah. Representative Busey? I just want to say, um, it's not really a question, but initially I had some real concerns about it being one day. I yep. think you think about big counties just trying to comply. I think we all want, you know, accurate and secure roles, but trying to comply, I'm not sure the, you know, 10 days after was an inherent problem, but I want to thank Representative Bell who came to me and worked with me on changing it from one day to seven days. I think finding some, some middle ground helps, and I, I appreciate this committee substitute. Thank you so much sure. for that work. Well, thank you, Representative Boosie. I appreciate your uh, willingness to work together. And, uh, you know, and I think this is a, a bipartisan issue. I mean, I truly don't think we want deceased people on our, on our uh, voter rolls. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, anyway, I appreciate the uh, consideration. Thank you, sir. Reserve your right, right to close. Yes, sir. With that, right. if members, any other questions? questions? Sorry, Representative Beckley. So I'm just I'm going to clarify my question. Yes, I think I wasn't very clear in asking okay. of my question. So currently, can you explain the current situation of what what the statute says now? So what are the counties doing now? Yeah. So the counties today will accumulate their abstracts, and those abstracts are, are uploaded to the Secretary of State's website. So they're doing that, even in my own county, the following month, which is what the law requires, but all at one time. So right now, potentially, from the time somebody's notified to the, the registrar desk, which in a smaller county could only be the county clerk. I mean, they may not actually have somebody hired to do this specifically, but it could possibly be up to 41 days if you meet the law in its current form. What my bill asks is, is it, whenever the registrar of death creates that abstract or the clerk of the court of where they've done a probate for a will, for instance, at that point in time, seven days from when they finish that document, they'll upload this. And talking to the Secretary of State, some counties do it as a batch, and some of them do it individually. And so, you know, so I, I don't think we're going to change really their process other than we're going to link, shorten the time somebody passes away to a voter registrar would know from that portal that this person has died and therefore they need to be purged from our voter records. Mm -hmm. so, so the larger counties, so if they wanted to say, let's just, I'm going to say, they want to do it every Monday, will yeah. your bill allow that to happen? Like Absolutely. they just want to do the job. From Correct. Monday from 10 to 12, this is when we're going to do that. I don't know how long it takes. but Yes, ma'am. Okay. It's seven calendar days. So if they're doing it every Monday <laughs> and then they want to load that whole batch yep. from Monday, they can do it the following Thank Monday. You. Yes, ma'am. Good question. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Bell. Yes. We're gonna, if there's no other questions, we're going to go ahead and proceed to taking Thank testimony. You. The chair calls Christina Atkins, legal director of the Texas Secretary of State. Showing testifying on the bill. Director Adkins, you know the three pieces of information we need. Yes, my name is Christina Adkins with the Texas Secretary of State testifying on HB 1264. Members, any questions? 
there were some technical ones uh, I thought you might be able to help better with, but you know, I've got a question. This, this timing of, of notifying your agency of abstracts of deaths, what, right now, what, is, what, what happens? What are, what are the ranges of things? From when things get reported to us, yes. um, I think that's probably going to vary depending on the, you know, when we get that information mm -hmm. locally from the different local. Closest and furthest out, do you have an, an idea? Is it ever longer than a week? You know, I, I actually don't know the answer to that. I, I don't know if it, if it takes longer than that, but that's something I can Do you think Mr. Out. Ingram may know? He's not, he's not registered though right now, but okay. Um, is it possible it's more than seven days? It's possible, yes. Okay. yes. So are you tell me, so you all have a statewide registration list. Mm -hmm. And so is that list accurate today of who's alive and, and qualified to vote? Well, it's as, it's as accurate as it can be, you know, mm -hmm. provided that, that you know, the, the local voter registrars are doing the work that they need to do with the things yeah. that have been given to them. So. Mm -hmm. How often do they send you up their list of new registered voters? Well, all, all list of registered voters essentially come from the statewide system. And so they, when they have an election, they're generate, genu generating it excuse me, from our list. Some of our counties maintain local databases on their own, but they're supposed to be syncing with our system on a daily basis. Are all of them not syncing with your system on a daily basis? I think by and large most of them are. Uh, I think that there are times occasionally where there might be some technical issues or there might be, you know, some syncing problems or getting the counties to sync. Um, you know, maybe they've, after they've made big changes, they might need to sync a little bit more regularly, but um, I don't have any reason to believe that the list today in, in our system is not accurate. So do they have to choose to, to sync and update the list so that right at this very moment, the, the, the Secretary of State's list shows all qualified people? No, I think it's an automated process for most of these counties. If they're, if they're what we call an offline county, it's an automated, automatic syncing process. Um, so, I'm, I mean, if you want a list of registered voters for a particular county today, that list can be generated, and, and I don't have any reason to believe at this point that it wouldn't be accurate. Mm -hmm. yeah. What is the, I mean, do you all have an, an opinion of the difference in this one day, seven days, five days? There... Um, no, it, I mean, it doesn't really impact you know, us on our end, it's more of an impact, you know, to the to the local individuals mm -hmm. that are inputting that information. Our, our process, once we get that information, it's pushed out to our counties, and so it's, I mean, it's an automated process on that mm -hmm. side. So it, it wouldn't really impact us, it's more of an impact locally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So depending on the timeline of them submitting it to you guys, and, and you, had, you had told me, in your opinion, you believe the list is accurate right now, but maybe it's not. Maybe someone passed away five days ago and they haven't told the Secretary of State's office. That's correct. Okay, so the Secretary of State's office does not have a 100% as best as we could today to have an accurate list of all qualified voters in the state of Texas. I would say that it's as accurate as the information we're given. Of course. So if there's information yeah. that we so don't have, then... It could be better. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Just really wanted to wanted to find where that is. We need, we need to know there's a problem. Sometimes testify there's there's no issues, but we need to be told that, that it could be better. Sure. So, all right. Thank you, ma'am. Members, any other questions? I this witness. Thank you. Oh, oh, go ahead, okay, Rosin Fierro. Thank you, thank you. Um, along with uh, the line that our chairman, um, who's, who's unhappy with the system at the moment, um, is it, would it, would the smaller municipalities be able to comply with, with the same as the larger municipalities well, on the timeline that, that's being proposed right now? I mean, as, as far as the, the workload on the local entities or, your, you know, the local registrars, who, who are inputting that information, um, you know, that's, that's, I can't really answer that question for you. I just know that when we get the information, um, it's pushed out back right. to our counties for I working immediately. That process. Your, your, mm -hmm. your information is updated as rapidly as we get it to you. Correct. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Bob Green. Robert Green. Robert Green. <laughs> and I'm representing the Travis County Republican Party Election Integrity Committee. Uh, I believe that, uh, and I'm, I'm testifying in favor of the bill, now the committee substitute for the bill. Um, also testifying on? on my on, For myself. Okay, thank you. Um, I believe that anything that we can do to more quickly 
clean up our voter rolls um, of the deceased, the move aways, anybody that might not be qualified to, to vote is a good thing. Uh, and we want to minimize the opportunity for someone to vote in the name of someone who may have deceased recently if they happen to be deceased shortly before the election. Um, that's really all I had. My comment on the on the bill. I think I think it's a good bill. I think anything we like I say anything we can do to clean up our rolls and keep them clean at the time that the election occurs is is a good deal. Any questions? Members, any questions for this witness? None. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The chair now calls Kimberly Young. Thank you, ma'am. The chair now calls Alan Vera. Awesome. Let's try one more time. The chair now calls Bill Sargent. Really neat. Thank you. We do need to do something. Real quick, let the record reflect that Representative Swanson is present. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify on, for, or against House Bill 1264? If not, the chair... I, I don't have you on the list right now, Mrs. Hawthorne. That that would, that's why, ma'am. Okay. We proceed. All right, hearing none. The chair recognizes Representative Bell to close on the bill. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman and members. Uh, you know, as uh, unfortunately. As you heard, the Secretary of State cannot sink their voters list until the abstract is filed from the local registrar uh, to the desk, uh, about the desk that's reported to them. So House Bill 1264 would ensure this would occur in a more timely manner, as uh, Representative Be Beckley's example, seven days. And so uh, certainly we that would be uh, shorter than 41. So. Uh, thanks again for uh, your uh, uh, your attention and ability to lay this out to this committee today, and I would appreciate uh, your favorable consideration in that close. Thank you. And Mr. Bell, members, any other questions from Mr. Bell? All right. Well, Mr. Bell, I'm not sure if I think one seven is better than one or, or where the right number is, but I understand this is uh, sometimes about getting to a middle ground and getting people to agree on stuff. So Absolutely. And I, once again, I will just say I appreciate the uh, bipartisan support I've had over this issue and just seek to make sure we maintain the integrity of our roles. Thank you. Again. Thank you, Representative Bell. If there is no objection, the chair withdraws the committee substitute and the bill will be left pending. Is there objection? The chair hears none and the bill is left pending. The chair lays out House Resolution 237 and recognizes Representative Rogers to explain the resolution. Now, Representative Rogers, how many bills have you laid out? This will be number four. Okay. Wow. You're doing a lot better than I did in my freshman session. Okay. Well, I think Mr. Rogers you may proceed. Well, thank you, Chairman Kane and members. Thank you for the opportunity to lay out House Resolution. 237. As American citizens, we're guaranteed certain unalienable rights on, and one is the right to vote. This right is precious because not every country will allow its citizens the freedom to choose their leadership. In the fat, past few election cycles, there's been substantial concern with the security of our elections and where voter data is processed and stored. This is particularly an important issue for my district as we've received numerous calls, letters, and emails expressing deep distress on the safekeeping of their votes. The integrity of all votes, especially the ballots cast in the great state of Texas, should be of vital importance. Presently, every state has a different protocol with how their data is stored and processed. According to the Elections Assistance Commission, they do not keep record of how each state stores and processes their data. In Texas, the Office of the Secretary of State State shared that the Texas election data is stored and processed within the United States, and voter registration data is stored in the Amazon cloud in California. 
H.R. 237 would express support for processing and storing data relating to local, state, and national elections within the United States. Thank you for your time, and I reserve the right to close, and I'd entertain any questions. Thank you. Members, any questions? All right, you're, you're lucky. The chair, <laughs> will you reside for right to close? You're good. Well, we're going to hear some testimony now. The chair now calls Marsha Strickler. <coughs> Marsha Strickler, Williamson County, we the people, and myself, and I am for this bill. Good question. So when yes. you registered, you, you wrote Wilco. I'm, I'm assuming, of course, that's Williamson County. It is, yes, sir. Okay, so Wilco, we the people, and yourself, and you're testifying. For this bill. Thank you, ma'am. I agree with this, Mr. Rogers, and with House Resolution 237, we do have unalienable rights to a free and fair election, to the right to vote, and the right to have a secure election. I do believe that counties are, should be required by law to keep this data for the 22 months that the election code already refers to. I, I do believe that we need stronger laws, uh, uh, making sure that that is happening throughout our state. And I do believe that I personally have witnessed things that do not apply to uh, our current election code and how they are going, how it should be stored, how our ballots should be stored. I witnessed uh, ballots stored in various uh, situations, sometimes in cardboard boxes and a closet temporary box because we're under a construction in our current election office. I also witnessed a lot of equipment stored in temporary locations off site from normal procedures. So I do believe that this bill is necessary and it should be uh, accepted and adhered to and should have some oversight as well. Any questions? Yes, Ms. Strickler, you said you saw, what did you see being stored in paper boxes? Well, our county had an actual situation where, um, where on the day before election, precinct level data. The data was peaked at by our election administrator and we didn't have precinct level data referenced in the, in the, uh, in the, in the data. And so there was a project that went on uh, to, from a, a judge's order to do a manual recount and a manual rescan of our ballots. And so when the judge ordered that it it triggered an anomaly of uh, exercise to, uh, for that process to take place and to reopen central count. And uh, it, was, it was a chaotic uh, experience for me. I had two different capacities in that experience as an employee of the election department, uh, participating in the actual manual sorting of I'm the ballots. To, Mr. Gunn, I'm trying to understand that we can go to where, where the, the ballots the ballots came to that press process in cardboard boxes so they were removed from a vehicle or something if they were in a cardboard box when they were brought to you uh when i saw them myself i didn't start at the beginning of this procedure i watched them arrive in cardboard boxes arrive from where uh a closet in a election department. I did not see them removed from the blue ballot box that was sealed. I, was not particip I wasn't participating at that time, so I did not witness that. Okay, so it's what I did witness that, that some things aren't secure. Yes, sir. I did not see a chain of command of ballots during that procedure as an employee, and I did not see a chain of, uh, of, of ballots, uh, custody of ballots as a poll watcher on the back end of that during this rescan project, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Members, any other questions for this witness? Thank you. I'm trying to alternate positions here. Um, the chair now calls David Carter. Governor Carter, if you could state your name, whom you represent, and your position on the bill. 
David Carter, self, am uh, against the bill. I think it's way over broad uh, to, to just make sure things are done here in the, in the country uh, and stored in the country. In Bell County, I want my ballot stored in the warehouses in Bell County and no place else. And the data, go, I, I hand carried my flash drive as the election judge. I did not give it to the clerks that took all our election materials. I hand carried it, handed it to the election administrator and watched him put it into the tabulator machine. And uh, so I knew that nobody had had a chance to mess with my uh, data from my precinct. And uh, that data should never go any place other than out of the county, the, the office that administers the election. It's a county administered election, and that's where the data should stay. This is, I am absolutely shocked of all these reports of stuff going uh, you know, uh, to uh, other uh, Dominion and other servers. They, the only thing that should go outside of the county is the vote totals for the candidates for, tab for ta accumulation at the state level and for given to the news media. And I, I can't say anything more clear than that they should be in the county only, period. Great. Thank you. Colonel Carter, members, any questions? Amen. Thank you. That's it. Um, the, let the record reflect that Representative Clardy is now present. Amen. And sir, uh, my, my, I, that was a change of my original registration from, uh, I think, far to against. We, we got you registered against, sir, and you were here to testify against. That's correct? We'll come back real quick. We just, we just want to, we don't want to ruin representative's bill, even though you're here against it. But you, you, I've got it shown that you were against, and you just testified yeah. against. Is that correct? I did, yes. Thank you. But I, it was a don't, you know, hey, well, well, just, told me it was you're, a you're against it. Excellent. We just got to be clear on that, sir. Sorry, again, it may sound like being a jerk. I'm a lawyer, so I understand that. But we're just trying to make sure the, the answers are the ones we need. Next up, the chair now calls Brad Hodges. Brad Hodges. Chair now calls Julie Kellogg. Yes, ma'am. Chair now calls Jeremy Bravo. My name is Jeremy Bravo. I'm here representing myself, Williamson County, Texas. I am for this bill, and I do agree. Election security, free and fair elections are the bedrock of our republic in the United States of America. I'm going to read to you today an excerpt from a United States Senate executive session hearing on election security from July 15th of 2019. I'm going to start with this. It starts with Senator Wyden from Oregon. I stand here this afternoon in a state of disbelief. Last Wednesday, my colleagues and I in Congress were briefed on the state of election security in America. I am prohibited from talking about these details of that classified briefing, but the message from my Republican colleagues after that election security meeting was very clear. Nothing to see here. One senator said, it is clear the federal government is doing everything you can do. The top Republican on the House Homeland Security Committee said, I wouldn't say we've got a need for more election security legislation. A member of the House Republican leadership said, the agencies have the tools they need and I'm confident they are addressing the threats. It is case closed for those Republicans, mission accomplished, said Mr. Wyden. My Republican colleagues were just as so satisfied that the foundation of our democracy is in good hands. Election security is not a problem for those colleagues I just quoted. It was an, enor it was an enormous shock this weekend when I picked up my phone and I read the following headline. Old software makes new electoral systems ripe for hacking. Over the weekend, I said, gosh, that just can't possibly be right. After all, my Republican colleague said after that classified briefing that election security issues were in good shape. I just kept reading, and as it turns out, according to the exhaustive analysis by the Associated Press, the vast majority of the 10,000 election jurisdictions nationwide use election management systems that run on old software that is soon to be out of date and ripe for exploitation by hackers. According to, this, you know, so, according to the Associated Press, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, Florida, Iowa, Indiana, North Carolina, and many others are all at risk. Even the state of Georgia, which just passed legislation to buy new voting machines, is on track to buy equipment that suffers from significant cybersecurity weakness. Worse, two of the, two of the three largest voting machine companies, ES&S and Hart, don't make election systems that are free from this vulnerability. 
many elections officials will be buying election systems that will be out of date the moment that they start using it. I'm reading this story and I'm thinking to myself, maybe this administration hadn't solved uh, the election security issues. Now, colleagues, I'm being a little bit disingenuous here. I've actually known about this for a long time. In fact, I wrote the EAC about this. Of course, our elections weren't secure last week, and they sure as heck aren't secure this week. Anybody who says otherwise either selling you a voting machine or simply has malicious intent towards our elections. Our colleague, Senator Rubio of Florida, even said that hackers were in position to alter voter rolls in 2016. In April, the FBI director said that 2018 was just kind of a dress rehearsal for the big show in 2020. Thank you, Mr. Bravo. Gonna, so you might be able to get that in if someone asks you a question, though, sir. Yeah, it, look, you're, we all know that election security is a big thing. I appreciate your, your all time, of you your, working. Your time's expired, though. However, you might be able to run it in. One sec. Uh, members, any questions for Mr. Bravo? Thanks. Mr. Bravo, is it your testimony that you're concerned about the security of our uh, look, I I know, electronic voting is. systems? Yeah, okay. we're, just, we're just trying to fix this together, right? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. The chair now calls. Robert Green. Mr. Green, if you please state your name, tell us with whom you are here to represent. I've got it as Travis County Republican Party Election Integrity Committee and yourself, and that you're testifying on the bill. That is correct. My name is Robert Green. I am the chair of the Travis County Election Integrity Committee. Mm -hmm. And you're representing them and yourself? Yes, that is correct, sir. I represent them and myself. Neutral? I, neutral. I, I just, I wanted, would like to make a comment that I think that the, should be a little bit more restrictive. I'd like to see, the requirement should be more restrictive, saying limiting the processing of data and secure storage of all election records, both electronic and paper, within the state of Texas not just within the United States. I think it should be kept here within the United States. That would eliminate potential problems outside of the state. And I think that um, these records should all be stored with our Secretary of State for the required 22 months that election records have to be maintained. That way they would be in a central location and not necessarily just scattered out with more opportunities that something could be altered. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to. Members, any questions for this witness? None. Thank you, Thank you. Mr. Chair. Very kind. The chair now calls Laura Presley. Thank you. Dr. Presley, if you please, of course, state your name, uh, with whom you're representing and your position on the bill. Yes, Dr. Laura Presley, I'm representing myself, and my position on the bill is I support this resolution. My understanding is a resolution. Got, real quick, I've got you saying that you're also representing True Texas Elections and yourself. Okay, yes. True Texas Elections and myself. And your position? Four. And it's a resolution, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, one big thing, I, I, I like this resolution. I have been personally a uh, testifying expert on a case that has alleged election fraud in Dallas County, illegalities and or fraud. And it has been difficult to get election data if the election data for a legal case is not in this country. It's very difficult to get discovery offshore. So I really support, I, I very much support this bill. I, I wish it was a bill and not a resolution so that the data for election results, unofficial results, official results, stay within United States boundaries. I prefer to stay in state boundaries. I did have a conversation with Christina Atkins of the Secretary of State's office on this specific issue related to election 
voting results. And her response to me was that there's nothing that prevents the data from going overseas. Okay. So that's my position. You have members, any questions for this witness? Thank you. Thank you. The chair now calls. Keith Ingram. The Director of Elections Division, Texas Secretary of State's Election Division. Here to, of course, testify neutral. Mr. Ingram, you know what to do. Uh, good afternoon. Keith Ingram here from the Texas uh, Secretary of State's Office Elections Division. Um, I am here on HR 237. Okay. Mr. Ingram, we've uh, heard some discussions. You may have just heard some about your office and these things. Could you bring some clarity to what this resolution seeks to do and maybe tell us about uh, our data security and the integrity of it and where it's stored, et cetera? Um, so the, the data that's specifically mentioned in the resolution, everything regarding processing votes, storing ballots, all of that stays with the general custodian of records for that election for the 22-month period. That's uh, 6605A to the code. You're, so, you're saying that electronic ballots never leave the United States? That is correct. They never There's never the into county. a cloud that could go somewhere else? They never leave the county. They are air-gapped. The report of those votes goes out to the world. Okay, so thank you. So the way this is drafted right now, but there, there's more to that. So could you explain to us what leaves the air gap? The reporting of the results. So the, the results of any election are reported. So you take um, a report from the central processing computer that's air gapped, and then you take it to another computer that's connected and either manually enter the data or put a thumb drive into the connected computer and report the vote results to the world. The actual votes are in the central count room, disconnected from anything. They stay with the custodian of records throughout the retention period. They never leave the county or the city, whoever the custodian of records for that election is. Okay. Members, any other questions? R Representative Beckley. So is there an, is this necessary, this resolution? You're saying that nothing leaves right now. It, other than so other than the reporting, other than the reporting, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So so it's not. So this resolution is changing nothing. Mm -hmm. I, I I can't speak to that. Okay. So so right now nothing leaves, other than the results. That's right. The reporting goes worldwide, but the actual votes and the processing and everything that happens locally stays local. So they stay in each county. Which they is do. safer than all the votes being in one place because you could, yeah. Okay, thank you. Members, any other questions for this witness? Thank you, Mr. Ingram. Is there anyone else here who wishes to testify on, for, or against HR 237? Hearing none. No one else. The chair recognizes Representative Rogers to close on the resolution. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman. I stated uh, earlier that every state has a different protocol with how their data is stored and processed and that it's not a problem in Texas. And that was just verified that, that we do keep our records uh, it was just stated that the Secretary of State um, stores and processes within this country. Mm -hmm. But we don't know that about other states. And this, was, this is a resolution. It's meant to be broad, and it's, it's meant to show leadership from Texas on what, on what the rest of the country needs, needs to be doing in that regard. It's mm -hmm. not intended to get down to the county level. It's, it's just a broad statement about we don't want our uh, elections to be... Mm -hmm stored or processed outside of this country under any circumstances. Thank you, Reverend and, uh, Rogers. So just in closing, I just say House Resolution 237 will allow us as Texas leaders to support election integrity and allow the people of Texas to have peace of mind when it comes to this important civic privilege. Uh, I ask for your favorable consideration on the resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Members, any questions? 
You know, Mr. Rogers, I, I do think it's a laudable goal, and it, it, it sends a policy message. However, you know, by myself, I, I actually still do have um, concerns, but, you know, the, jur the jury's out on everything. We hear from some who say there's issues. We hear from our agencies that, that say there's not. I tend to have a problem sometimes trusting government, but, but I do like these guys. So I'm, I'm still a little cautious, but I, what you're doing, the goal of it, is needed. We need to restore the, the faith in, in people that, that our elections are secure. So thank you for the bill. Thank you. If there is no objection, the resolution will be left pending. Is there objection? The chair hears none, and the resolution is left pending. The Chair lays out House Bill 25 and recognizes Representative Swanson or Schofield. Schofield to explain the bill. Mr. Chairman. Oh, let me repeat. There is an issue for Mrs. Swanson, so to be clear. The chair lays out House Bill 25 and recognizes Representative Schofield to explain the bill on behalf of Representative Swanson. Representative Swanson, can you can you say something for it? No, she's got some laryngitis issues right now. So, Representative Schofield, you please explain the bill for her. Mr. Chairman, there is a committee Ooh. substitute. Yes, yeah, so, so you have a committee substitute. The chair lays out the committee substitute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Uh, I will say, uh, Valerie and I have known each other for over 20 years, and this is the first time either one of us has been unable to speak. In 2020, political subdivisions all across the country and in Texas took it upon themselves to bend or violate their own state election laws, particularly as they relate to mail-in ballots. In Texas, the courts blocked every attempt, but when and how mail-in balloting is conducted needs to be definitely codified. Current election law requires applicants to request forms for early voting through the Secretary of State's office but it does not specifically outline whether officers or employees at the county or state level may distribute applications to those who do not request them or are already eligible to receive them based on other circumstances. The law seems pretty clear on that point, but some local officials thought they knew otherwise. Compared to in-person voting, voting by mail is substantially less secure and much easier to manipulate. Mail-in voting should not be used as a replacement for in-person voting based solely on convenience. Political subdivisions should not be sending out applications to people who haven't even requested them. HB 25 codifies the Texas court's decision from 2020 in current law. The bill prohibits officers or employees of the state or any political subdivision from distributing applications to any person who has not requested the application or does not already qualify. The committee substitute, which I'm laying out now, simply clarifies that officers or employees of the state cannot distribute application forms for early voting ballots in their official capacity. They can do it from their campaign with using their campaign dollars. Now, thank you, Chairman Kane and members. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have to the extent that I'm capable. And I respectfully uh, reserve uh, Ms. Swanson's right to close. Thank you, members. Any questions for Mr. Schofield? Yes, Representative Busey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, Ms. Schofield, if you don't have the answers, I understand we can talk with uh, Representative Swanson offline. I'm hoping since this means she can't answer, she also can't ask me questions on my bill, right, coming up. Um, one of my concerns is would this prevent the Secretary of State or counties from providing application forms to civic groups like legal women voters or other groups like that? So not sending it out to the individuals but providing them the form so then they can go out and try to help. Do you know? Well, and and Yes, uh, my reading of it is that it would prohibit that, and it's, it, it is the understanding, my understanding of the bill's intention is that members of the public who qualify to get mail-in ballots or to request mail-in ballots, we are not to go out there and solicit them. Okay. And I think that is, uh, and I believe that's current law. I think if you, chapter 84.012 basically indicates that mail-in ballot applications are supposed to go to people who requested them. All right. Uh, I appreciate that. And maybe the Secretary of State, if they're here today, can talk on this as well. Um, I should have. I should have no, that. I understand. I understand. And uh, I'm, I'm just, I mean, from my perspective, 
I think we want to get applications. We're not talking about ballots. We're talking about applications. I think getting applications out and getting more people to vote should always be our goal. So I have concerns about this bill getting in the way of doing that. You said the, the, the substitute still allows candidates and campaigns or elected officials on their campaign to still do it. But this is stopping government or nonprofits, I guess, from doing that? Uh, no, just the government. It, it, okay. it, is, it stops a officer or employee of the state or political subdivision in their official capacity. So if, if the election administrator or the uh, uh, tax assessor collector of a county thinks his side will do better if they vastly mail out lots of mail-in ballots to everybody, or applications to everybody, this would prevent them from doing that. If the campaigns want to try it, and we all, many of us do, uh, that's not, not touched at all by this bill. And that's the purpose of the committee substitute, is to make that part clear. But what about, like like we talked about legal women voters, if, if they're not a campaign per se, then they can't do it, you're saying? No, no. Uh, the League of Women Voters can. The officials aren't supposed to push a bunch of ballots to them to get around this law. Okay. If the League of Women Voters wants to uh, do a, conduct a mail-in registration drive, this bill doesn't stop that. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Now, Mr. Kurt Schofield, might, but this bill to kind of rephrase, is the purpose of stopping the use of governmental resources? Yes. And, and personnel. And so money. So if in, you're in giving it to them, you're giving job. them a resource? Yes. Thank you. There's a bunch of people wanting to talk. <laughs> the chair recognizes Vice Chair Gonzalez. Ask a question. I was going to ask I me mean, what, what the concern was. I mean, because I know that their voter fraud is mentioned in here somewhere in the background or purpose. I mean, I mean you, just, you just said that it was for resources uh, well yes so and I, we had in in Harris County in August of 2020 the clerk attempted to mail out not just applications but mail in ballots to every single registered voter in the county despite the fact that the vast majority were not eligible to vote by mail and would have been voting illegally if they admit if they cast those ballots uh, he was stopped from doing that and then decided to send them to everybody over age 65, again, regardless of whether they had requested a mail-in ballot or not. And, and the Attorney General sued and the Texas Supreme Court agreed that that's not the law. So, you know, the, I, I think it is clear that it is not the function of our election officials to take off their referee's jersey and play one of the sides and decide my side will be better served if we, if we do this. The legislature writes the law, the legislature writes the election code, and it is our duty to determine what the rules are and the procedures. We don't have 254 different election codes, as somebody said at the last hearing. And this bill would say, it's not your job to go out there and try to push mail ballots to people. It is the, under well, the this, law, it's this voters is applications to, to apply applications. for. Mm -hmm. Right, I mean, this is referring to just the application. I mean, you still have to fill it out and qualify, send it that, back. And, and all the campaigns are, you know, the campaigns do it for a simple reason. They think it'll help them win. It is not the look at the official's job to try to help one side or the other win that they think will do better if there are more mail-in ballots. And it can be either one of us. I usually win mail ballots myself, but that's just not their job. Their job is to be the referee. And if your campaign and my campaign want to push mail ballot applications out to voters we think will vote for us, we are more than welcome to do that on our own dime. I mean, so it's a concern that you're trying to take politics out of it, or resources, voter fraud. Well, I'm just trying to find out what what po po largely here. politics and resources, and to a certain extent, voter fraud. Mail ballots are less secure than anything else. You you push a bunch of mail applications out to everybody and his brother. You don't know who's filling them out and sending them back. There is no voter ID requirement for mail-in ballots. But this is just the application, but not the ballot. Yeah. There's a big difference. I think members, if we get some testimony, and then we. Can Probably get way more questions out of Mr. Schofield after this. Uh, Representative Schofield, do you reserve the right to close? I, I think I already did. Okay, yes. starting here. Great. Let's go to some testimony. The chair now calls Keith Ingram. In the hot seat a few times today, buddy. But I think you might be able to add some value up front to maybe answer some unknown questions. Uh, my name is Keith Ingram. I'm the director of the Elections Division, Texas Secretary of State's office, and we are here on House Bill 25. Members, do you have any questions for uh, Director Ingram? Chair recognizes Representative Beckling. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I just, how much voter fraud was committed by this 
what he's saying, or, or, or what are we talking about? Why do we need this bill? Is there, is there, is there evidence of fraud? Is there, I mean, since you're the Secretary of State, do so you carry that? Or no, I guess we got involved last election um, under 31005 of the election code, uh, which says that if we perceive that the rights of voters are being abused by an election official, it's our job to intervene. And we intervened because we believed that sending two million unsolicited mail ballot applications to voters who aren't qualified to vote by mail would be um, the equivalent of making them think it was okay to vote by mail even though they're not qualified and they would thus be committing a felony. So we were very concerned about voters being walked into a felony. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mr. Ingram, were there issues of uh, election administrators or anybody sending them out to everyone regardless of whether they're over 65 or disabled? Under, um, under so, you know, as I testified on March 4th, uh, 2020 was a special election year because of the pandemic. Right. And so for the very first time, we had county election officials who were interested in sending unsolicited mail ballot applications to large numbers of voters. Was that a authorized under the law in 2020? It was not. It's Thank ultra-virus. You. It was never allowed. 8412 says that a county clerk can send uh, a mail ballot application in response to a request and indeed has a duty to do so, but not unsolicited. Is it what, it what? What is the offense if they do do this? Currently, is there, there is no offense for it. It's just uh, not allowed. Okay. Is it an offense for a person who doesn't qualify to use a mail-in ballot to, to do so? That is true. Okay. State jail felony. So you're saying they were opening those people up to offenses? That's right. Okay. Thanks, sir. Members, any other questions? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Ingram, I'm, I'm confused. Are we talking about mail-in ballots or mail-in applicants? ballot applications we're talking about ballot applications applications for a mail ballot so even if you if i was to receive one if i was to fill one out i don't qualify i don't get a ballot well it depends on what you put on the application okay but uh, assuming because that's if, what my truthful information i'm not gonna i'm not gonna lie on it right then i shouldn't qualify to receive one if you don't check disabled and you're not over 65 and you're not going to be out of the county then you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to successfully complete the mail ballot application. Okay. And the second, how would I, if if we're not allowing the, the register or the election officials to send out the, the applications, how do I get an application? Or how does one? Um, how you can print one off of our website. Uh, the campaigns are pretty liberal about sending them to folks who are over 65. And then you can also request, we've got a, a, a website on our, on our page page on our website where you can request a blank mail ballot application. We sent out over 470,000 of those last year. And with, with all the, um, the issues surrounding the broadband or the lack of broadband, especially in the rural areas, if, if I don't have access to the internet, it's going to make it very difficult for me to send in my application. Um, well, you have to return the application by mail. Uh, or, or I'm sorry, early voting request starts. it. But uh, to request it, you can also go to your early voting clerk. You can pick up the phone and call the early voting clerk. They'll send you one. You don't have to use the Internet. But, but this bill doesn't affect me calling and asking and them sending me one. Absolutely not. No, it, it, that law is unchanged. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ingram, thank you for your testimony and being here today. Uh, following up on what uh, Representative Fierro said, uh, there are that you can call and get an application. There's many ways that you can get weather on the internet, and I appreciate your sensitivity to that, that issue, uh, Mr. Fierro. But um, I have a different question, because one of the things we've seen, uh, I've seen, and I guess it's probably around the state, is there are a number of different organizations or political candidates, whatever, will do these pre-filled applications to get a mail-in ballot. Um, and sometimes they're confusing, sometimes they're actually uh, in error, they're directed to a county clerk instead of election administrator. You, you've seen those occasions, is that correct? We have, yes, sir. And you, would you agree with me that it causes a lot of confusion among the voters as to what they should do? And sometimes internally within folks who handle elections, it causes an extra step. I've heard the stories where the clerks are getting it, where the clerk no longer handles elections, and they bundle up what they get and they walk it across to the EA and, hey, we got more mail for you. I mean, right. that happens all the time. I agree with that. Yes, sir. Um, and then the other circumstances I've heard of is with 
some groups who may be trying to target voters who they believe will vote. They, there's an expectation they will vote predominantly uh, Democratic or, conversely, uh, predominantly Republican. Uh, we'll send these out to a, a large group where individuals are getting pre-filled ballot applications from different groups, and typically for an over 65 population, uh, and the, the recipient may not remember, oh, I filled one of those out a week ago or two weeks ago or a month ago, and say, oh, I must not have turned that in. I'll fill this one out and send it back in, except this ballot says, well, congratulations, you now to get to vote in the Democratic primary and not the Republican primary or vice versa. Have you seen that situation before? Every primary, yes, sir. All right, and, and again, it creates confusion among the voters. Well, I, I don't believe that's anyone's intention. We want people to be able to vote, and if they're eligible, to, to uh, vote by mail. My question to you is, do you have any suggestions as the, the Secretary of State's office, what can be done to limit that duplication, that confusion, where someone shows up to vote in their primary and says, sorry, you've got to go to the other side of the room, when they had no intention of doing that. Do you have any ideas or suggestions how we can improve or, or fix that problem? I don't know of a way to fix the multiple applications from different parties problem. Um, with regard to what's on a mail ballot application, a form that's mailed out by groups or campaigns, our office would love to look at that before it goes out. We would very much like to review every single one of those uh, to make sure it complies with the code so that the voter is going to successfully get a mail ballot application from it. Um, we, we do review a bunch of those every season, um, but inevitably we'll get uh, a scan from an early voting clerk, will this qualify as a mail ballot application? And most of the time it has enough elements that you can say it works, but sometimes we have to say, no, I'm sorry, that won't work. Um, it doesn't have the required info. So we would like to prevent that by reviewing them in advance. Okay, and that's not dissimilar from other agencies before you can take action to get a, a pre-clearance. We may not like that. Word. <laughs> That's a sensitive but, word. But uh, pre-clearance in this instance may be a, a, a good idea because, again, we want to, I, I want to uh, have people have the opportunity to avail themselves of what's permissible under the law, but uh, some of our particularly older voters get can get confused on this issue. And then, then it creates a real headache for the, the staffs that run the elections around the state. I agree with that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Inger, real quick, because um, I'm hearing about confusion from Representative Clardy, are there, do people get confused on whether or not they qualify to apply for a ballot by mail? Is there ever confusion among voters what what the rules are to, to be able to be one? Do we? Um, yes. I mean, specifically with regard to this last year, it was a special year in every way. Um, there was a great deal of um, conversation about what the word disabled meant. Mm -hmm. That was the first time we really had any confusion about what it means to qualify for a ballot by mail. Yeah. What is the standard to qualify under disability? That you have an illness or sickness that prevents you from voting in person. On? There's a specific uh, reference to yeah. a pregnancy late term. Doesn't the code say on election day? On election day. Does that distinction seem to matter? Because I feel like people overlook the fact that it says it's on election day. It's not about voting in person without personal assistance during early voting. It's on election day. Is that correct? That's correct. Members, any other questions? Representative of Schofield. Um, Mr. Ingram, have you had a chance to see the committee substitute for this bill? I have not. I'm, I was afraid you had. They, you've seen the, the file version. I have, and I was concerned about it because that, the, of what the concerns that I think have been addressed by the committee sub. And when I want to, I want I'll, the. It's less than a line, so I'll read you the, the new language added and just get your opinion on whether that covers what we've talked about, which is state officials or, or local officials who aren't doing this in their job, they're doing it in their campaign. So what the bill, well, heck, I can read you the whole bill in six lines. Unless otherwise authorized by this code, an officer or employee of this state or of a political subdivision of the state may not, here comes the committee sub, while serving in the officer or employee's official capacity, distributed an application. Okay. Would, to your having dealt with election law pretty much for your whole career, would that, do you think, cover what we're trying to do, which is exempt out 
people who are elected officials from distributing in other capacities. I agree with that, yes, sir. Okay. Do you think it's effective language? I do. Okay. That, that's my whole question. Any other questions? Members? No? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, the chair calls um, Alan Vera. Representing Harris County Republican Party and himself, who is registered for the bill. Please state your name, who you represent, and your position on the bill, please. Thank you, Vice Chair. Alan Vera, Chairman of Harris County Republican Party Ballot Security Committee, speaking in support of HB 25. The unsolicited mailing of ballot by mail applications by government officials in their official capacity, in addition to the applications sent out by parties, candidates, and other political organizations, creates confusion and more than a little chaos on three levels. From our experience, when elderly voters receive multiple unsolicited BBM applications, many of them fill out, sign, and send back every one of them. So the county clerk receives multiple layers and waves of ballot applications from the same voters. The local authority has to expend extra manpower to keep track of multiple applications to ensure that only one live ballot goes out. Secondly, during in-person voting, too many elderly voters cannot remember whether or not they requested or received a mail ballot, whether they completed and submitted the mail ballot. When they present themselves in person to vote, they frequently are confused when they're told they're on the record for having been sent a mail ballot. They're then forced to vote provisionally, and things just get worse from there. In many cases, and too many cases, unsolicited ballot by mail applications are intercepted by somebody other than the voter. That person then requests and votes the ballot. The actual voter has to vote provisionally in person. And here's the problem, because in Texas, the mail ballots are processed by the early voting ballot board before the provisional ballots are ever addressed. So if someone steals a ballot by mail, they get counted, and the real voter who votes provisionally gets rejected. That's based upon the timing. The ballot by mail process is already sufficiently complex and uncertain. Flooding the market with hundreds of thousands of unsolicited ballot by mail applications needlessly adds fuel to the fire. This bill reduces at least some of that confusion in the marketplace. Now, we'd respectfully request that some kind of penalty be assigned in violation uh, to the violation of the prohibitions of the bill. But let's try to at least reduce the confusion of our, among our early, elderly voters by making more and making more work for our county election officials. We recommend this bill be passed out favorably. Members, are there any uh, questions for the witness? Thank you. Thank you. Next, the chair calls uh, Kimberly Young, who is registered for the bill, representing herself. Kimberly Young, also known as Kimberly Bridges Young, and I am for the bill. Okay. And you're representing? Myself. Thank you. Okay. Um, before you, you see a pre-filled out ballot application, uh, application for ballot by mail, and this was sent to my better half, Thomas Kramer, unsolicited. This caused confusion. I hear the word confusion quite often because he says, Kim, I didn't ask for this. What is this? He said, who sent it? And I said, oh, it's a political party. So we go vote, and we do it together, and I help him. He's older than I am. We go in, and what I'm concerned with is this came to my open rural mailbox. It's open. We're kind of rural out there on North Padre. So anybody could just walk by, and we have a lot of walk-by people. They walk their dogs. It's a beautiful place, right? They could just walk by, grab anything out of my mailbox, sign his name, and it's done. So, and they could even, I'm not even certain how this would work, but maybe they could even change the address. So, I'm really concerned about interception, and I think this should be prohibited. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there any questions for the witness? Thank you. Uh, next, the chair calls Bill Sargent, who is registered for the bill representing himself. Is that loud enough? 
My name is Bill Sargent. I'm the former director, former uh, chief deputy uh, clerk for, for elections in Galveston County, and I'm speaking in favor of the legislation. <clears throat> the, uh, the bill is great. It's a great start. Good job. Uh, but I'd go a whole lot further. And here's what I would, I would suggest you do as a, as a further committee substitute. First, you would allow governmental entity, entities to send out ballots by mail by only one per voter. We've had situations where people have asked for multiple ones, some cases as many as 50 or 100 of them. That's opening to opening up the, all, all kinds of uh, possibilities for, for ballot harvesting. So I would limit it to one per voter when it's sent out by, the, by a governmental entity. I would require that the county clerk or the EA keep a log for, for chain of custody reasons. And then if a campaign is going to send out an unsolicited ballot by mail, I would require that they use the same exact form that is used by the county that the resident lives in. One of the problems that you mentioned is the issue of, I get something that's this size, another one that's this size, and this size, and, and it, the information is in a different place, and it makes it a, a job for the, for, the, for, the, for the county clerk or the EA unbelievable to try to put it all together and scan it and get it done right. So I would, I would, I would require that they use the exact same form I wouldn't stop them from being able to send it out, but you would have to use the exact same form when you do that. In addition to that, I would say you should not be allowed to pre if you're if you're a, a political party or a campaign, don't pre-populate which party it is, and don't pre-populate uh, the the uh, uh, the annual ballot by mail portion of it. Here's the reason: we get people coming in a, in an election, and, and and they were sent a, a ballot by mail for the Pick one, Republicans. But they wanted to vote Democrat. Guess what? They can't vote Democrat with that because they got a Republican ballot. So if you don't pre-populate that, they have to choose which party they want. Secondly, annual ballots by mail. We have people showing up at every single election. This last year it happened over and over and over again. My county clerk is tearing his hair out. I've already torn my hair. Uh, and, and the bottom line is they were they were sent a ballot by mail because it, it was pre-populated annual. Now, it saves the party's money for having to send, not sending these things out every single election, but the bottom line is they get a ballot by mail. Then they come and guess what they do? They come to the polling place, and what happens? Well, guess what? They didn't bring their ballot with them, did they? So now they either got to go home and get their ballot and come back to the polling place and surrender it to actually vote it and vote in person, or they have to vote provisionally. What happened, what happened to the ballot that, that, that you were sent? Oh, my dog ate it, or I shredded it, or whatever. Right? So if you don't fill in that annual ballot by mail portion of that data field, that takes, that gets rid of that. I mean, so I would really strongly urge that you do that. Finally, you have to have some kind of a penalty for this. Um, I'd make it a Class A misdemeanor or higher, because if you don't have any teeth in this, they're going to just wink at it and go on and do their, whatever they want to do. You have to have some kind of a penalty that you can enforce against either a government employee or a party or a campaign or whomever. But you've got to put teeth in it. That's my story, and I'm sticking with it. Mr. Sargent, can you just clarify for the record who you're here representing? I'm representing myself. Okay. Uh, is there any... Are Although there any, I, I suspect there are others who agree with me. <laughs> are there any questions for the witness? No. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, next, the chair calls uh, Richard Bohert. Bohert? Representing him, himself, and he is registered for the bill. Yes, Richard Bohert, uh, representing myself, and yes, I am for the bill. And what I would like to do, I would like to thank all of our representatives for listening to the people. And maybe some of you representatives have experienced some voter irregularities. And I want to thank you all for taking this on and having the hearings on it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions for the witness? Thank you. Here. Uh, next, the chair calls Emily Ebby, representing uh, Texas Civil Rights Project and herself, and who is registered for the oh. Registered against. Against the bill. 
Uh, hi, I'm Emily Eby. I am testifying on behalf of the Texas Civil Rights Project and myself, and I am testifying against HB 25. I believe that the language of this bill is overbroad. Uh, there's nothing in HB 25 that allows for widely accepted non-controversial means of distributing applications. Uh, HB 25 might be read to keep counties from posting uh, applications on their website. It might be read to keep counties uh, from sending applications to registered voters who we know for certain are eligible, like voters over 65. Perhaps these provisions can be read in other sections of the election code. If so, we'd urge you to include specific references to them. Uh, HB 25 will not improve election security. It is already illegal to request an absentee ballot if you are not eligible for one. It is a state jail felony to knowingly provide false information on an application for ballot by mail. And to avoid this, the county that sent out the ballots uh, included a lot of information uh, with conspicuous uh, rep information about eligibility. Um, the application itself requires you to state your reason for voting by mail. Voters who don't have one of the four approved reasons may not vote by mail still. Um, the only difference between this bill and the existing law is that uh, the existing, in under this bill, fewer eligible voters can get applications. As to confusion, I don't believe it is less confusing to send voters an application that they can disregard than it is to send voters on a, a hunt across the internet uh, or a hunt for a phone number uh, to call and get a mail-in ballot application. Uh, my evidence for this is the dozens and dozens of voters who called the nonpartisan election protection hotline to ask us for help. Um, this bill also disadvantages voters who do not have printers. Voters can request that their county mail them an absentee ballot, but if the deadline is coming up quick, the surest way to get the application is to print it out yourself at home. Printers and ink are expensive. This harms lower income voters. Uh, printers can be hard to set up and operate, which harms older voters and voters with visual and motor disabilities. Uh, the validation I got but didn't want it is that my printer ran out of ink as I was printing this testimony to give to y'all. Uh, if the county can proactively provide a voter with an application, no printer is necessary. For these reasons, I am against HB 25 as written. Thank you. Are there any uh, questions for the witness? Yes. Hey, ma'am. Um, do you know if the code currently authorizes counties to uh, post uh, on their website where people can ap get applications? I couldn't find it in the code. I didn't read the entire code, but I didn't see it anywhere where it was specifically authorized. Okay. Any, other, you, oh, any other questions for the witness? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next, the chair calls Kenneth Moore, who is here representing himself and is f registered for the bill. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I am Ken Moore. I am for this, for this bill. And you're representing? I am representing myself. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I am chairman of the Ballot Integrity Committee for the Missouri County Republican Party. Uh, much of what I plan to cover has already been hit on, and, but uh, some things that I'd like to share with you that uh, has not been talked about. In my capacity, I had a, a election worker debriefing session where I invited election workers from Missouri County to come together and let me know or let us know what their concerns were, what problems they'd had during the elections. And there are two things that stand out. One was that they had people that would come in and uh, the, the book said that they had requested a mail-in ballot. And, uh, well, yes, I did, but, uh, you know, I never requested it, but, uh, uh, you know, since I didn't, I didn't really ask for it, um, I threw it away. So now they don't have this ballot to bring with them. And they didn't understand they have to have that ballot in order to, uh, to vote a regular vote. And so that was confusion that was created there. Another thing was nursing homes. And that's a whole new topic right there, but uh, we've had people, uh, especially one nurse who talked about nursing home patients who couldn't read a stop sign, who were still getting uh, ballots. And somebody was filling them out and voting them. And so I argued that having these things to be thrown out like that is not a good is not good. 
it creates a lot of opportunity for fraud. It creates a lot of uh, confusion. As we saw in the last election, especially in Harris County, it created a lot of chaos. So I would uh, urge you to pass this through uh, the House. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Members, any questions for this witness? Thank you. The chair now calls Lon Burnham. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to testify. I'm uh, Lon Burnham. I'm representing Public Citizen, and we are against the bill, although we are greatly relieved to see the committee substitute because I know you guys have all done what we're about to prohibit. Mr. Burnham, you're also representing yourself? As well yes. As Thank you. Um, I'm representing myself in part because I have a whole lot of personal experience with uh, vote by mail both good and bad. Uh, there are some problems, clearly, that uh, need to be addressed, but I think it's a mistake to prohibit your local government from printing these forms. And I mainly think it's a mistake because of what has already been alluded to, and that is in a district like I represented for 18 years, uh, more often than not, the household doesn't have a printer. More often than not, they may know and be able to get by a church, or some other public facility that happens to have those printed applications. So, from my perspective, um, while I wouldn't suggest Representative Swanson that it's intentional, it is in fact a voter suppression bill. It's a voter suppression bill because it simply makes it harder to get access to the application to be able to vote. Now, a lot of other problems have been discussed in around this bill. Uh, you know, it's a felony to take something out of a mailbox, and unfortunately, I know of political incidences where the ballot itself was taken out of the mailbox. That is a problem, mm. but you can't address it here. That's not what you're about. I think this bill has some merit, even though we're against it. I think it needs to be narrowed. Somebody said overly broad in their testimony. That is really, really true, and it needs to be refined where you allow for the election administrator to be able to print on paper. I know this is very 20th century of me, but I think you need to be able to access this information. And speaking of standardized forms, yeah, because they come in a whole bunch of different confusing, and I would think your election administrators would like the opportunity to talk about how that form should look. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Um, I think I've covered everything I want to think. Mr. Chairman, do you think there's anybody with any questions, or have I made myself perfectly clear? I think this is a voter suppression bill, the way it's drafted, but it could be corrected. Thank you, sir. Thank Members, any questions for Mr. Burnham? None. Thank you. Thank you. The chair calls Mr. Robert Green. Mr. Green, if you could please state your name, with whom you're representing, and your position on the bill. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Robert Green. I am the chair of the Travis County Republican Party Election Integrity Committee, and I'm here to testify in favor of the bill. Are you also uh, doing it on yourself? And myself. I've got you as against, sir. Against this, we can we can fix it. But so it, it was your intent, though, is to register. Oh, I'm sorry. I I may have made a mistake when I did, but I'm here you testifying in favor of this bill. Yep. <clears throat> okay, we're going to correct that. All right. So you sorry. are in favor of it, and we yes. will, we will correct it. Okay. I I I'm, I was very confused by the last testimony. I don't believe that this bill would prohibit the printing of an official application. Only the broad spectrum distribution of an application to people who did not who did not request it now i think i think it's a good bill and it would prevent county elections office uh, office holders or another state employee from arbitrarily and possibly selectively sending out applications for an early voting ballot by mail and the goal is to minimize mail in voting limiting it to absentee voting and the elderly and the disabled and people who will legitimately be out of the country or county 
on election day and during the entire early voting period. Uh, and that's, that's my testimony, but I, 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 feel, I also agree that there should be a penalty associated with this because, as I've said before, without, without penalty for violations, what use is any law? Questions? Thank you. Members, any questions of this witness? Thank you. Thank you. The chair now calls Chris Davis. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Chris Davis testifying on behalf of the Texas Association of Election Administrators on the bill, House Bill 25. We appreciate both the author and by proxy, uh, Representative Schofield's uh, layout of the substitute. It addressed one of the questions we had about state officers and their official capacity. Our membership still seeks clarity on that term of distribution. Today, are our members, matter of fact, the Secretary of State's website, uh, in violation of even the committee substitute bill by posting or having on an internet uh, website a, a copy of that application form. That's that's a, an item, a point of clarification that we, we seek. We also seek, um, if the answer to that is we're not in violation, we're still allowed to do that, is in an office allowed to disseminate the URL to say 2.4 million residents of their county via mail, email, Facebook, text, That's all I have. Members, any questions for this witness? Representative Party. Thank you, Chairman Kane. And uh, Mr. Davis, uh, thank you for your testimony. I think I asked this question a while ago to uh, Mr. Ingram with the Secretary of State's office. And I'm, I have mixed uh, feelings on this issue on a bunch of different levels, whether it be First Amendment or voter confusion, or whatever it may be. Um, what would be your suggestions to the, the what I'd said to Mr. Ingram a moment ago to help avoid voter confusion, not create chaos or conflicting mail from uh, over 65 or eligible voters uh, in the uh, elections offices? In a, in a perfect world we'd all like to live in, what do you think the uh, best fix would be? Thank you, Representative Cardi. Perhaps a clear expression of what the law is, the eligibility requirements for it, in whatever form we're allowed to dis to post or have on a stack at our office, um, mail to those that uh, actively request it, clear expression of what those eligibility requirements currently are, uh, I think is very important. We're just trying to seek what the approved, if this bill or substitute passes, what those approved modes of transference of the application to one that may want it are. Thank you, members, any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Davis. Thank you, sir. The chair now calls Renee Perez. Ms. Perez, if you could please uh, state your name, tell us whom you're representing and your position on the bill. My name is Otilio Rene Perez, Jr. I am representing Tarrant County Republican uh, Party. Republican? Uh, I understand. Tarrant County Libertarian Party, <laughs> sorry. Uh, um, and yourself? And, my, and myself. And uh, my position on this bill is uh, against uh, because uh, I must remind the committee members to please review the Secretary of State Compact with Texans it's listed on their website. Among its agency principles is to increase voter registration. It's disappointing that a member of the Secretary of State's office would speak against this um, because this is a way for uh, our respective parties to inform voters of who is 
looking for support uh, on, on the ballot. Um, the Libertarian Party has not sent out mail-in uh, mail applications yet. It is a project we're pursuing for the future um, because as a member of the ballot board, I've seen its effectiveness. Uh, we consistently can look back and see how people have been consistently Republican or Democrat voters based on the mail-in applications. Um, and uh, there's a couple of points I wanted to make sure that were known by the members of the committee, that uh, the ballot board does its job in early voting to prevent false applications and ballots. So it was a, an assertion made earlier by one of the testi testimonials that, uh, that we don't catch that, <laughs> uh, uh, that uh, mail-in applications are somehow um, or make that an open possibility. And uh, if we do our job, it would, does not happen. Um, the ability to change the address by intercepting one of these mail-in applications, that is not an easy process. There is an extra uh, separate process called SOR that uh, must be updated, uh, requires verification. So that's not a very um, uh, potential source of voter fraud. Um, uh, I all would like to say that uh, I believe we would support uh, the consistent uh, form or format for uh, mail-in applications. Uh, that is something that has been a, a, a subject of discussion uh, with us because we would like to avoid confusion. We would like to comply with all the, the necessary laws to make sure that any of our uh, applicants would be accepted. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Members, any other questions for this witness? Thank you, Mr. Perez. Thank you. Call Boner. Okay. Henry Boner. The chair now calls Henry Boner. Henry, if you could state your name, tell us with whom you're representing. It says it's you're here for yourself and uh, your position on the bill, please. Okay, I'm Henry Bonert, and I'm here to represent myself, and my position is for the bill. And uh, first off, there's a lot of concerns uh, about the uh, uh, mail-in uh, ballots now. We, I was uh, uh, one of the um, clerks in uh, my county where they were, an, an elderly gentleman came in and had a um, had gotten uh, solicited for a mail-in ballot, and he threw the stuff away. The first time he got another one, he filled it out, and thought that he was filling out something for registering to to actually uh, vote in that. And when he came in, he uh, the poll deal shows that he had received a mail-in ballot. When he told us that he didn't receive one. So we don't know what the situation was. We ended up having to tell him you've got to put in, fill out a provisional ballot. And he didn't want to do that. He was, you know, he says, well, I just won't vote. And so he's actually, you know, he was basically discouraged from being able to vote because he couldn't, he didn't want to go through the process of filling out a provisional ballot. Um, and the other, the thing that, this is mostly for uh, sending out applications for mail-in ballots and that, and I understand that, but I don't think there is actually any kind of a mechanism in place for uh, verifying that the information on those mail-in ballots is correct. Now, I may be wrong, but I, I haven't uh, heard anybody mentioning that there's some kind of a, uh, a mechanism in place where that information is verified like you have to do if you go to vote in person you have to show an, uh, um, an ID you know a photo ID and that uh, that would be one of my concerns about this this whole application process so the other thing is, is um, I think we need to be more proactive and this to me is a, a proactive measure to take care of things if there aren't any problems this at least is going to address or, or at least keep other problems from coming up. Thank you. Thank you. Mem members, any questions? Come back. 
mean, you could just run, it would make it faster. Representative Schofield. You referenced in, in your testimony a, a, pers a voter who uh, came in to vote and was told they'd received a mail ballot, and they didn't want to vote provisionally. But you realize if they voted provisionally, it's not going to count. I mean, we have well, no appeal for if somebody says you got a mail ballot and you show up to vote. If, if that's been an error, if it was fraud, whatever reason, somebody has got a, your ballot, you're out. And that's right. what we had. That's that's what I was was saying. But our the judge. I was a clerk. The judge was uh, saying that we would we could give him a provisional ballot and and that makes him feel that's good. One, but it ain't going to count. That's that's right. And that, you know that's what we. I mean, we had several instances where people had um, mail-in ballot deals. And that I mean, it shows up on the poll pad that they, they received a mail-in ballot. They hadn't. I mean that he was sent a mail-in ballot, not that they received one from him. He so he didn't, he ended up not being able to vote. Uh, Representative Clardy. Thank you, Chairman McCain. Really, I just more of a curiosity. Is the second row over here, is that reserved for the Boner Brothers? <laughs> oh, uh, I think so. Brothers, we're, we're on we're on good terms with the chairman. All right, I just didn't know what the relationship <laughs> was here. If they were, are, are you brothers? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Well, I can see the resemblance now. Oh, just mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Yes, so. I hope Richard was nice to you when you were growing up. So, yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on for or against House Bill Twenty Five? Okay, Mr. Carter, I will, I will, we're going to check on it, but we'll tell you if, I, I don't have you up here, sir, and I will say we have, we have three more bills if, uh, that we need to get done, um, but I, I don't, it does not show that, that change, sir. That's a question for someone else, sir. I don't have that information. If, if you submitted your position on the bill without testifying, it, it, it will be there, sir. I cannot let you testify. You'd have to do that on the kiosk without being registered. I understand. We can do that. I cannot change it on my end right now, sir. I, I'm, yeah, my apologies. You have to go out to the iPads, the kiosk, to do it. Yes, sir. Hearing none, the chair recognizes Representative Schofield to close on the bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And on behalf of Representative Swanson, I close. Any questions for Representative Schofield? I can't imagine why anybody would have any. Any? None? Yes. Excellent. If there's no objection. The chair withdraws the committee substitute and the bill will be left pending. Is there objection? The chair hears none and the bill is left pending. The chair lays out House Bill 611 and recognizes Representative Schofield to explain the bill on behalf of Representative Swanson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Uh, assisting a voter in the booth is a very serious and very important task, but there's too much room for abuse in the system. Voters ought to be completely secure in the knowledge that there's no inappropriate action taking place. Far too often, voters are intimidated or coerced into choosing someone to assist them while voting, and in these situations are simply being told who to vote for. This kind of voter fraud can be the most dangerous because it is someone's legitimate vote that has been cast under duress. HB 611 adds language to the existing voter assistance oath and increases the penalty for breaking the oath. The bill adds the phrase, I did not pressure or intimidate the voter into choosing me to provide assistance to the already required oath for someone taking on the responsibility of voter assistance. HB 611 also adds that breaking this oath into the definition of perjury in the Texas Penal Code, that's section 3702 that you see in section 2, and makes it a state jail felony if it is found that one individual has broken the oath more than three times in a single election. 
Ensuring that voters can be insisted without intimidation or coercion is vital to a fair and secure election process. Thank you, Chairman Kane and members. Uh, I am happy to answer questions, again, to the extent of my ability, uh, and requestfully reserve on behalf of Representative Swanson the right to close. Thank you, Representative Schofield. Members, are there are any questions for Mr. Schofield, Representative Schofield? Representative Clardy. Thanks, Chairman Kane. Um, and I'll talk to the bill author when she's able to talk. But the question I have, why, why do you get three strikes of violating an oath before it's punishable? That's not what it does. I'm, try, and I'm trying to remember my voter assistance law. That yeah, may be before I mean, it becomes I mean, the a whole felony. point is that, generally speaking, when you take an oath, it ought to like, be for all the time, not, you know, thinking if you violate an oath, you violate an oath. And this should be punishable upon a violation of your oath. That may be, I see Representative Swanson nodding, so I think the author may agree with you. Under the law currently, I mean, for clarity, it's a Class A misdemeanor. You do it three times, it's a state jail felony. So you do it three times, you get an upgrade? Yes, sir. All right. Yep, frequent flyer miles. Any other questions for Representative Schofield? Hearing none, we'll proceed to testimony. The chair calls Alan Vera. Mr. Vera, if you please state your name with whom you represent your position on the bill. Alan Vera, Chairman, Harris County Republican Party Ballot Security Committee, uh, speaking in support of HB 611. Unfortunately, statewide, we continue to observe the practice which we have labeled voter ambush. Political operatives intercept voters in the parking lots of polling places, literally lock arms with the voters and coerce them into allowing the ambusher to serve as the voter's assistant inside the polling place. Our observations have been that they primarily pick on Hispanic voters, female, in the parking lots, although there are exceptions. This practice is not only a form of voter intimidation, but apparently results in the ballot preferences of the ambusher being cast rather than those of the voter. The increased penalty specified in the bill should help improve the degree to which the local authorities and the OAG take these violations seriously. We recommend this committee pass this bill to the full house. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vera. Members, any questions for this witness? Thank you. The chair calls Renee Perez. My name is Otilio Renee Perez, Jr. I represent the Tarrant County Libertarian Party. And my position on this bill is uh, against okay. in the way that it is written. Ms. Perez, I also have that you're representing yourself as well. So, yeah, and, and so you're representing the Tarrant County Libertarian Party and yourself. Yes, sir. And it shows that you're against the bill. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. I wanted to just make the general uh, some of the statements made previously i uh, agree with in that this uh, appears to be um, a little strong-armed i agree that this oath is important um, i have seen things that when i was younger i didn't quite understand but now i could be uh, interpreted as a form of voter coercion taking advantage of elderly people that were not sure about the, the voting process, the buttons to press, the dials to turn, things like that. So um, I would just simply uh, would hope that the committee would amend this to make this less draconian um, and, and perhaps do a better job of informing the voters uh, at the polling places, at the actual polling places, uh, maybe a uh, large sign uh, letting it known that this is um, something that uh, is, a, is an offense that, that is a, um, 
that uh, can be pun uh, punishable by the law. Um, I've noticed that at polling places, I, this is not overtly known. Um, that is all that I can I have to say on this. Okay, members, any questions? I have a question. So, so what you're saying is, is in the oath, you should be informing them as well that this is subject to a criminal offense. Yes, sir. Okay, decent idea. Thank you, members. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Ms. Perez. Thank you. The chair now calls Kenneth Moore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Three things. Three things. Kenneth Moore, tell me your name, who you represent, and your position on the bill. My name is Kenneth Moore, position for it, representing myself. Thanks, sir. Okay. Uh, assistant to voters, uh, this is something that's very of course, very necessary. I mean, people uh, for language, for uh, oh, for uh, manual reasons, they can't control the machines, whatever. And we understand that. And we have rules in place uh, to regulate this. You can translate, you can read for them, uh, you can uh, it, follow the instructions of the voter if you have to actually run the machine yourself to, to vote for them. And we make it very plain. The, um, as I understand it, part of the reason for this bill is to make it plain to the assistant where the line is drawn. This is what you can do, what you can't do. You may not influence this voter. Sometimes this, uh, this influence is the people are it's innocent. Uh, I've seen uh, people come in his family, uh, a woman helping her elderly husband uh, try to vote, and uh, you have to come in, step in, say, ma'am. He has to vote for himself, and most times they'll step away, and they understand that. But sometimes it's malicious. Uh, I mentioned earlier about the, the nursing home problem. We have people come in that, and, and will vote for someone. They'll, they'll uh, manipulate a, a, a request for a bill and ballot. Uh, they'll request the ballot, and then someone else will either show them who to vote for or do it for them. But uh, the, the intent of this bill, though, is to clarify that, that line, where you can, what you can and can't do. And it also adds teeth. It says, here's the, here's the results, or here's the consequences of violating that oath. Uh, I think it's very necessary. I think it does add to strength and clarity to our law, and I would urge you to pass it. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Moore. Members, any questions? Thank you. Good. The chair calls Lon Burnham. The chair now calls David Carter. Now, Colonel Carter, I need you to know it shows that you are here representing yourself and it shows that you are against the bill. Yes, sir. I'm against uh, giving free passes uh, to, uh, to break your oath twice. Okay. This bill, that this bill uh, does. You. So, uh, David Carter, representing myself, I'm against uh, uh, this bill. Okay. okay. And so uh, that's that's my point. The same same thing. Uh, Representative Clardy asked, why should we uh, give the person two mm -hmm. passes, and then after on the third time, uh, charge him with right. a misdemeanor? Members, any questions for Mr. Carter? But, uh, I want to be aware that, that, that the first violation is a crime. Mm -hmm. What's the penalty? It's a Class A misdemeanor. Okay, what's the second penalty? If you do it two more times, it's a state jail felony. Okay, but if you, on the second time, it's still a misdemeanor, right? So they get two misdemeanors? They're, they're, they're Class A misdemeanors. Mm -hmm. Okay. The highest misdemeanor. Right. So uh, the, the people that prosecute, the, the county attorneys uh, don't prosecute Class A misdemeanors for stuff. So it needs to be a it needs to be a state jail felony for the first time you do it. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. The chair now calls Bill Sargent.
Mr. Sergeant, there's three things you need to know. There's a piece of paper up there on the on the podium that tells you that. I need your name, uh, who you represent, and your position on the bill. My name is Bill Sargent. I'm the former chief deputy clerk for elections for Galveston County. I represent, I'm representing myself, and I'm in favor of the bill. However, Ms. Swanson, uh, sorry, you can't talk, but uh, I would make some changes. Very good start, but I would make a couple of changes. In the actual oath, and this is being passed out to you, and it shows in red, I would add at the end of it, and I acknowledge that failure to abide by this oath is a class B, or class, I think it was, you said it was class A, should be class A misdemeanor. So that the person who is, who is taking this oath, and when I have a person who has, as, the, as the election judge, who comes in to, to get help, I actually read this out loud to them. So that they, and both the both the person who is being helped and the person who is assisting, actually understands what it is that they're agreeing to, and I read that to them. If you include that, that lets them know if they violate this thing, then then they're they're violating the law. And then I've I've penciled in at the bottom, uh, under section two, where it says a person previously made a false statement described in section one and struck and stricken. <coughs> Three or four times in connection with a single with a single election, which means that if they violated it once and they've been convicted of that, they know what they can and cannot do. The next time around, it becomes a, it becomes a felony. So I would make it so they basically got one shot. If you're convicted of it, and you know that you, what you did is wrong. The next time around, it's a felony. That's my story, and I'm sticking with it. Thank you, Mr. Sergeant. Members, any questions? Thank you. The chair calls Robert Green. Thank you, Mr. Green. The chair calls Julie Kellogg. Julie Kellogg. The chair calls Richard Bonnert. Sir. Last call, the chair calls Lon Burnham. Members, we do have a resource witness. Is there any members desiring? Yes, please. Uh, the chair calls Keith Ingram. I'm going to have Director Ingram. Keith Ingram here from the uh, Elections Division, Texas Secretary of State's office. We are here on uh, House Bill 611. Thank you, members. Any questions? Representative Busey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Keith, honestly, I don't know if this question should go to you, but I'm not sure who to ask it to, so let me start with you. You know, changing the oath, that's fine. I'm wondering why we're inclined to go from a misdemeanor to a felony, why we think this extra punishment is needed. And, and to that question, how many times have we successfully prosecuted and found people guilty of this, this crime of breaking this oath? Do you have any idea of that? Um... No. Like, is it happening so much that we need to go make more severe punishment because the current punishment isn't stopping it? Um, we have, over the years that I've been here, made quite a few referrals for improper assistance. Um, I don't know if that's violating this oath, but this is adding a new component uh, sure. that uh, we haven't seen before. Yeah, well, and I, again, my, I guess my concern isn't to the oath. It's to making a harsher punishment for something where I'm curious about often the oath is being violated in the first place. And, and I would assume if we're doing this, the, the thought is the current punishment isn't stopping it and it's happening so much. So I'm just curious why, how rampant is this problem that we need to increase the penalty because the current penalty isn't enough? Um, I could go back and look and see how many referrals for improper assistance we've made. But uh, maybe it's, it's, it's one of the Attorney General. frequent flyers. It's not, a, it's not an uncommon occurrence. But that, that's a complaint, not necessarily found guilty. I agree with that. Okay. I don't have any idea what that, That's my main issue here. It's not working on the oath. And, and I think, you know, that makes some sense if that's where we want to go. But it's the increasing the punishment for something that I'm just curious about how, how many people have done crimes here that they're back out there repeating and repeating that now we need to make a, a felony. So I appreciate it, sir. And I understand this may be more for the Attorney General, but they're not here today, so I had to ask it to you. Thank you. Thank you, members. Any other questions for Mr. Ingram? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. 
Mm. One moment. The chair calls Jonathan White. And Mr. White, if you could please uh, tell us with whom you are with and your your position on the bill and state your name. Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Jonathan White, Attorney General's Office, testifying on the bill. Thank you. Members, any questions for Mr. White? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Representative Busey. Thank you, and sorry to say you weren't here. My apologies. I didn't realize. Um, can you talk to how many times people have been found guilty of this of this misdemeanor under, under, based on the oath? They, you talk about a number of cases that you all have looked into, and then how many times it's been found guilty. Again, not talk. I mean, it's already a crime, right, if to break this oath? Yeah. Um, I'll get to both parts Thank of the you. question. Um, uh, we have not prosecuted perjury on an oath before because perjury is an offense in the, the uh, penal code. And we have uh, authority over the election laws of the state, but perjury itself, unless it's adapted with this amendment, would not have anything in it that would make it an election law. I think this change probably would do that, so that would open up perjury as an avenue for us to be able to prosecute. Um, so that's that one. Uh, as, in terms of unlawful assistance, you know, that's one of the three types of cases that we see regularly. Um, I, I don't know a convictions number on that. Um, I can try to dig through the data and extract that for you. But what I can tell you is that, you know, historically about 30% of our cases, of our, our the offenses that we prosecuted, um, which is a 159 offenses have have involved cases that uh, involve assistance fraud so and, and by assistance fraud we we take that to mean getting between a voter and their ballot whether it's a mail ballot or whether it's in-person voting um, the same oath is required for both processes but getting getting between a voter and their ballot and influencing that vote okay so you said you said about a 30%, you said about 139, you said, or something like that. We have, have 159 uh, counts of uh, offenses involving assistance fraud or cases involving assistance fraud, which represents about 30% of the cases historically. Do we know how many of those have been seen through to finding a guilty charge? I don't have that okay. for you right now. I can try to ferret that out of the data. And that and that 139 is over what span? Um. Or, I'm sorry. I since since we began keeping, I'm, since we began keeping track, okay. um, from 2015 to present, I uh, have 72 counts 72. representing 26 percent. You know how many people have voted since 2015 to present? Tons. Tons. I okay. No yeah. Idea. No, I hear you. I look. I the, we just my concern here is going from a misdemeanor to a felony and wondering if that's necessary when we're hearing the numbers from you, and so that that's my concern representative on your bill that I'd like to continue to work with you all on. Talk about. But I appreciate you being here and answering my questions. Thank you. Members, sir. any other questions? Okay. Representative Clardy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Does moving the uh, uh, penalty uh, range on this from a misdemeanor to a felony make it more difficult or cause any problems as a prosecutor on these cases? Generally, um, felony offenses um, make a prosecutor's job easier in certain ways. Um, uh, we generally see offenses come in groups if we're dealing with people that are engaging in this type of activity and um, having some felonies and having some misdemeanors is not very efficient because then you're split between county court, district court, um, you know, split dockets trying to prosecute the same. And they move at different paces. You know, county courts want to move cases faster than felony courts move, move cases. So. Um, as well as having, you know, some, some leverage to reach some sort of plea agreement, which we do in most of our cases. So um, this, this bill also, it, it's interesting because it comes from the angle of penalizing perjury on this oath rather than the underlying offenses, which would be influencing the voter improperly, um, which we would address directly through Section 64.036 or um, another section. 
Um, so uh, I think that it provides another tool in the toolbox in that regard as well. Sometimes it can be helpful for you in, in both investigating and prosecuting the case to have multiple criminal counts that can be charged for a, a rising out of one set of circumstances. Or it, connected if you have multiple. It, it would, although I should temper that and say that the enhancement only comes with um, proof that this individual has committed it at least three times, which means I've got to prove three cases before I can even enhance it. So, um, you know, from my perspective, I, I think that it could be enhanced based on the fact that it, it involves a process of voter assistance alone without requiring three, three offenses of it. Um, the process is important enough. The free and fair exercise and the independent exercise of the vote by the voter is important enough to protect it on its own. I'm just uh, suggesting to my colleagues that perhaps when it comes to moving punishment phases and perhaps creating some inconsistencies in the law and how it could be prosecuted, because the rules that you're held by as a prosecutor are very strict, that, that uh, you have the burden of proof and it's, it's the highest standard under the law, and that getting kind of uh, help and assistance and guidance from our prosecutors responsible for these laws uh, will probably help clean up some of our penal ranges. Is that fair to say? I appreciate that, yes. Thank you. I agree. Thank you, members. Any other questions? Question. Vice Chair Gonzalez? Um, what does it mean to pressure a voter? Like, how would you define pressure if you had to, uh, if this bill were to pass? What, what, what actions rise to the level of it being pressure that would fall under, under this? And is, is pressure in the language of the bill? Yeah, the bill, I sir. I reviewed it mm -hmm. earlier, but I haven't laid eyes on it in a little while. Um, you know, if there's not a statutory definition of the word, we go by plain language, which is, you know, dictionary definition. So to me, any, um, any attempt to influence the voter in a direction that the voter did not want to vote, I would say would probably constitute pressure. How is that different from coercion or co how's that different? Pressure seems probably a little less extreme than coercion. Coercion would probably be a notch above and coercion usually involves some sort of threat. Do you know if it's defined the word pressure in the penal code somewhere? I don't believe it is. I guess, I mean, I just have some concern that the length, that word is too broad and certain actions would fall under pressure um, and you know somebody could fall within that just if, if it's left too open like that uh, if you look at the dictionary I mean you think of pressure as getting a coke bottle shaking it that's building pressure in something right I mean so um, I wanted to know what how you would define pressure in the way it's written here yeah I mean when I see pressure and intimidate the voter I'm, I'm I would have to have facts that are fairly extreme for me to say I think that those elements were were proven so if so for example let's say that there's an election worker or somebody who's right working at a polling location and they are working for a candidate right but they're and they're they convinced to talk to somebody say hey this is why it's important for you to vote they convince the person to, to go vote this is not it. they're not talking to them about the candidate this is talking about hey um, and I can, you know, if you need my assistance, I can, I can assist you. Is that pressure? Um, and how is that different no, from what I, candidates I, do? I mean, I, I think to, I think to prosecute that behavior, you know, it would have to read that, um, basically that you can't offer assistance, that a person has to ask for assistance rather than you offering assistance. So maybe, that's not what this says. So, no, I don't, I don't think that would probably constitute pressure under the, the situation you laid out? Probably. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is, in your line of work, when we're discussing coercion, do you often see the word pressure or coerce? I mean, I'm, I'm doing a quick review, and I see case law and things, putting those words together as a broader tool for your toolbox. If it doesn't fit coerce, you want to be able to maybe fit pressure is sure yeah I think um, intimidation and coercion are are pretty 
standard concepts in, in criminal law. I don't think I've seen pressure um, that often. Um, and in this context, it's choosing the person to provide assistance. So I think this is something that isn't addressed directly anywhere else in the election code. So it's, it's an interesting addition. I think it's probably a good addition in terms of, I mean, I don't think we want to pressure and intimidate people to receiving assistance. Uh, you know, one situation that I can think of that this might apply to um, in answer to Representative Gonzalez's question is we have sometimes we have seen scenarios where employees of a school district, for example, are, um, I mean, I hate to use the word pressure, but they, they receive assistance in voting so that they're, uh, so that the school board members know that they voted the right way. And so we have school teachers that have come through and they have been assisted by someone. They have no need for assistance. They're not eligible for assistance under the law. Yet here they are receiving assistance from essentially a handler that's there to, to make sure that they voted the right way. You know, under the right circumstances, and that's why I answered the question probably, you know, you could have other circumstances that might create a situation where there's pressure or intimidation. Um, and I'm not talking about, I don't think, um, just a generic situation where someone is offering a, a voter assistance who actually needs it. You know, that that's not the kind of situation I'd be looking for with this. Members, any other questions? Representative Beckley? I just want a clarification. I'm not a lawyer, so when you were talking about earlier um, the cases were perjury cases, is, does that, do they not fall underneath the AG's office? Do they go somewhere else? No, um, local prosecutors have jurisdiction over penal code offenses in general. There are some penal code offenses that would be considered election laws. Okay. Prior to this change, if this were to happen, I think that this would now, perjury could now be considered an election law for the small portion of it that contains that. So no, we don't have general authority uh, to prosecute a perjury offense. So is this expanding the authority of the AG's office? Uh, I don't know if that was the intent of, of the, the bill at all, but I think that it would give us authority to prosecute perjury under that very narrow that you don't red now. that we don't have now. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. I I have not had well, legal anything. And if I could, okay, go ahead. If I could put a little caveat on that, um, it is unclear and untested at this point whether we would have authority to prosecute a statute that applies to an election fraud situation, if that statute doesn't contain an election element in it. I don't know the answer for sure to that, but we have never attempted to insert mm -hmm. ourselves into a situation like that. Thank you. Members, any other questions? Thank you, Mr. White. Thanks, sir. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify on, for, or against House Bill 611? Not the chair recognizes Representative Schofield to close on the bill. Thank you very much. And again, uh, on behalf of Representative Swanson, I close. Members, any questions of Mr. Schofield? Representative Schofield. None. If there is no objection, the bill will be left pending. Is there objection? The chair is none. The bill is left pending. Congratulations, Representative Swanson. You just laid out two bills without saying a word. The chair lays out House Bill 1890 and recognizes Representative Schofield to explain the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Uh, I think I'll lay out one of my own for a while if it's all right. Uh, House Bill 1890 would return our runoffs to the date that they were held before we moved them in 2012. The uh, runoffs that we have today are inordinately long. They are a drain not only on voters, but also on candidates, particularly underfunded candidates who may not have the resources to go on for another three months. Previously, our elections were held as they are today, our primaries, on the first Tuesday in March, and the runoffs were held the second Tuesday in April. 
Uh, with the passage of Senate Bill 100 after the Federal MOVE Act, we moved our elections way into the end of May, where our federal elections will still be required to be held today. However, the problem that the MOVE Act was seeking to solve after 150 years of its existence had been solved technologically before they passed the bill. Thus meaning this really dragging on our primaries for three months after the, uh, after the original primary date was no longer really a necessity. The problem, which was first discovered during the Civil War, was that you might try to send ballots to the 1st Pennsylvania Regiment when they were battling in Kentucky, and by the time you got them to them, they were in Tennessee and you couldn't find them. This, surprisingly, continued to be a problem through to the modern day all the way to the Gulf War, where we would try to find somebody in Fallujah and they weren't there by the time we sent them to ballot. Hence, Congress finally getting around to feeling like they had to pass the MOVE Act, by which time we had discovered email. We do not have to know where our military voter is in order to get him or her their ballot. We send it to their email address, and whenever, they can even be in a secret location that we're not supposed to know about, and as soon as they can address their email, they email that they open the email, get the ballot printed up at the PX, or wherever you get them printed up, and put them in the postal service, and they get to the courthouse, which I assure you has not moved. As a result of that, we don't need the extra amount of time that the feds require in federal elections between when you print your ballot and when you hold the election to pertain to the runoff. Now, we actually petitioned at the time of the, of the MOVE Act that our runoffs not be required to meet that, and they said, no, no, you can't do it. You must hold them at the end of May. As I say, the problem's already been solved. A military voter gets their ballot before I get mine. That, that issue is, is solved. What isn't solved is that we are dragging people through runoffs that go from the first week of March to the last week of May. And as I say, we, we are running our candidates ragged, we're running our voters ragged. It also changes the nature of the runoff from being the second round of the primary to being an entirely different election held three months later, a quarter of a year. So what House Bill 1890 would do simply is move back the state the runoffs for state and county elections to the second Tuesday in April. Should there be a runoff required for a federal election, which isn't all that common, though it does happen, that would continue to be held when it is held. Uh, and that would be in, at the end of May. If there isn't one at all, there's no reason to take our entire primary runoff and move it back three months for a federal runoff that doesn't ever happen. So that is the purpose of the bill. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm delighted to hear any testimony, and I would reserve the right to close. Thank you. Members, any questions for Representative Schofield? R real quick, well, I do want the members to know as well, by the way, that we also have some resource witnesses, including two election administrators and things as well. Representative Beckley? Glenn Maxey. Hi, Mr. Maxey. Glenn Maxey, Texas Democratic Party, uh, registered in opposition to the bill. Thanks, sir. Um, my major concern is just the uh, issue of those occasions when you're going to have a local runoff uh, and also have a congressional runoff in the same election six, and, and you are now requiring a significant number of voters to vote a second. Time. So now that you'll have three elections in a row instead of two elections in a row. Um, you know, I, I certainly empathize or agree with uh, Mr. Schofield in the, in the issue of the long election cycle. Uh, question here is just whether um, the juice is worth the squeeze, which way the juice is worth the squeeze here of having duplicate elections um, and my experience, you know, when we think about just the federal elections having 38 congressional races or a U.S. Senate race on a ballot, um, you know, typically with the U.S. Senate race, there's probably always going to be uh, a runoff uh, if 
unless it's a long-term incumbent, uh, at least on, on the party out of power, I guess I would say. Um, and in those cases, we're probably always in a U.S. Senate race going to have the minority party that's contesting the incumbent uh, to have three elections in a row. And that would be, you know, two out of every three cycles. Members, any questions for Mr. Maxey? Thank you, sir. The chair now calls Julie Kellogg. Julie Kellogg. The chair now calls Andrew Eller. Mr. Eller, I see here that uh, you're here to testify on behalf of yourself and that you are neutral, so you're testifying on the bill. Is that correct? That is correct. All right, yes, please my name repeat is, those things for me. Though. Yes, my name is Andrew Eller. I'm representing myself, and my position on the bill is neutral at this time. Uh, I just uh, I want to thank uh, Representative Schofield uh, for bringing it forward and for actually his uh, legislative director, Emily, speaking to me yesterday. I did call her and spoke, speak with her about the bill because I really was wondering what was going on. As an election judge for over 25 years, uh, it becomes quite evident that it, there are some things that happen when you have a primary or you have a primary runoff and all these different elections. And so I just had a few comments about the bill uh, itself and so maybe some unintended consequences of having another election. Um, uh, of course, the first one is uh, the confusion of the voters. When you, ha when you separate a federal election from a state election, a state or local election, being an election judge, I see voters come in. Sometimes they don't even realize what the election is for on that day. Sometimes they think it could be the mayoral or council race. Uh, they're not sure it's a runoff, and I can actually, t you know, I take the brunt of a lot of those comments from them. Um, so I could actually see that being comments coming from voters on that time, like, well, hey, I wanted to vote for the senator. How come I'm not getting to vote today for the senator, not realizing that, that, that the state runoff was not for the senator? So I could see that. So that's just something we need to think through. Um, the second thing is, I don't know how this works, but there probably is a fiscal component to this. I know some of the parties, the counties, it's, it's difficult to run another election uh, separated from, uh, you know, federal from state, get it. Um, they'd have to look at that. And then the last thing is being an election judge, sometimes it's extremely difficult to recruit clerks and workers for the polls. Uh, a lot of people have full-time jobs. I have a very difficult full-time job. I spend a lot of time uh, at it. And, you know, to, to take time away to do another election is just something else that would be a little bit harder. I think those are things we would just need to look through. Now, I will say this. The, the November election, I didn't have any problem getting clerks. I had people calling me saying they wanted to, to work. I think it, you know, it became important to people at that point. But going forward, I don't know if that's going to happen again. So. Those are just three areas I think we want to look at as we're looking at uh, this bill, and, and uh, I do appreciate your t uh, letting me speak today. So what questions do you have for me? Mr. Eller, members, any questions? Representative Clardy? Uh, just one. It's not directed so much to you, Mr. Eller, uh, but if I understand you, there's a concern about having enough uh, volunteer workers, other people demand the polls for a what could be a third election instead of a second election. That's correct. Yeah, it's difficult sometimes. Yeah. Now, that does come at some expense to the elections officer of the county. I guess one question I don't know, and I should have want to ask you this, but I know Mr. Scofield's listening, is if I don't know if there's any, what I've got, I don't know if there's any kind of a fiscal note on this, if there's anything there to discuss. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eller. The chair now calls Heather Hawthorne. My name is Hawthorne. I've got to hear that you are uh, representing the County District Clerks Association of Texas and yourself, and you're against the bill. That That's is correct. correct. Tell me that again. All right. My name is Heather Hawthorne. I'm the County Clerk of Chambers County. I represent the County and District Clerks Association of Texas, and I am against this bill. And yourself. And myself. Right. Proceed, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Um, Although Mr. Schofield is, is right that, you know, it sounds great in theory, um, I am here obviously to tell you that there is a fiscal note to this. I am representing the taxpayers of my county, even though some colleagues don't think we come up here to do that. 
and there is some early voting expense to that. Um, it would be an unfunded mandate. Poll workers are difficult to find um, on a runoff election anyway because it's already pushed back and the hype and the enthusiasm is not there any longer to come back for that runoff. Voter confusion, definitely. Um, I know that you said that email is our fix-all for our federal, but it's just an option. They still have the option to receive it in another format. Um, so I really kind of feel like the way you've kind of explained it and laid it out is this bill is really about the candidates and not the taxpayers. So that's why I'm against it. Any questions? Any questions for Ms. Hawthorne? Representative Schofield. Ms. Hawthorne, I want to thank you. Uh, Ms. Hawthorne was kind enough to call, and we had a nice discussion uh, about the bill and the issue. And I'm, on closing, I'll talk about some of the costs and uh, and how I feel it affects the voters. I thought I talked about that, but maybe not enough. But thank you very much. I always appreciate In my other committee, we had a big ruckus over the fact that some folks who had not worked with the author suddenly show up and start attacking their bill. So I appreciate that you reached out and Absolutely. expressed your concerns. You know, I'm that. always uh, <laughs> delighted to work with you all. Yeah. As well. Anyone else? Thank you, Ms. Hawthorne. Uh, Representative Clardy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kane. And Ms. Hawthorne, with respect to the cost, and I'm sure Mr. Schofield is going to address this, the cost you're talking about is not as to the state budget, it's to your to the local. county budget and your elections budget there locally. So if this were to be imposed, this would be another example of the dreaded unfunded mandate, would it not? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Amy hey, Hawthorne. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, okay. Representative Beckley. Thank you, Chairman. You're so enthusiastic about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, could you tell me how big your county is and, like, how much is an election cost, just for Re reference? Absolutely. So we have currently are just hit the uh, 30000 mark on registered voters we're right we're right at 50,000 population and it's gonna it roughly costs us about 30 to 40,000 per election and that may not seem like a whole lot but when it comes down to um, to county budget it is a whole lot that sounds like a lot for that population yes yeah thank you any members any other questions for this witness thank you Ms. Hawthorne we're going to save you for the last Keith Ingram. So at this time, the chair calls up Chris Davis. Mr. Chair, if I might, while he's making his way forward, Mr. Davis was also kind enough. We had the, the same uh, mm -hmm. phone conversation with Ms. Hawthorne. I do appreciate his uh, doing that. And Mr. Davis, tell us those three things we need to know. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Christopher Davis, on behalf of the Texas Association of Election Administrators, testifying on House Bill 1890. Uh, also, I have you here as, uh, on behalf of, can we double check? Oh, waiting for it to move. Just want to double check that it also didn't say self. Okay, just on behalf of the Texas Election Administrators. Thanks, sir. Yes, sir. Was I remiss on anything? Are nope. Okay. You're great. Thank you, sir. And uh, you're on the bill. Yes, sir. On House Bill 1890. And thank you, Representative Schofield, for making yourself available uh, yesterday. Uh, before we talked is when we met with our association, and our association seeking that clarification advised me to be on the bill. We pretty much echo a lot of the concerns expressed by uh, County Clerk Hawthorne in that um, we see just no avoiding there will be this fifth election um, between the months of March and June. Uh, for counties or for election offices that are conducting both primary, the primary runoff, May municipals, the June runoffs, uh, and this fifth. And the issue uh, that was brought up amongst uh, the membership was being it's the federal election that's being kind of left alone, oftentimes that's a countywide election, which means it's a very expensive election. Uh, for counties such as mine with near 400,000 voters, we have to, countywide election, you've got to put out a lot of a lot of resources, uh, personnel, et cetera. But um, we appreciate, again, uh, you making yourself available uh, to uh, clarify uh, the intent of the bill. Members, any questions for Mr. Davis? Thank you, Mr. Davis. Thank you, Chairman. The chair now calls Keith Ingram, Director of the Elections Division, 
the Texas Secretary of State. Go ahead, Mr. Ingram. Um, Keith Ingram here. I'm the Director of the Elections Division for the Secretary of State, and we are on House Bill 1890. Members, any questions for Mr. Ingram? You literally <laughs> Representative Beckley. I don't want to let you down. Okay. So, um, okay, I'm going to crack up. We were talking about our, so military people can have email ballots. Is that correct? That is correct. The, they have the option to request their blank ballots be sent to them by email. Okay. And that's only military. And are those the state ballots or is this federal? I'm just trying to. Um, it is any ballot that they're qualified any, for any election that they're qualified to vote in. Um, and it's also for o overseas civilians, overseas okay. civilians and military. Can, so then they mail them back in? They have to mail it back in. Do you right. explain that process? Um, well, they can request that their ballot be emailed to them. Then they print their ballot materials. They sign it. They, they can either wrap it in a signature sheet or um, put it in an, a regular envelope and then put it inside of another envelope. Um, and then they mail it back to the early voting clerk. And they can it, also send it by you. DHL is the most common overseas carrier, but they can send it by carrier as well. Um, is there any fraud associated with this? Um, I'm not aware of any case that we've referred to the Attorney General for fraud with uh, overseas and military voters. And how many people are doing it this way? Um, usually in a given election, Texas is number two uh, in the nation with regard to FPCA, Federal Postcard uh, Voters. Um, I don't know. I don't have a number in my head for so California how is number one. California is number one. So based on pop so population based percentage, basically. I agree with that. Okay, thank you. Members, any other questions, Mr. Ingram? Representative Clardy. Thank you, Chairman McCain. Uh, Mr. Ingram, uh, how long have you been with the elections division with the Secretary of State's office? Um, <laughs> nine years, three months, 13 days. Okay, nine years, three months, 13 days. Okay, well, that's a pretty good in uh, the hours and minutes to that. <laughs> now, it was about this time of day. The reason I ask is I, I didn't know your, how far back you had gone in that position. Were you there the last time the, for the election following the last redistricting? I was. Okay. And because there was a comment that it didn't really click with me that, uh, that Mr. Schofield made his layout that this rarely or never happens that you have this election on a congressional race, but seems to me, and I don't know this is so what I'm asking you, that after redistricting, and, and presumably, as I understand, we're going to pick up probably three congressional seats uh, in Texas for this election cycle. Is that what you understand? I, I understand it's two or three are coming our way, so yes, sir. It was at least two, maybe three. Numbers are what the numbers prove to be, which means there will be new maps in those congressional districts, and there will be some shuffling and moving around of people retiring or whatever. But I would think that that's going to create an environment where there's going to be a larger number of contested congressional races. Do you agree with that? Um, I agree that that is likely, yes, sir. And then usually, at least in my experience, when there's been an open congressional seat or a new congressional seat, there's more than two people that run. That's right. We've got 23 running right now in a special election to fill a vacancy. I think we have some, somebody, I, I, I talked to one of our colleagues, I something like 23. 23. Signed up into that seat. So would you agree with me that if there's 23 people, that the chances of a runoff uh, are fairly high? I would agree with that, yes, sir. And so if we see, you know, I, I'm just suggesting that perhaps, and, I, and I, I absolutely love and agree with the intent of Mr. Scopio's bill. Having had, having suffered through an attenuated uh, a runoff campaign, and it is not fun for the candidate nor the people who have to pull all the junk out of their mailbox. Um, so I, I, I'm absolutely with him on that. Uh, I would hope that we could have some influence with our congressional colleagues or, or hopeful congressional colleagues who probably will be talking to us a lot this session about redistricting, and perhaps a drug approach this on the other end of the equation with the change of the federal law in light of the technological changes that maybe this election cycle with the new congressional seats and the shuffling might not be the optimal time to do that and perhaps this might be tabled for oh maybe two years uh, until that can sort itself out just just making an observation to you Mr. Ingram if that makes any sense to you it does all right thank you Mr. Ingram members any other questions thank you Thank you. 
Is there anyone else who wishes to testify on, for, or against House Bill 1890? If not, the chair recognizes Representative Schofield to close on the bill. Thank you, members. Uh, Mr. Clardy stole a little bit of my thunder. A part of what I intended to tell you was in a perfect world, we wouldn't have this problem because we could get our congressional colleagues to realize that it is, in fact, uh, in the 21st century uh, that we have the ability to hold our elections five weeks after the, after the, gen after the general primary and that it's not, a, it's not the burden that they thought it was when they finally passed the MOVE Act. Uh, however, in the meantime, I think we owe our voters the ability to have the second round of the primary not be three months after their first vote, where it becomes, a, it becomes burdensome on the voters. They get inundated with all of our stuff. It becomes really burdensome on underfunded candidates who you know, are not gonna be able to serve because they're gonna get swamped by the money of people who have plenty to continue the bombardment for three months. And I believe that when you turn it into a third election, it's, it's harder on the voters and more, uh, they're more likely to lose sort of the track of who they had voted for the first time, particularly in the non-high profile races, where you don't really get necessarily the same, um, the same ability for the voter to have their real decision of who they want to represent them. Uh, anyway, I appreciate the committee's time today. I've laid out three bills in a row, and that's more of me than anyone should have to hear. Uh, and so, Mr. Chairman, I would appreciate the committee's uh, passing this bill out. But with that, I close. Members, any questions of Representative Schofield? Hearing none, if there is no objection, the bill will be left pending. Is there objection? The chair hears none. The bill is left pending. The chair lays out House Bill 1382 and recognizes Representative Busey to explain the bill. Thank Representative you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a committee substitute for House Bill 1382. Yes, I see you have one. The chair lays out the committee substitute. Thank you, sir. Uh, members, thank you for allowing me to the, the privilege to lay out the committee substitute for House Bill 1382. This bill would require a tracking database to be developed and maintained that voters could use to check the status of their application and ballot to vote to vote by mail. This is something we saw counties implement last election cycle. It increases efficiency, convenience, and the public's confidence in the election and has privacy safeguards. After conversations with stakeholders, the committee substitute would address the following issues. Change the entity responsible for tracking the database from individual counties to the Secretary of State's office. Simplifies the criteria for voters to check on their status to be their name and registration address plus an identifier such as voter registration number, driver's license number, or DPS ID number. Uh, provides a specific timeline for updating the database of no later than two business days. Provides a cleanup to ensure ballot by mail data is uploaded to the Secretary of State's office in a timely manner as intended to be required under current law. I wanna thank you all for hearing this bill. Happy to answer any questions and I reserve my right to close. Thank you, Representative Busey. Members, are there any questions? Representative Schofield. Mr. Busey, thank you for bringing this bill. As uh, we discussed earlier, uh, and I mentioned this to you, to the extent that the bill allows a voter to track their ballot, I am absolutely in favor of it. I think it's a wonderful idea. I haven't had a chance to see the committee sub, and I'm sure if Mr. Ingram testifies, I'll, I'll be able to ask him questions. But to the ex if there is an extent to which it allows political organizations to track your ballot and kind of harass the voter whose ballot is outstanding, I would absolutely be opposed to that. I see Mr. Maxey here in the audience. Uh, I think you were in the legis I think you were still in the legislature when they did Representative Wolin's bill back in 2003. Maybe you were gone already. Uh, House Bill 54. And one of the first things they did was make darn sure that nobody had the, the data for who was getting a mail ballot before they'd gotten it and had a chance to vote it. And so that would be my only concern. If the safeguards are there where it's really the voter checking his ballot and no one else can get at it so that we can start you know, harassing voters who haven't voted yet but have received their ballot, then I think it's a great idea. I think a lot of my voters uh, you know, we're concerned about what is the status of my vote. Mm -hmm. Is it going to count? Did they get it? And knowing, oh, yes, the county's received your vote and it's gone into the hopper, I think would be a, a tremendous uh, a tremendous help to them. Representative, thank you for bringing that up. I, I agree with that concern. We want to make sure it's safe and secure. 
Uh, the Secretary of State's office does a similar database already for military and overseas. Um, I'm, I trust in their abilities to make this safe and secure. And, and to your concern, it, it is for the individual. We already have the ability to see who's already voted, but uh, you're, you're bringing up, we don't want to be able to see anybody else who's applied or, or what the status is until they've cast their vote. And, and this should just be for the individual. It does require the unique ID to look it up. Um, but I'd love to maybe bring up the Secretary of State when it's their turn to talk about their security measures to make sure this is maintained and secure for everybody in Texas. But I, I appreciate you bringing that forward. Thanks. Before we go into testimony, I do want to inform the, the audience that this is a committee substitute and it's, and it's quite different. Um, <laughs> FYI, based on your positions, it may be easier to know. Um, so to make things slightly quicker, I'm going to bring up Keith Ingram, the chair, calls Keith Ingram, Director of Elections Division of the Texas Secretary of State's Office, here to testify on the bill. Um, good afternoon. My name is Keith Ingram. I'm here from the Elections Division of the Texas Secretary of State's Office, and we are on House Bill 1382. Members, any questions for Director Ingram? Representative Schofield? Mr. Ingram, yeah. I'm assuming, like on the other bill, you're kind of at the disadvantage of not having seen the committee sub. I, I do have this one, yes, sir. Oh, perfect. Uh, can you allay my concerns about, again, as, as I said to Mr. Busey, to the extent the voter can track their ballot, that's wonderful, and, and it's a terrific tool. My concern is whether we would be creating a system that other people can get access to the status of their ballot and see whose mail ballots are outstanding. Explain to me how that can't happen here. Um, under the, the new proposed 86015B, it requires in order to access the system that the voter enter their name and address, as well as their driver's license or personal ID number. Um, it also requires uh, in the alternative that they could enter their voter unique ID number. I would recommend if we wanted to be secure to take that option off because VUID is, is not uh, uh, it's Everybody not has access to that. Everybody's got access to it. It's open record. So if we took that off, it would make it more secure on the identity management piece. If we added last four of social as a criteria, that would also increase the level of difficulty to get in. So you would, it, in order to make it as secure as possible, you, if, you, if you had your druthers, you would prefer to re remove the um, the VUID and add last four of the social or some other identifying measure that you would know that, that isn't out there in the public record. Exactly. And for, for our purposes, last four of, of uh, social is something that we have for almost every voter in our database. Great. And um, with respect to, or at least having been one of their optional ways, they can exactly. use that or something else if they don't right. want to use that. Uh, and and we're at a, I'm at a disadvantage because I actually did not see the committee sub. I didn't realize we had one. Uh, Dropbox and I are not on a first name basis. Um, can you tell me what you've seen, what is the what is the system now compared to the, you don't have to compare it to the file version, but what is the system that we would be looking at now and and the in types of information that we're putting in, what could somebody else get uh, their hands on and what couldn't they? Um, so this, what I would envision is that we would uh, beef up the identity management for our current My Voter page. And so a voter, they when they look up their voter registration currently, they can, they can find you know, their registration status, their address, any elections they're scheduled to vote in that are upcoming. And currently well anybody can get access to that. And, and it's pretty it's it's pretty easy to get into. I mean, we have some people food. ask us and we look it up for them. Exactly. And so we would we would change the criteria for accessing that page to match what's in this bill. Um, and then once they were in there, in addition to the election that they've that they've got coming up as well as their polling places, if they voted by mail, they would have these uh, elements. You know, what are these elements there? They, that uh, receipt, that there's been a receipt of the application, the acceptance or rejection of the application, um, that the mail ballot has been put in the mail by the early voting clerk, uh, that the... The levels, I see, yeah. Exactly, and so the, 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 the receipt back, the acceptance or rejection of the ballot board uh, by the Sticky ballot out. board of marked ballot. Sticky note. Uh, and having had a chance to look at this, what is your opinion, other than the the swap out that you'd like to make, if that were made or something similar to it, what is your opinion of the security of this so that we're not having political groups getting out there and just 
going through these finding elderly voters and harassing them? I think if we change the identity management to take off fluid, that, that it would be secure against that. Um, it'd be as secure as we can make it against that. The, uh, the other thing that this bill doesn't really do that it probably needs to do is it doesn't tell the early voting clerk that they have to enter the information. Um, so there's not any requirement that anybody actually use a system if we build it. So if, if, if it directed the early voting clerk for a primary, primary runoff, general election, election order by the governor to enter this information, then the bill would be, I think, complete. Okay. And, and my understanding is that the, uh, from Mr. Busey's layout that the one difference between the filed version and the committee sub is that in the committee sub, we sort of centralize all this in the Secretary of State's office, presumably both for ease of use but also for security. Uh, is that something that you're confident your office could pull off? Absolutely. Yes, sir. We were already looking into doing it without the bill, but this would help us. If, if the bill passes and, and you were given the authority to do this and maybe he made it to the county had to do it, how soon between the effective date of the bill, uh, how long would it take after that that you would be, you feel confident you'd be ready to go? I would anticipate we'd have it in place for November's election if we have any constitutional amendments this November. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Members, any other questions? Representative Clardy. Thank you, Chairman Kane. Uh, Mr. Ingram, uh, have you run any kind of estimate of the cost this would be to your office to put it up to speed, as Mr. Schofield described, and implement it before the November election? Um, we have uh, put an estimate on a similar bill of $42,000. Uh, that's usually the kind of estimate that gets stripped off by LBB. That's what they call existing resources. So you can keep it within existing resources, maybe with a little bit of help? Yes, sir. Okay. No, no, no addition of FTEs? Oh, no. No, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ingram, you were saying oh, we're planning on already doing this. So you're, you're expecting to spend that money? This is authorized. Thank, Thank you. This Members. is something we've been investigating. It was real clear last year that this is something that's needed. It would help people? Yes, sir. Okay. Representative Beckley? Thank you, Chairman. Um, so would this help, like, so some person who's over 65 who doesn't want to do vote by mail but wants to make sure one hasn't been fraudulently, what? I can't say the word today. Fraudulent, fraudulently placed, so say that it's already gone in and there's a vote. Could they just see that and then dispute it so that their vote could count? If, if it's like early voting, like I, I, understand I hadn't I thought of that, but yes, it would. So then they could dispute it and say, so it seems like it would help a lot of the issues that we're talking yeah. about. What they could do is they go to the early voting clerk and cancel that mail ballot application. Okay, thank you. Representative Schofield. Can I follow up on um, Ms. Beckley's question? That's a very good thought. So. You say the mechanism is that they go to the early voting clerk and cancel their mail-in ballot. Can you can you lay out what the law is on that, when their time is for that, and that's to the extent you know. You usually know this thing by heart. But <laughs> well, give me your best. Cancellation of mail ballots is one of those things that I prefer happen. to have the statute in front of me. Uh, but one of the ways to cancel a mail ballot is to go in person to the early voting clerk's office any time after it's been requested and fill out a cancellation form. So they have to go in person? They don't have to. They can also go to the polling place and surrender the mail ballot, and they can also but vote in a provisional ballot, Beckley's and the mail about, ballot doesn't really come. They didn't get but, the mail ballot, right? right? Somebody else did. Okay. So there is, there is, they can go in person and cancel it before it's been, uh, before it's been cast or even after it's been cast? Let's say the malfeasor has received the ballot and cast it already. Can our person go on there and go, hey, wait a minute, I didn't do that, and go down and cancel it after it's been cast and in time for them to vote? Hmm? As long as it hasn't gone to the ballot board. Okay. And they don't go till election day or day before? Something it depends like that. on how big the county is. They can go as early as 20 days before the election for big counties, um, as early as nine days for smaller counties. So even if it's not 100% effective, it could be a useful tool to help these folks, uh, and at the very least can allay their fear that it has happened if it hasn't. I agree. They can go that. on and say, no, nobody's done this to me. I agree with that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ingram. Members, any other questions? Great. Thank you, Mr. Ingram. The chair now calls Heather Hawthorne.
Hey, Ms. Hawthorne, I see you're here representing yourself and the County and District Clerks Association of Texas against this bill. If you could just tell me those things again. Okay, my name is Heather Hawthorne. I am the County Clerk of Chambers County. I'm representing the County and District Clerks Association of Texas and myself. And I would like to change my, uh, what do I call that? Change my position. Position, thank you, to for this bill with the committee substitute. Let's, let's take care of that. Thank you. So, are you for the bill? So... You are now saying that you are for the bill. So, I am... Okay, so I am against the bill as it was written, but now I'm you, for the substitute. There we go. You're, yeah, that's correct. So, you're here. You're testifying on the substitute. You're not here to testify on the original bill. So, you're testifying on the substitute. And you were for the substitute. Ah, yeah, the, it's the bill. Okay. So I'm against the bill as it was written. Even though we laid out the substitute. All right, there you go. So okay. you're against the bill. I'm against the bill as it was written. And in the committee substitute, the greatest thing that has happened today is that that shifts the burden from the counties to the Secretary of State's office. So I would love to see that substitute passed. Okay. Members, any questions for this witness? Representative Schofield. It seems that ever since the Help America Vote Act, we've sort of shifted some of the burden, particularly of the big computer stuff, towards the Secretary of State so that the local election administrators can run their elections and not deal with that stuff. Do you find that to be useful, like we're talking about in this case, where if we're going to create this new thing, let them do it so you can run your elections on the ground? Is that helpful to you? Well. Oh, several counties already had this tracking system, and I think every county, you know, would love. The bigger ones. But the bigger ones, right. And so the burden, the, the financial burden, is um, trying to have every single county have their own tracking system. Um, so I don't have a problem. It's just that financial side of it. Um, but what, what um, you need to know is that we at the local level input in everything into that. So we're still doing that work. It's just gonna be presented on the Secretary of State's website. So, so I mean, does that make sense? I mean, instead of us having a tracking system and them having a tracking system, now it's all just, we just input it all up to them. Thank you. Okay. If there's any other questions, there's any other questions for Southorn? Representative Clardy. Thank you, Chairman Kane. So if I get your testimony correct, you were against the bill until you were for the bill unless something else changes. Would that be accurate? That is correct. <laughs> something like that. Excellent. So you're here against the bill. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Thank y'all. The chair now calls Alan Vera. Alan Vera, Chairman, Harris County Republican Party Ballot Security Committee, testifying on HB 1382. We think this is a really good bill. Um, it would help voters who vote by mail keep track of the status of their mail ballot. Even last Friday, we realized it could also help those who don't vote by uh, mail see if someone has voted by mail in their name with enough time to cancel their application and ballot. We believe the benefits of those, to those voters outweigh the risks of the harvesters using this data. At least we hope so. Uh, the only question we had, and we don't know if the substitute has addressed it, uh, please advise us if it is. We were concerned that on the benchmarks that are posted for every mail ballot, when you post the benchmark for the ballot being rejected, many voters may, be, may believe that they have time to go and vote in person when in fact statute does not allow that. If your mail ballot has been canceled, you cannot vote in person after that, which is why many of the big counties don't do that until the last day. So that's the only reason we were concerned and aren't, if, this, if we didn't have that concern about misleading the voters or uh, creating confusion, we'd be for the bill. That's my testimony, thank you. Thank you, members. Any questions for Mr. Vera? Thank you, Mr. Vera. The chair now calls David Carter. Mr. 
Mr. Carter, your registration shows that you're here representing yourself and you are against the bill. Can you please state your name, who you represent, and your position on the bill? David Carter, representing self, uh, against the bill as filed. Uh, I was pleased to hear the committee substitute uh, erase my main concern, which was that it just put all this on the 254 different county software developers instead of putting it at the Secretary of State level. So I'm, I'm, I'm just curious, uh, this has always been a problem in coming here for 10 years. And we, we come here all prepared to talk about a bill that's been filed, and then there's committee substitutes that we never get to see. But what is, uh, so am I, I am, am I only allowed to testify on the bill that's filed, or can I comment on the committee substitute? You, you, you may comment on the what you've heard on the substitute. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, well, I, I, that was my main thing. So uh, I think that it's, uh, just look at my last note here. Uh, all right. That's all Members, right. any questions Mr. for Mr. Carter? Thank you, Colonel. You're welcome. The chair now calls Brandon Moore. Brandon Moore. Okay. The chair now calls Julie Kellogg. The chair now calls James Slattery. Ms. Slattery, if you could please state your name again for the record, who, who you're with, and your position on the bill. James Slattery, representing the Texas Civil Rights Project, testifying for the bill. Thank you. I'm here to testify in strong support of HB 1382. Um, Texas is one of only five states in the country without such a online tracking system. Online vote by mail trackers provide peace of mind to voters who may be understandably anxious about what is happening to their application or ballot. They also allow voters to quickly identify when their application or ballot has hit a snag and then reach out to county election officials to clear up the issue. TCRP participates in the nonpartisan Texas Election Protection Coalition, which operates a hotline for Texas voters. This bill would address some of the biggest problems we documented during the 2020 election. Last fall, the coalition fielded 1,461 calls from voters about vote by mail in Texas. Of those, 382 calls, over one in four of the calls, were from voters who had requested a mail ballot but had not yet received one. At the other end of the process, 186 voters, or over 12%, called the hotline asking about a ballot they'd already sent in, but had not confirmed its receipt with the county. If HB 1382 had already been law, these voters would have known from the outset that they could go to the online tracker and look up the status of their application and ballot there. If the portal indicated that the applicant had not received a ballot because their application had been rejected, the voter could immediately contact the county to try to address the issue. If the portal indicated that the county had not yet received the voter's marked ballot, the voter could contact the post office to determine if there's a reason for the delay. And if the portal indicated that the voter's marked ballot had been accepted, then the voter can have the assurance that their voice had indeed been heard in the election. Because this bill would substantially improve Texas's elections, we urge the committee to report it out favorably. Okay. Members, any questions for Mr. Slattery? Uh, I have a quick question. Um, so the Texas Election Protection Coalition, mm -hmm. you have this 1,461 calls, 382 were from people who want to, you know, know what, what was going on with their application. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did you also get calls about, you know, people wondering if they qualified for uh, an application to vote by mail? Mm -hmm. Okay. And what were a lot of those kind of calls about, you know? Um, I did not do a deep dive into those calls just because it did. Did you ever talk to anybody that was wondering if, uh, you know, a concern for con – Contracting COVID nineteen was a grounds for voting by voting by mail. I think people asked just you know about any question you could imagine. Okay. What would your response have been on that question? On whether they could vote mm -hmm. uh, based off of a fear of contracting COVID nineteen, if that was grounds to, to vote under the disability section. We would read them the statute and provide them that information. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Slattery. Thank Members, you. any other questions? None. Good job. The chair now calls Marcia Strickler. Mr. 
Mr. Strickler, I see you as the uh, founder of Wilco, We the People, and you're here on, on yourself as well. So you're here on behalf of both of those groups, and you're testifying for the bill. If you could just tell All me your name. All those things are correct. Thank you. And your name? Marcia Strickler, Williamson County, We the People, and myself. Excellent. And, and I'm here to testify on behalf of House Bill 1382. I am for it. And I want to thank this entire committee for recognizing things that uh, many people have shared with you over the extent of our last year's election. I do believe that you guys are hearing what we are saying, and I want to thank every one of you. This, this bill is a bipartisan bill. It is long overdue. Uh, I have a husband that's retired Marine and a son currently serving in the Army. One received a mail-in ballot that didn't request it. One received a mail-in ballot that did request it. Both had confusion on the validity of their vote. So that's how it affected our household. But as a person in the county that worked for election department on election day, as well as have worked in the polling location in my county for many years and have a, a long history of uh, knowledge and awareness, and people know that, I had multitudes of people contact me and ask me, did my vote count? I've heard about the precinct level glitches in our county. I've heard about the people getting incorrect ballot styles. Did my vote count? How can I verify? I do believe that this verification system does belong in the Secretary of State's office. I do believe that uh, greater tracking capability, a secure cyber secure uh, process, uh, I do agree with uh, Keith Ingram that taking off the buid would help with uh, getting hacked. I, I'm very familiar with hacking and very familiar with how our software and hardware works in our county as well as any computer. As a matter of fact, the computer here has not been working today and not been able to be an online resource for those that are watching from home and all committees throughout the Capitol today. So we need to make sure that it is a secure system and that it's a process that all Texans could adhere to to get the validity of their vote. And I appreciate every one of you for voting. For thank you, ma'am. Members, any questions for this witness? None? Thank you, ma'am. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify on for or against the bill? The chair calls Bill Sargent. Bill Sargent, I represent myself, uh, and I was down as, as being. Here, Mr. Sargent, if, if you were against the bill as filed, I need you to remain that way. Okay. Uh, I'm opposed to it. Thank you. <laughs> For one reason. Can it be can it be improved? Great. For one reason, um, and that is that that you make this public information, but you don't say that this public information after the election. We do not want to have people being harassed because they have you know information about you know. Hmm. The last part of the bill says the information contained in subsection yada 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 is is is, is public information. You want to make that public information is available after the election. Great. And if you did that, I would be in favor of this. But I, but because I can't change it, I guess I'm against it. That's awesome. Members, any questions for Mr. Sargent? No, thank you, sir. Anyone else wishing to testify on for or against this bill? Yep. The chair calls up Chris Davis. The last person to testify in this committee today. Mr. Thank Davis. you, Chairman, members. Chris Davis, on behalf of the Texas Association of Election Administrators, testifying for House Bill 1382. The substitute bill addressed our fiscal concerns. Uh, Tarrant County, Travis County, even a Representative Busey and Marcia Strickler's County led the way with the toothpaste out of the tube and rolling their own system last November. It was extremely popular. As the Secretary of State may have alluded to, the data points are already being transmitted from counties to the SOS. Um, data points that we'd like to see in our membership are the driver's license of the last four of the Social Security number, 
There are some very, very old voter registration records, both in counties and at the state level, that lack those data points, however, because they were grandfathered in before those two data points, DL or last four of the social, were required. Those folks, depending on the data points needed to input, may not be able to avail themselves of this system. We echo Mr. Vera's concern about the unintended consequences, about voters that think, uh, mistakenly think that a ballot by mail rejection that this system would report to them if their ballot was rejected in ballot board would give them another bite at the apple. It does not, and it would be very helpful if the Secretary of State's office were to perhaps include some kind of language on that lookup site wherein if a voter sees that their ballot by mail has been rejected in the middle of early voting or leading up to election day, they do not have another chance to cast their vote either by mail or in person. That's my testimony. Hey, Mr. Davis, members, any questions for Mr. Davis? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify on, for, or against House Bill 1382? If not, the chair recognizes Representative Busey to close on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the intent of this bill is to help voters increase security, transparency, um, and I, I think the Texas legislature, we work best when we work as one team. I think we've got a real potential for a great bipartisan bill here. I appreciate Secretary of State's input, the witnesses' input, uh, the questions from Representative Schofield. We're going to go to work to get this so we can get this up and get it unanimous and get it out soon. So I, I hope to we get a few changes and then have you all support. I appreciate it. Thank you, members. Are there any questions for Representative Busey? Hearing none. Thank you. Oh, Representative Schofield. Mr. Busey, thank you for bringing this bill. Uh, I, I don't know if it was in the file version and I just missed it, but uh, what the Mr. Sergeant just brought up about the public information is vitally important. It, it, it's a back door to the concern yeah. that I had about people being able to put in, in this case, put in a PIA, get all this information mm -hmm. that's supposed to be private on the website. And it, with your uh, uh, with your pledge that you'll either take it out or just say it's pu not is not public until after the election, uh, I would be wholeheartedly in support of this mm -hmm. bill. I appreciate that feedback. I'd, I'd love to let's work on it and get this back up. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Busey. I, I think you'll find uh, the language included over in the Senate to, to be maybe what we're looking for, right. even though it can't stand those guys. Um, <laughs> but thank you. Is it all any other questions for Representative Busey? Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. I close. Thanks. If there is no objection, the chair withdraws the committee substitute. The bill will be left pending. Is there objection? The chair hears none. The committee substitute is withdrawn and the bill is left pending. Members, this concludes today's agenda. Is there any further business for the committee to address? If not, the chair moves to adjourn. Is there objection? Hearing none, the House Committee on Elections stands adjourned, subject to the call of the chair.